Okay, how's everybody doing today? I can't believe this room is so full. It's very exciting. Um, welcome to the first State Water Contractor Science Symposium. We're here to talk about long fence smelt, and hopefully we will not only find out what our researchers know, also what we still need to know, and then maybe figure out some ways, um, maybe a strategy for getting there. Um, so my name is Darcy Austin, and I'm the science manager for the State Water Contractors. And I have a few logistics first off, and I know we're off agenda already, so don't stress out. Lenny is next. He's going to be very short. Um, but our logistics. So hopefully you picked up an agenda in the back. There's also a flyer um, about our science program and what we funded in the, in the past year. Um, bathrooms are across the hall. You probably saw them as you came in. Wi-Fi password is up here. Once that slide goes off, there should be cards at each table with uh, the Wi-Fi information. Um, so we have some refreshments for you in the back. We're also going to have lunch coming in for everybody around probably 11.30, and our break is scheduled for 11.45. Um, make sure you silence your cell phones in case you didn't notice this man standing on the riser <laughs> in the middle of the room. We are recording this, so want to make sure that we have the audio um, and that everybody can hear uh, the recording. And with that, I'd like to thank our speakers. So we started this as an idea in August, and it was sort of this, like, can we pull this off in a couple months? And there was a little hesitation, and then I said, yeah, we're going to do it. Let's do it. And we invited people to speak, and most of them said yes. And you've seen them on the agenda. We're very, I just feel very fortunate that so many people were willing to come and talk about their science. So thank you guys for doing that. I also want to say a big thank you to the folks that helped plan this. So Linda Stanley, who's standing in the back, works for State Water Contractors. She's amazing. Um, Sean Acuna from Metropolitan Water District and Lenny Grimaldo really helped to pull this together. And then we also have a communications team. So Fiona Hutton and Associates, we couldn't have done it without their help as well. So I just wanted to start out with a little bit, um, steal a little bit of time to talk about the State Water Contractor Science Program. Um, and I'm going to start with a story about coming over to the State Water Contractor. So um, I've been here a little bit over a year. And as I was coming over, one of my friends who is not in this room said to me, oh, you're going to the dark side? Uh, what is it about the money? And I was like, no, it's about science, and I had my whole spiel, and I was very excited about this position. But the truth is, I have to confess, it is a little bit about the money. <laughs> but it's the money that the state water contractors are investing in science, and that's what is so exciting to me. Anybody who knows me knows I'm passionate about science. I'm a big nerd, um, and I love the Delta. I love our system. I think we have a completely complex and unique system, and so it's really fun to be able to help fund science um, in our system. So um, the state water contractors, we really want to promote and fund objective science um, that's going to help inform decision making. And there's so many folks in this room who work for entities that also do that or folks who do the research. And so I just look at it, if we have a big puzzle, and we have so many pieces that are already filled in, work that's been done by so many others, including the SWIFCA science program, uh, where we come in is helping to, to plug in some of those missing puzzle pieces. So we do that in a collaborative way. We have a budget of about $2.5 million annually. Um, and our goal really is to help understand the nuanced science. We all know that our science is not linear. It's very complex. And in order to get to the point where we're helping uh, to recover species and preserve, enhance, protect, the, uh, restore the environment while maintaining a reliable water supply for two thirds of Californians, we really need to invest in science. Um, and I think the last thing I'm going to say is just that we really want to work collaboratively. So I hope to talk to many of you um, who I haven't already spoken to 
Um, maybe you have a study that you want to see funded or want to collaborate with us. We're working with CDFW, the Delta Stewardship Council, on um, Prop 1 studies, Delta Science Program. We're helping to fund some um, studies under Operation Baseline. So we have all these opportunities to work with you, and that's what we're here to do. And then I think it's just more important than ever to do that collaborative science. And one of the things about that, as we're working collaboratively, I think we all know that we're going to come up with answers that maybe don't support our conceptual models. And as we do this concept or co collaboratively, I think we all have to realize that we need to be OK with the answers. So with that, we have a lot of science on long fence smelt. It's not all funded by state water contractors. Um, so I don't want to give anybody that impression. But um, we are here today to talk about long fence smelt. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lenny Grimaldo from ICF. So I agree with what Darcy just said. She is a big nerd. Um, <laughs> But I think she touched on a lot of things that I was going to say, so I'll, I'll skip some of those main items. But I do want to go back to a, an article that was published in two thir 2013 by Mark Cowan, the director, the then director of DWR, and Chuck Bonham from CDFW. And the title is, We Can Do Better. And they were really challenging the science community to try to go out and learn things about the mechanisms underlying the flow abundance relationship and other features of long fence smelt biology. <clears throat> And mostly that was in context for the BDC, BDCP at the time. Well, that article could be rewritten re right now. Just insert all the other regulatory things going on right now. The State Water Project long-term ops, the new Delta Conveyance Authority, the potential listing on long fence smell. These are all regulatory processes where the science needs to feed how that is structured in these regulatory processes. But also, beyond the regulatory piece, um, I notice there's a buzz in this room. And it's pretty exciting, because long fence smelt is a species we can actually learn something about. Yes, its abundance has declined significantly at a really rapid rate, um, probably faster than most of the other species over the last couple decades that we see out there. But at the same time, for us that work on long fin, we sort of smile, because at least we have some long fin to deal with, unlike delta smelt, where it's really difficult to get samples. So this, is a, this has been a really good era of learning and new science. And this era has been short. In just a few short years, um, the science on long fin smelt has improved dramatically. Um, we're learning a lot about its basic biology, some of the stuff that we're going to hear today. And then uh, I think we made some headways on some of the mechanisms underlying that flow abundance relationship. You're going to see that. You're, Wim's going to plot that up later. but. Um, I always joke with Wim, I'm tired of seeing that graph. Not because I don't believe that that's a solid relationship and that the slope has changed over the years, but it's because I want to get to the mechanisms. I want to look under the hood and where are we at with that. And I think we made some progress on that. And you're going to hear about that in the second half of the session today. Yes, we have a lot more work to do there. But I think part of the motivation for putting this, this symposium together was what's the starting point? the next starting point based on what we're, we're learning today. You know, what are the next studies? What are the next steps? And Sean's going to cover that um, in, in his final talk as well. Um, one final note before we get started here. Um, most of you are familiar with each other in, in this room. I can probably go through and name most of you at each table. And I know you guys all know each other very well. Um, we should encourage tough questions, right? This is, this is science. and. I'm sure some of the folks there, especially some of the seasoned veterans at the end of the day, and Jim and Fred and, and Wim, Levi, you know, this is, this is a time to, to ask those tough questions. Don't be afraid. Um, this is a forum for, for that process. Um, and we're going to have two ways of doing that. We could actually, you can get up and, and ask your question, or you could write it down if you're a little shy. There's index cards in the back. Um, but yeah, don't, don't be afraid, because this is how learning advances. We may not all agree with what's being presented today, um, but at least we get a common understanding and, and, and foundation for why folks are interpreting the science the way they do. So with that, we're going to move to our first speaker, Trishel Temple from CFW, environmental scientist, um, who's going to talk about 
Ah, I lost your title. Um, long fin smelt fecundity and spawning habitat in the upper estuary. Oh my God, where do I find it? <laughs> Darcy, why are you making me do this? joking that mercury is in retrograde, so I should not touch anything. I don't, I don't actually believe that, but um, people keep telling me mercury is in retrograde. Okay, this is it, right? Yes. Um, and I'm going to mention real quick, um, so your agenda does have, if you want to tweet about what's happening here today, um, there is a hashtag at the top of the agenda, and it's hashtag SWC Longfin 2019. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about longfin smelt fecundity and spawning habitat in the upper estuary. So in this talk, I'm going to start by going over a little bit of background, and then I'm going to talk about a recent, some recent fecundity work that we're doing in the Stockton lab from CDFW. I'll also touch on the, what evidence we have that longfin smelt can produce multiple spawning events. And then I'll change directions a little bit and talk about distribution of yolk sac larvae in, in the upper estuary. And then I'll wrap things up with a few conclusions and my ideas on what some of this work might mean for management implications. So a bit of background, which I'll go through pretty quick. Um, let me switch this to PowerPoint. OK, um, I'll go through this pretty quick because it's probably review for a lot of people in this room. Um, but I will say that a lot of this information came from um, the Longfin Mast Report, which is being written right now. So keep an eye out for that. That's going to have a ton of great information in it. So longfin smell are listed as threatened, threatened under the California Endangered Species Act. They typically mature in their second year of life, but they can mature in the first year if conditions are good. The minimum size of maturity is thought to be about 56 millimeters. Spawning likely occurs from November through April. And spawning substrate hasn't been identified in the San Francisco estuary, but it's thought to occur in shallow sandy areas with low velocity. So that's something that they've seen in Lake Washington, which is a distinct population to the north. And they've also seen some evidence of that in some lab studies. It's possible that adults sp uh, stage in one area and then make these nighttime migration runs to their spawning areas. And that, again, they've seen it in Lake Washington, but not in the estuary. And there is evidence that salinity is greater than 10 parts per thousand might be detrimental to hatching success and larval survival. So down in the Stockton office, right now we're doing a fecundity study. And um, we're using methods that are really similar to something they did back with fish collected in the early 90s. So what we're doing is we're selecting for ripe females. Uh, you can see one in the top left corner. We dissect out the ovary. And then we'll separate those eggs from the ovarian tissue. That bottom picture is what it looks like once the eggs are pulled away. So there's not a lot of ovarian tissue that is left over, so it's pretty easy to pull it out. Then we'll pull three subsamples of eggs per fish and do a full count on those subsamples. I will use those subsamples and the remaining ovary, that's those four little squares in the petri dish, to get a dry weight. And we'll use that dry weight to estimate the total number of eggs that that uh, female had. So what have we seen so far? Um, to date, we've processed 60 longfin smelt. They were collected between 2008 and 2019 from four different projects. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Chips Island Trawl, from CDFW, the Bay Study Survey, and the Spring Kodiak Trawl, and then from the UC Davis Hobbs Lab, some work that they were doing in Elviso Marsh. And what we see is they were correct collected over a really wide range. So in that map, all of the black dots correspond to one of the collection points for these fish, these ripe fish. And we were seeing them as far south as um, the Alviso Marsh, up through the Bay Area, through the upper estuary, and as far east as the Sacramento River and into the San Joaquin. All the ripe fish that we processed were collected between December and February. Their fork lengths range from 68 to 129 millimeters. And the estimated number of eggs per fish ranged from 347 to about 35,000. And so as you can see with the number of fish processed by year. We don't really have a ton of data for any given year, so we can't really make any statistical inferences yet, but we can look at general patterns. So like I said, similar work was done from the Stockton office back in the early 90s, specifically on fish collected from 1992 to 1994. And what they found is the relationship between fork lengths and the number of eggs per female is that it's an exponential relationship. So in this graph, we have fork length on the x-axis, 
the total clutch size on the y-axis, and that black line represents um, the relationship that they found in the early 90s. And so these red points are our new data points that we just collected. And what we can see is that the data is lining up pretty good to what they saw in the early 90s. So, so far, there's nothing that really suggests that fecundity has had these any drastic changes. Um, but I do want to note that this is across a lot of years, so if there are any like interannual changes, it's not going to be reflected here. Okay, so we also wanted to look into whether or not long fin small can spawn multiple times in a single year, or in general. And what we see, here's two pictures of two different fish. Uh, the one on the left is a little zoomed out, the one on the right is a little more zoomed in. But in both pictures, we see these nice ripe eggs. Those are the eggs that we use for fecundity counts. But we also see all these little tiny unripe eggs sprinkled in. So some fish had a whole bunch of them, like the fish on the right. Some fish had just a few sprinkled throughout but we were seeing them pretty regularly in all the ovaries that we opened up. So that suggests that, yes, they can have multiple spawning events. But what we don't really know at this point is whether they're having those spawning events multiple times in one season, or since the fish can live two to three years, if they're, um, those eggs are gonna be used in a future season. We just don't really have enough to say that for sure just yet. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, so there's our current, current monitoring programs aren't designed to track spawning adults. So we can't really use adult data to uh, get too far into what they're doing in the F4 estuary for spawning. But we do target larvae. So for the next few slides, I want to talk about um, the larval distribution patterns up in the upper estuary. And one place where we collect a lot of larvae is during the smelt larval survey, which is conducted by CDFW. The survey began in 2009, and it was specifically designed to monitor the risk of entrainment to larval lungfin smelt to directly inform the ITP. So what that means is the survey doesn't intend to sample the entire distributional range of the larva, but it is really good at telling us what they're doing in the upper estuary. Uh, the survey samples 35 stations every other week from January through March, and those stations are in black in the map. And then from 2014 to 2018, we sampled an additional nine stations in the Napa River. Those are in red. And so the SLS net is a pretty small gear. Like the net size is about two by two, two feet by two feet. And it's really good at catching these really tiny fish. So in that jar, we have like a few thousand herring that we collected during the drought, and each of those squiggles is a little fish. Um, so to put some context into what I mean by little fish, about 99% of all fish we've collected on SLS have had a total length of 15 millimeters or less. So let's focus in a little bit on our long fin data. Um, starting in 2011, our staff began noting the presence or absence of a yolk sac on all Esmerids, including uh, long fin. So there's a picture of a little tiny long fin. Um, he's only five millimeters long. And you can see that bright pink sac is his little yolk sac. So we can use that data to really narrow in on these newly hatched larvae. And you can think, you know, if it has the yolk sac, it probably hatched pretty recently, and it might be able to tell us something about where spawning sites are nearby. So for the next few, few slides, I'm going to focus in on those fish in yellow that still have their yolk sac present. So where do we see these youngest larval longfin? This is a map of all the SLS sampling stations um, that have been sampled since 2011, and the circles in black represent the summed catch per 1,000 cubic meters of yolk sac larva, and this is the sum from years 2011 to 2019. And over there, I have the Napa River sh shaded in red, and that's because those stations are only sampled a subset of years. So that is five years worth of data, where these other circles are nine years worth of data. So just to keep that distinction in mind. But the first thing that stood out to me when I saw this map is that spawning is really widespread, or at least hatching is really widespread. In fact, we've seen at least one yolk sac larva at every single station sampled since 2011, which is pretty incredible. Um, another thing that stands out is you can kind of see there are areas with higher density. So if you make that track through the Sacramento, um, down through the confluence and into Sassoon, we're really seeing a lot of fish right in that area. So I want to hone in on these certain areas so we can get a better look at regional patterns. So for the next few slides, you'll see things broken down by the Napa River, Sassoon Bay, the confluence, the northern delta, and the southern delta. 
So this is a great figure that was put together by Mike Aiken from CDFW. And what he did is he plotted the average number of yolk sac larvae per 1,000 cubic meters sampled. Um, and he created this really awesome heat map out of it. So we have years on the y-axis, stations on the x-axis, and then those stations are grouped into regions, uh, the regions I showed earlier. And so in this map, bright colors mean higher catch and dark colors mean lower catch. And I think the biggest thing that stands out is if you were to draw a line between 2015 and 2014, we can see that catch is really, really cooled off. Um, so it looks like something happened during the drought that longfin really haven't been able to recover from yet. Um, and I want to note 2017. So 2017, it looks like really dismal catches. Uh, you can see there's a lot of black all the way across. But in that year, we had these really high flows um, right about the same time that these longfin were probably hatching. So in that year in particular, I think there's pretty good evidence that the longfin were washed out of the sampling area of the SLS. And I think that's what we're seeing here. But you don't really see a rebound in 2018 or 2019. At least catches in those years weren't anything like they were before 2015. So I wanted to take this heat map and turn it into some numbers we can really like sink our hands into. So in this table, we can see the total catch by year. And then each, for each region, I've um, put in the proportion of catch that came from that particular region. So for example, if you were to go across 2011 and add up those percentages, it's going to come to 100%. And you can see in that year, 48% of all yolk sac catch came from Sassoon. Down on the bottom, we can look at the average contribution from each region. And we can see on average, 53% of the yolk sacs coming from Sassoon, 24% from the confluence, 15% from the northern delta, about 8% from the Napa. But I think that number is skewed a little high because of 2017, like I talked about earlier. You can see 33% of them were caught there. We only caught 42 total. I think that's another sign that the center distribution was really shifted outside of our range. And then about 4% were cut in the southern delta, but we've seen catches as high as 10% in recent years. But I think the real gut punch of this whole talk is if we look at the total, catch, uh, the total catches each year. So if we were to take the catch from 2011 through 2014 and add it up, for those four field seasons, we collected a total of 33,990 yolk sac larvae. If we were to do the same for the years 2015 through 2019, which is five field seasons, we collected a total of 2,626 yolk sac larvae. So that means we've seen a decline that's an entire order of magnitude from the last five seasons compared to the four years before. So on that note, to wrap up a few conclusions that we can get from this study, um, it looks like longfin smelt can, span, can spawn over a really wide geographic range as long as the conditions allow it. They do have the potential to spawn multiple times. It doesn't look like fecundity has drastically changed, at least since the early 90s. And larval densities have declined in the upper estuary. So from this work, some things popped up that we don't really understand yet. Um, one of those is adult spawning behavior. So we real, don't really know what triggers spawning, um, when, where, how they're making these spawning migrations, or what's constituting good spawning habitat. We also don't understand how much time is needed between spawning events. So we don't know if they're capable of spawning multiple times in a single season, or if they need a full year to really revamp those eggs to get ready for the next year. We don't know the importance of flow pulses. And by that, I mean both as a trigger for spawn, their spawning migration, but also as a mechanism to possibly disperse those eggs since we caught them over such a wide range that maybe it's an important part. And there's also some gaps in what we know about larval abundances. We don't have a very good idea of what we're seeing in salvage. Um, and a lot of that is because we're not monitoring for salvage during the time of year that these fish are hatching. And we really don't understand population level patterns. So I think we have a really good idea of what they're doing in the upper estuary starting in January. But we don't really know what they're doing before January. And we don't really know what they're doing downstream. But I think we're going to hear more about that later today. So a few thoughts on management implications from this work. Um, large females 
and producing multiple spawns per female could have an exponential impact on reproductive success. Um, adults currently are not monitored or managed for at the start of their spawning season, and that means that water operations may have an undetected effects on those earlier spawners, um, and that would be especially important if we find that they are capable of spawning multiple times in the same season. And then lastly, there's been a really steep decline in the number of newly hatched larvae collected in the upper estuary, especially since 2015. And it doesn't appear to be a stationary habitat issue. And by that, I mean this decline happened really quickly over these sites that were monitored, you know, at the same place every time. Um, so it probably doesn't have something to do with the substrate or their proximity to different habitats. It's probably something more along the lines of flow, water quality, food availability, something like that. So there are a ton of people to thank for this work, um, especially all of the agents that agencies that collected these fish and processed these fish, um, and also those who gave their ideas and their feedback. And with that, if I have any time, I can take any questions. I'll try not to be loud. Um, <clears throat> it's a good talk. Oh, Michelle. thanks. <laughs> very, very good. Um, do you have any evidence that either uh, specific fecundity per female by size, you know, as a function of size, or uh, repeat spawning changes as flow changes? In other words, between a, like a 2017 and a 2014? I don't. Um, so I looked at that a little bit, but we have so few fish over so few years that I really just don't have enough information to say. But I will say that we do want to keep processing fish, so hopefully we can figure that out as we get through more samples. So sorry to disappoint. <laughs> So I have a question while she's walking with the mic over there. So is there any technique in the peer review literature and uh, how you can go about detecting whether multiple spawns happen? Or is it just looking at the, the eggs themselves in the lab? So I wouldn't call myself an expert on multiple spawning, so I could be missing something. But I think there are a few ways we can look at it. The eggs is one of them. Um, you can also look at larval like changes in the larvae. So sometimes if you have a multiple spawner, you can kind of see like a blip, and then another blip, and then another blip if you're looking at the length frequency as they grow. Um, and I don't know if we have the distribution data to say that definitively, but in some years where we saw a lot of larvae, we can kind of see a couple of those maybe blips. Uh, given that uh, the unripe and ripe eggs uh, have different masses, were you able to account for that mass differential when doing fecundity? Were you able to like separate them out and say like, oh, there's more uh, unripe eggs because they're smaller um, than the larger eggs? Um, so what we did early on is we sep we were really careful about, so a lot of those small eggs are attached to that ovarian tissue. So early on we did, uh, we t to test this, let me think, uh, we pulled out that, or that ovarian tissue and pulled out as many of those little eggs we could and actually weighed it per fish. Mm -hmm. And we were getting a total weight that was equivalent to like 20 to 50 eggs per fish. So it wasn't, it was pretty minor given the total counts. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. I think that really helped set up some of the, the later talks. So our next speech, speaker is Michelle Youngbluth. Uh, she's an adjunct professor at San Francisco State Estuarine um, and Ocean Science Center, and she's going to talk to us about some gut contents as revealed through DNA sequencing and gut contents. Right? Mm -hmm. You got it. Call it. Brought my own pointer. <laughs> I like to share with me alone. All right. Uh, so exciting to have everybody in the same room together. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking mostly about my DNA analysis and a little bit about a uh, student in our lab's morphological gut analysis for larval long fin smell. Um, 
Oh yeah, sorry. So we all know fishes are declining, and I'll just jump right into why would we care about uh, the, the diets of these larval fishes. Well, we know that uh, for many fish larvae, uh, they require easy prey and early development, and they have a shifting gut content over their development. So this plot here is showing cod larvae and how their diet changes over uh, as they grow. Um, and you can see in pink the nauplii, uh, that nauplii are basically the entire diet of the smallest fish, and these are uh, young life stages of copepods are called nauplii. Um, and that's because they're easy to catch. Um, and then as they get bigger, they catch larger and more, uh, more diverse prey items. Um, but something that's not shown here, because it's difficult to actually tell, is what species contribute to these nauplii and um, even the juvenile copepods, um, uh, especially when you're dissecting out a fish gut and it's partially digested. Um, these things can be nearly impossible to identify to species. And species could be important because we know that even in the early life stages of these copepods and zooplankton that are out there, um, that they exhibit species-specific swimming and escape behaviors that could make them more easy or more challenging prey to target um, for a tiny little larval fish. And we know in the estuary, the prey assemblage has changed over the last few decades. So um, this is just showing for copepod, uh, different copepod genera, uh, how that assemblage has changed in Suisun and the Delta. Um, there was a major shift in the 1980s and 1990s um, from larger diverse species, uh, particularly in Susun, to a whole ton of these limnoithona, which are these tiny cyclopoid copepods. Um, so you might imagine that this shift in prey composition might have affected their ability to capture prey or maybe um, how much prey they're able to, yeah, their ability to capture prey and what they're eating. So um, what do we know about lar larval long fin smelt diets? Um, what we know so far until my work on the using DNA is based on dissection and ID. And the punchline is copepods are the primary contributor to the diet uh, based on dissection of the guts. Um, species like Acanthus cyclops, Pseudodiaptimus, and Eurytemera, um, we know are important, especially for young larvae. And as they sh grow and shift into juveniles, mycids become more important. Um, you might notice that these are hard bodied sort of crustaceans that we see in the diet. So, um, there is one of my sort of thoughts on this is that, well, when you're dissecting things that are digested, the soft bodied things are likely um, digested faster, and you might not be able to identify them in the guts. And that's, you know, the challenges of particularly with uh, dissecting the guts of larval fishes is you're doing it at the microscope, and things are microscopic and difficult to identify. So this is showing a picture of a larval fish, which is a few millimeters long. This one was maybe seven or eight millimeters. Um, and when you pull out that gut and open it up, you might hope to see things that you can actually identify uh, if, you're, if you know how to identify zooplankton. But really, you get partially digested things that um, the, the level of ID can, can vary uh, quite a bit. Forgive me, this is my first week back after maternity leave. So, <laughs> so sorry that it's a bit, a bit choppy today. Thank you. Um, anyway, so you imagine going into the larval guts that, um, that it would be difficult to get species level ID on a lot of these prey. So my approach is to use a DNA-based approach. And it's based on a very basic DNA barcoding, which the basic idea is using DNA is like a grocery UPC code for animals. And there are a lot of different efforts around the world to characterize the diversity of life using DNA. And you can always look up those later. But the gene that I have chosen to use, because we know that it works quite well for zooplankton in particular, is the mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase subunit 1 gene, or the mitochondrial CO1 gene. Um, and that's because we have a fairly good handle on, for many zooplankton groups, um, the level of difference between different sequences, whether it's the same species or different species. And the idea is you take an identified individual, 
you extract the DNA, and then you um, amplify a particular gene, in this case the mitochondrial CO1 gene, and then sequence it and then compare it to what is in a known database to see is it what I thought it was, is this new, um, and then submit that to the database, ideally. So with the method that I use to sequence the guts, it's called DNA metabarcoding, where you take a fish gut or a zooplankton sample, grind up the whole thing, um, amplify one gene from the whole thing, so you sequence everything, theoretically, within that sample um, through metabarcoding. And then in the end, you get a whole millions of DNA sequences that correspond to the organisms that were in that sample. Um, the tricky part, which you'll see, is being able to figure out what that DNA corresponds to for uh, what organism it was. It requires um, a lot of computational analysis to trust your sequences, and then it also requires a reliable DNA library of things that have been identified, which in the estuary, um, I've found a lot of, uh, you'll see a lot of unknown DNA because not a lot of sequencing has been published, uh, as far as I can tell, for this gene at least. Uh, but we know that DNA, using DNA, you can get many previously unknown prey. So um, for things, different predator species from diff uh, hawkfish down to copepod nauplii, um, with morphological ID, we had some idea of mostly hard-bodied things with high throughput or metabarcoding, uh, high throughput sequencing or metabarcoding. You s often see soft-bodied things in a lot of other prey that uh, were previously unknown, and I've just bolded a few of those, like polychaete worms, um, jellyfish, uh, dinoflagellates, all sorts of things. So it's pretty much guaranteed to give us a broader view of what's actually in the diet. So the samples that I'm working with, which I realize don't actually show up on this map, but they were throughout parts of San Pablo and Susun um, in February to May of 2017 is where the samples were collected, and this was uh, collected by Lenny Grimaldo's group in collaboration with them. Um, they were gracious to share their samples looking at longfin larval distribution that year. Um, and we did paired larval fish and zooplankton toes um, that were preserved in ethanol for genetic analysis. Um, those were sorted and ID'd by Colin Brennan, who is in this room. Thank you. He's awesome. Um, and then I was able to sterilely micro-dissect the stomachs off each fish and individually extract the DNA, amplify it, and sequence them. Um, so those are sort of the nitty-gritty details about the samples. The first comparison I'll show you um, actually compares morphological gut analysis done by Jillian Burns in the Kimmerer lab where I work. Um, to my DNA sort of analysis from fish that were collected at the same location in the same sort of sample. Um, and sort of the things that we're looking at here are which taxa can we get a higher resolution of with DNA metabarcoding and what diet items are we missing entirely with morphological diet analysis. So, um, oh yes, and I'm going to just show you one because I've got other data to talk about today, but one shoal sample from San Pablo. Uh, so, uh, in the visual uh, morphological diet analysis that Jillian did, she found a mostly Uritemera affinis, a type of copepod, um, and some unknown cyclopoid copepods. Uh, cyclopoids are one of the target groups that are really hard to identify to species. Um, so often when we look at survey data or um, diet analysis, all we know is that there were cyclopoid copepods, but we don't know exactly what species they were. So that's one of the cool things that DNA gives us that you'll see. Um, there are also some unknown copepod eggs, fish eggs, rotifers, and unknown plant and animal material. With the DNA, we can see right away Uritemera finis is there, so we have confirmation of that. Um, and then the cyclopoid unknowns are actually Acanthocyclops americanus and Acanthocyclops robustus, two very similar looking species, but um, they are different species. Um, another interesting result, uh, the morphological analysis saw the fish eggs, um, but she didn't know what species they were because it's hard to identify those as well. Um, in the DNA, we have Clupea palisi, which is Pacific herring. Um, so that suggests that our longfin larvae may be consuming herring eggs. Um, 
which is kind of cool to see because herrings spawn on substrates. So that also hints at where the long fin larvae might be feeding in the water column, down near the bottom, likely uh, around herring eggs, at least this year in 2017. Um, other DNA that I saw was rotifer DNA, which in that particular sample, there was a lot of rotifers. So it's probably indirect ingestion or maybe prey of the prey or detrital aggregates that they're just eating floating in the water column. Um, and then little bits of other, yeah, other types of potential prey that seem to be less important, at least as far as the quantity of DNA in the gut goes. Um, when we look at a summary of the gut dissection uh, feeding, so this was done by Jillian, just to further emphasize, we usually see the hard-bodied prey. Um, copepods dominate the prey. And this was, she also had samples from 2016 with Lenny's group, and it shows Uritemera was the dominant copepod in the diets of these larvae. Um, but then there were also some other cyclopoids uh, and other copepods, so really dominant crustaceans. When I look at just 2017, I know this is a little jumping around a little bit, but um, split up by San Pablo and Susun, so just for 2017 in the different habitats, um, we see some interesting little patterns. Um, but first, I guess the punchline with my whole data set is unknown DNA is, there's a ton of it in the gut. Um, and that just means that the database doesn't yet have the species in it uh, that I can have a trustworthy sort of uh, knowing that this unknown DNA sequence corresponds to this uh, organism. So a lot more work needs to be done to like fill in the gaps on the unknowns. But we see from what is known that the two Acanthocyclops americanus and robustus were common prey and Uritemera affinis, so that was expected. Um, and it was nice to be able to see like how the two different cyclopoids sort of pan out in the region. So in San Pablo, there were more, uh, uh, there was more feeding on Acanthocyclops americanus, whereas in Susun, Acanthocyclops robustus uh, formed a large proportion in some habitats, uh, particularly in the shoals. Um, some surprises uh, were the, again, the herring, uh, the Clupea palisii, DNA, and that was in a couple of habitats in the shoal of San Pablo and a little bit in the channel bottom of Susun. Um, and then Hydra alactis, a type of jellyfish, uh, was a fairly large proportion in the channel, channel bottom in Susun as well. So those are specific prey items that we maybe didn't have an ID for, we didn't know at all, uh, were prey items for longfin smell. So it'll be interesting to dig into what these unknowns are, because they could be, they could be polychaete worms, they could be other jellyfish, they could be anything really. Um, um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. And that's uh, where I'm going next. So who are the unknowns? Um, being able to dig into this is a bit time consuming because it does require individual barcoding and building a library of known DNA sequences, which I had a student working on this summer, uh, NSF funded research experiences for undergrad student, uh, Aspen Katla, who did her best with the cyclopoids, which are, if you've ever worked with them, they're, they're really difficult to ID. It comes down to looking at the position of a spine on the tail segment of this uh, this cyclopoid copepod, which is crazy. Um, but she did a great job. She got um, sort of tentative morphological IDs for 11 different cyclopoid copepods, um, tried to get DNA sequences for them. Uh, she got two that matched species in the database, so it confirmed what she thought the species was. And then we have a new addition to the NCBI database for two likely more, but we have to do a little bit more work um, figuring out who those are. And those actually, looking back at this plot, the Limnoithona tetraspina and Mesocyclops papiensis are the two species that uh, were confirmed from the database and were sequences. We were very curious, especially the Limnoithona being such an abundant copepod throughout many parts of the estuary, um, how important that might be in the diet. It turns out it's not very important, but it's still there. So, uh, in summary, uh, DNA confirmed Uritemera affinis in the diets, which was good. We didn't miss a big group. 
Um, cycloids and nauplia are often present in the diet and hard to ID visually, and we were able to get species level delineation of those two species. Um, and there were other cycloids DNA present in the diet sequences, but they weren't in the database, so it's hard to know exactly which ones those are. Um, the fish eggs and the herring DNA in particular was sort of an interesting little hint at where the fish might be feeding in the water column. So that's sort of a plan for the future is to look for more indicators in the DNA of where they might be feeding. Um, and we did see some previously unknown and soft prey, the jellyfish, herring eggs, and there were some other less common um, things in the other category. So there was a lot of individual variation in fish to fish sort of diets that I did not show. Um, and I'm still figuring out how to gauge uh, how important that is. Um, and yeah, the unknown DNA makes a large proportion of the diets, unfortunately. So in the next steps, I hope to investigate the unknowns in the DNA to really fill those gaps. Um, but that'll take some time and some expertise and a lot of collaboration. So if you're interested, talk to me. That'd be great. Um, and to assess for prey in the diet that may indicate feeding location or habitat, the herring thing. Um, also in those unknowns in a prior presentation of this work, I talked a lot about some plant DNA that might be in there. With my, I was very, very strict on this most recent analysis because I don't want to make any false assumptions about what the DNA is. But some of it hinted that there might be plant DNA that could indicate particular terrestrial areas, uh, which might tell us locations where the larvae were, uh, where their nursery habitat was, or that sort of thing. So hopefully, I'll be able to find some more little hints uh, as to critical habitats that are necessary for these larvae to find food and survive. And um, in addition, are there prey that can be used in aquaculture or can be enhanced with management actions? It is possible, um, but it's sort of hard to judge at this point. So those are things that sort of I hope to think about and look into in the future. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the state water contractors because they funded this work through my Delta Science Fellowship, which is now wrapped up, um, and all of these wonderful people, many of which are in the room. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions if I have time. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, I know, maybe Fred first. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, great talk, Michelle, and welcome back. Thanks. Um, so, the foundation for this approach kind of rests on the assumption that it represents truth. So my question is, how much do we know about the extent to which it really represents truth? And my question kind of goes to the point of, do we have any knowledge about the extent to which these fish and other types of gut analyses using DNA are these fish are essentially acting as little eDNA samplers of the water and what you're finding in the guts might not represent what actually they consume but what they're sampling in terms of the eDNA in the water? That's a good question. Um, well, one answer would be they do, I, we assume that the digestion time is fairly quick, like less than a day, maybe 12, six hours. It's kind of, uh, we don't know for sure exactly how long the DNA stays in the stomach, but it's not a really long time. Um, with, the, um, with the analyses we do, we look at sort of the relative quantity of DNA being amplified, which there can be primer biases, depending on what primers you're using. It can amplify some species better than others, but the ones that I'm working with were designed to be general, so we can assume that that's not a huge factor. So um, I guess the answer is if it's, yeah, for the things that were grouped into the other category that were a very small fraction of what was in the gut, we can't put a lot of weight on those as being important prey um, because it could be prey of the prey or detritus, sort of the sampling of the eDNA by the fish. Um, so I think the things that are there in the DNA in larger proportions 
should be considered more important um, and likely actual prey items. Um, but as you saw, the rotifers were there, and they're probably not directly fed upon. They were probably either aggregated onto detritus or, um, or just sort of sipped in the water as they swam along because they were, it was clearly a rotifer bloom at that time, or what I would call a bloom. Um, so yeah, it's kind of hit or miss, but it's not true, like eDNA, you know, fragments of DNA in the water column, no, that, that's, we wouldn't really, we wouldn't see that. Um, again, unless it was aggregated like a partially degraded fish that they consume. So with the herring, maybe, but I don't think that's the case. I think the eggs are really what they were consuming. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to John first in the back. Go ahead. It's a quick question. Um, do you have a marker for clodosera? Um, the, yeah, there, there's the library is very good for clodosterans because they've been thoroughly studied. And we did see a few. I didn't point them out, but um, there were two groups in that plot of the DNA uh, that were abundant in some of the diet in parts of Susun. Yeah. yeah. But I think that there's a spatial distribution of clodostera versus copepods in the estuary. And so if you broaden your, your spatial sampling. You yeah, there might be more clodosterans in more freshwater areas, yeah, yeah or yeah. certain areas, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, I have a quick question. How early have you seen herring eggs in the gut? Um, how, what is the size of fish? Can you repeat the question? Um, how early have you seen the DNA of herring eggs in dongfin's gut? Oh, I haven't looked at the size distribution yet. Uh, most of the fish in my data set, I had 144 or so total longfin larvae that I was working with for the gut analysis, and most of them were between 7 and 15 millimeters in length, the fish themselves. Um, not many larger than that. Go ahead, just speak out loud. Yeah, okay, I'll try. Um, I'm interested by the herring egg in the gut, and I wonder, in particular, because the bulk of the herring are spawning further to the south in saltier water on the, you know, on the on the margins of the bay, and I wonder if you have any uh, thoughts about what those eggs say about the uh, the presumption that the larvae uh, live where you where they were caught versus moving around and somehow and feeding yeah um, another good question well they're all good questions um, that one in particular is interesting because the data that we were looking at is from 2017 which was a very wet year um, a lot of our larvae were in San Pablo Bay, um, so it's a bit more seaward than you might expect the longfin. Um, yeah, uh, I'd have to look at and think about how far we expect the, the, the larvae to actually travel in the given time of digestion that we might expect. Um, and yeah, so I don't know how so I'll ask things that, to think about. I'm familiar with the data. Yeah. yeah. So in 2016 and 2017, we collected herring larvae throughout Sassoon Bay and San Pablo Bay. So when you mentioned the CDFW, you know, where they actually document, they actually don't look at spawning occurring north of Central Bay. So that might be a missed opportunity for them. Actually, this is what highlights, well, maybe there is spawning going on in San Pablo Bay and in Sassoon Bay. Yeah, and I will say real quick, um, I'm doing a diet comparison of the herring larval diets to the longfin larval diets, partially because herring that year tended to co-occur in the same area. They're roughly the same size, probably consuming the same thing. So it's sort of a trying to see uh, differences between the herring and the longfin. Um, so they were very abundant in most of the samples where I also had longfin. Thanks. Um, I'm always fascinated by this work, and I'm sure we could poke holes in all kinds of places, and part of it's my own ignorance of, of, the, of the method. Um, so I'm fascinated. Uh, going back to the herring, um, it seems that, as John was mentioning, that um, they're spawning in different places. 
larvae can mix together, but they're not really overlapping generally, it seems, in terms of where they're spawning and where eggs are found and where the larvae are recruiting for long and smelt. One of the alternative hypotheses might be, and maybe you can correct me if this is not possible, is coprophagy, which is the, the consumption of fecal pellets. It's very common in many different fishes. And these larvae, when they poop, they poop out lots of whole copepods. Um, and when they poop, they're also covered in membranes and, and cells from the uh, fish that was consuming the predator. So I was wondering if there's a chance when there's thousands of herring larvae pooping out copepod parts, mm -hmm. that maybe longfin are eating those copepod parts, and there you're getting herring DNA in the longfin diets. That is possible. Also, if they're, they're along those lines, if there are adult herring in the water column pooping, you know, you would get the same DNA. It's herring DNA, uh, whether it's a larvae or an adult. So that is entirely possible and worth considering. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. information there. So our next speaker is Tian Shui Hong from uh, UC Davis, who's an adjunct professor, and we know Tian's work on delta smelt and culture, and today he's going to talk about some of the challenges he's had with Longfin and next steps on that front. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here to attend this symposium. I mean, even with two talks, that's a lot to think about already. Um, so today, I would like to talk about um, longfin smell culture that has been conducted at UC Davis Fish Conservation Culture Lab. Um, at, the fish at the Fish Conservation Culture Lab, we have been culturing delta smell for over 20 years. Uh, from the last few years, we start to work on longfin smell as well. Um, what we are trying mainly trying to do is to see if um, the delta smell culture method could be applied on longfin smelt. So today I'm going to talk about my progress so far, and uh, um, and just to, um, to see to uh, to share with everyone now what we have learned um, from the past few years. So um, the FCCO started to culture longfin smelt since 2008. It's been 10 years. 10 years sounds like a long time, um, but actually. Um, for these 10 years, the main focus of the Fish Conservation Culture Lab is to um, improve the cultural method and to develop a refugee population for you know whom. So um, we don't have too much um, labor or space uh, available for longfin smelt. Um, we don't even have too much funding in the first few years, and later we have some support from DWR. Uh, which is much appreciated. Uh, so we have been working a little bit more on, on longfin in recent years. Um, but the most challenging part of longfin smell culture is we don't have enough fish. Um, when we started work on longfin smelt, um, we, found, we just found out that to keep the wild caught longfin smelt alive is much more difficult than we think. They are bigger than delta smell, they are stronger, they can survive by themselves in the tank, but they don't eat. So no matter how we try to feed them, they just don't eat. So in that case, we, don't, we cannot help them long enough to do any study or even to do any spawning. So in the past, when we are receiving fish from US Fish and Wildlife Service, we only target a um, ripe female or expressing male. Um, so that's why uh, in the past few years, we um, received the fish that is way under uh, our permit number. Um, and the closest we, can, we, we could make is even fewer. Um, and to be honest, for those crosses we made, most of them are not good, good crosses. I will talk about why later. Um, until 2015-16, uh, we start to have some breakthrough on the culture of adult longfin. Um, so that's why at that time we start to accept more fish, not even that are immature or small, and hopefully to hold them long enough uh, to increase uh, the, the chance of spawning. So today I'm going to talk about what we have learned from the limited fish we got in the past. 
Uh, majorly, we will, I will be focusing on uh, the, the progress of long fin, wild, adult wild long fin culture and uh, how is the culture going for our long fin babies. Um, also, um, based on our Delta smell culture experience, um, we know that stability, temperature, and salinity are quite important, and also some recommendations from researchers, other researchers, of course. So we are looking into them a little bit with some preliminary tests. And at the end, I'm, to, I'm going to make some recommendations of future culture. So these are the hatching of our long fin babies. Yeah. So first, for wild fish culture. As I mentioned earlier, winning, winning them to the food we provide is still the most challenging part. Um, and uh, it is actually more serious than how it looks like. So this is the, um, the date of us receiving fish in, the, in 2019. So last year, we have some extra help other than U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have DWR and ICF collecting fish for us. We also have um, Jun and Levi's group to collect the fish. So actually, we got a lot of fish last year. But think about past before we ha have this extra help. So we only have U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service produce, uh, providing fish for us, and we only accept um, ripe and uh, expressing fish. So which means you will see only very little bar um, with very few of them in the in chart. So what does that mean? That means if we got one female in November, the next fish coming in might be after one or two months. So if that fish is expressing male, we need to wait for a female to come in. Or if we got a female, we need to wait for male coming. So basically, it's hard to get both male and female expressing and ripe at the same time. So we have to make any crosses that even the eggs are not ripe or eggs are overripe, we need to make the crosses anyways. So the, the eggs we got actually is, is not really great condition. Um, and also, uh, long fish smell are stronger, but they are still smelt. So um, based on the collection gear and the, the transportation of them, um, it's a lot of stress on them. So um, the survival from um, the the place where, where they got collected, transporting our facility, um, there are some mortality happens. So it's just getting, make it even difficult. So as I mentioned, uh, from about three years ago, we started have some breakthrough of adult fish. Um, so we start to receive more, more fish um, than in the past. Uh, but we still have limited space available for culture and land. So actually we, are, we need to consolidate uh, fish collective at a different location put it in the same tank, um, just to raise them together. Um, in order to track individual fish, how the individual fish doing, so we have to tag them. Uh, we applied the VIA tag we used on Delta smelt, which are the two pictures on the left. Um, so we actually insert a VIA tag underneath their skin. So for Delta smelt, it's easy to look at the, the number, the tag numbers uh, directly. Uh, however, for long fin smelt on the bottom left, uh, basically you cannot see the tag. So we have to apply other method um, to, to, to see the fish. So this is a video we have last year with a lot of long fin with a new tag. And it looks like some student carrying their backpack. So it's cute. <laughs> uh, but actually, at least we have some way to, to track uh, this fish from different location. So with uh, this information, and also with uh, the big number of fish we received last year, Actually, we can start to do some analysis and then to make some recommendations. Uh, for last year, we totally received um, 313 fish, and a quarter of them didn't make it through the first three days. Uh, that is the transportation mortality we are considered. So, and the lowest mort mortality, they are with a size about 83 millimeter. And the rest of the fish that survived, they, the average size is about 100 plus millimeter. And if we look at uh, the, the survival days in the lab um, at a different size range, so it's very, very obvious that um, there's a significant effect of the size on the survivalship of fish in the lab. So actually this year, we actually uh, would like to only receive fish that are larger than 80 millimeter, just to make it more practical in the lab. So with the tag, we can also see how long we can, help the, we can hold the fish in the lab. So from 2008 to 2015, um, basically they are not eating at all. 
So the longest time we can hold a fish in the lab is 25 days. So basically three weeks. Um, so if we don't get another fish that can be made with in three weeks, then it's a waste. And the longest time we can hold a female and the, before it's bound is 20 days. So basically the, the time window is very short. Um, in 2015, we start to realize that if we don't have any progress on keeping the wild, alive, wild fish alive, then we basically cannot do nothing. So we start to put more efforts on keeping the wild fish alive. So what we have done this year is, in this year, we got two major group of fish coming in. The first group coming in, came in, um, we used the same method, so they survived 30 days, <coughs> almost the same. But the seven, uh, second group of fish, uh, we start to play something different. We put a few delta smell in the tank with them. So there are two reasons of doing this. The first reason is even the fish can survive by itself. But based on our experience on delta smelt, uh, delta smelt actually feel very stressed when they, the density, uh, fish density is low. So we just want to have uh, more fish to be accompanied with them. And then the second reason might be more critical is uh, the culture of the fish, they have, the culture of delta smell, they have no problem feeding. So we kind of hope uh, the delta smell in the tank will lead longfish smell to feed. And actually, uh, the result is promising. We already spend the time we can hold them in the lab for double. And then the next year, the, uh, we start to uh, uh, implement this method and we can hold the fish for about six months. So that's a big improvement. Um, and that's why we start to receive more fish and just because we can hold it longer. Um, in, but um, something always happened during the culture. So 17, uh, 18 and 19 season, uh, we don't have fish survive that long. We don't break our record. Um, but we do see a majority of fish survive longer, so which is an improvement. Um, in 2017 and 18 year, uh, we also implement a, a, a next um, method for culturing longfin. Based on their gut content, we start to incorporate um, live mice in their diet. And uh, with the mice going in, we do see they start to show feces, uh, feces in the tank earlier. And uh, when we are checking the sex of the fish and the maturity of fish, we see the feces in the gut also. So, uh, which means they are feeding, although we didn't really see, see they feeding. So maybe they are feeding in the night or sometime else, so we don't know yet. Um, but we are able to get and start to feed early. And um, the longest time we could hold a, a female before she spawn is two months, which gives us more room to prepare, to be prepared for a, a male fish and to mate with. So we do have some improvement on, on culturing wild adult fish. So what's next? the long fin larvae we produced. How are we doing on them? So it's a little bit impressive. So we don't have too much progress over the, the past 10 years. Um, the long fin smell larvae seems to, to keep dying off at their early life, early larval life stage. Um, the mortality start to show up between 10 and 40 days post hatch. And the, we tried many things. We tried different tem temperature, we tried different salinity. Um, we start to treat them, but it doesn't really work. So that's why I initiated a, a collaboration work with Richard Connors group and the name Fangi groups and the Gene and the device group, trying to um, resolve this problem. Um, still right now it's still in, pro in progress. Uh, by the way, the data I'm showing today uh, is the data uh, we got from our previous studies in the lab. We, I didn't include um, the collaborators' work in here yet. Um, but one thing that, be, that might be good to know is if some fish somehow get through that bottleneck around 40 days post age, the survival is kind of stable. They can su survive in a better, percent, a percent, better rate. So if we could uh, get through this bottleneck, um, it might be a good sign for keeping them alive longer. But we are not um, learning nothing uh, from our previous failure. Um, so we can actually can answer some questions. Again, this is the data we got from last year because we have so many fish. So we are able to spawn many crouches. So actually from the 45 crouches we spawned, 
we can answer there's a question that asking if the fish egg quality decreases um, with the time in the spawning season. And people are interested in uh, is the eggs are getting worse and worse. Um, from the data we got in the lab, um, the hatching and the fertilization didn't really affect it uh, by when we collect the fish. So um, it's a slight decline, but um, it's not significant correlation for both fertilization and hatching. And then we have tested uh, different temperatures for incubation. So we tried to incubate the eggs at 12 degree and 16 degree, and there's no significant difference between the temperatures. This study was conducted years ago. In the re recent year, um, another graduate student was working on a similar topic and using different method, of course, and the result is the same. So they, the result shows two different temperatures didn't really affect the hatching and the fertilization rate. But they do find out that the, the larvae hatched, uh, incubated at lower temperature, do have a better efficiency of consuming their yolk. So that means they are less stressful when the temperature are lower. Um, the survival-wise, at 40 dPH, um, there's no difference, but I mean, it's very poor, so there's no, no point to, to compare that. The next thing is stability. Um, from Delta Simeon culture, we do find out that the, the stability is very important. So we, we are planning to do some stability tests, but that needs a lot of fish and enough space. So we, don't have, we haven't done that again, um, yet, but we are planning to do that this year. Uh, the most, and then salinity is the uh, most critical ones that many researchers suggest. So we actually do the incubation of, of the eggs at different salinity. It's, for one year, it shows that a little bit solid uh, condition will get a better hatching rate. But the next year, we test uh, hatching the eggs at a fresh water for PPT and a tidal. That means within one day, there's a zero to eight PPT difference. Um, the fresh water actually do better. So we follow up with culturing the fish at the um, fresh water and the test different salinities, but I mean, as you know, the survival is really, really bad. So, but with the survived fish, we, we can actually get a growth chart for the fish. So although these two fish are culturally different temperature, but we, I actually can show you that long fish smell at 12 degree has a similar growth rate to uh, delta smell cultured at 16 degree. So in the, in the, during the process, we will have some observations. So like delta smell, long fish smell are attracted to light but they are not going to light as aggressive as delta smell. And uh, they do go deeper into the water column um, after 10 days post hatch. Um, but I mean, that they start to die off a lot of time. They are rolling out, rolling off, so we're not really sure what's going on there. Um, and uh, actually larger, cut, cut, larger cut, uh, cultured fish, they tend to scratch their face on the wall and get fungus up. And if we rotate the water direction, they, they scratch another side. So, but I think we will worry about this later. And then for adult fish, we uh, we find out culture at a seven PVT or larger is a bit better. So I'm running out of time. So these are recommendations. It's very easy, so you can just take a look. So any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Take a break. Um, Eleven o'clock to start time. Okay. So, disclaimer first. I'm talking about the research I did at UC Davis, and so anything I say does not reflect the opinions of the department, unless, unless they like what I say. Um, so this was a project that we started five years ago to go looking for a long quince melt in all the wrong places, um, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, I have a lot of people to thank. Um, many of them are in the room today, way back there in the corner, Hobbs Lab. Um, but the Hobbs Lab is now uh, the Otolith Geochemistry and Fish Ecology Lab at UC Davis, run by uh, Dr. Levi Lewis and Dr. Malta Wilmus. <clears throat> and it, the lab is in good hands, trust me. 
Okay, so long fence melt have clearly declined. Um, and I want to sort of present this graph to give us some context about what we're going to see um, over the next few years of data uh, in this talk. So we started in 2015, um, right at the tail end of a pretty nasty drought. Long fence melt were not abundant pretty much anywhere in the estuary based on uh, CDFW fall midwater trawl and the San Francisco Bay study, which are now my studies. Oh, no, just kidding. But um, we are showing uh, some early returns for 2019. So fall midwater trawl numbers are not looking so good this year. Uh, Bay study otter trawl does see an uptick in numbers, so that might be promising. But uh, uh, in general, things aren't looking so good. Um, so in this study, we're trying to figure out where long fence melt um, occur downstream of the Carquina Straits. Um, and some of this was sort of spurred by the work I was doing in the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project down in Lower South Bay, um, where we're conducting otter trawl surveys. So otter trawls collect things off the bottom, as this cute little graphic shows. Um, and then, so <clears throat> the study, like I said, goes from 2015 to 2019. And we are going to combine our data with the San Francisco Bay study data. Um, for otter trawls to look at adult distribution of long fence melt throughout the estuary. So um, Department of Fish and Wildlife samples in the North Delta, the South Delta, the confluence to Sassoon Bay, and then all the way down the major axis down to Lower South Bay. Um, UC Davis Sassoon Marsh study run by Dr. Moyle's lab uh, has been doing otter trawls in Sassoon Marsh since the 1980s, so we concluded their data. And then our study was looking at these tributaries downstream of the confluence, so in the Napa River, and the marshes in that area, Sonoma Creek sort of in the middle, um, and then the Petaluma River. So three places that get freshwater input into the North Delta, North Bay. And then all the way down in Lower South Bay and the Alviso Marsh, which is fed by Coyote Creek and Guadalupe River. Um, so we did monthly otter trawls year round, but for this study looking at long fence melt adults, we're constraining that time period to um, November to March when we see most of the adults. Um, there's some slight differences in how we sample. Um, the otter trawls that we conducted um, in the bay tributaries are conducted across relatively fixed stations that are spread throughout the top to the bottom of the watershed wherever we can get. Um, the S San Francisco Bay study samples fixed stations are out in channels, so our, mar our samples are mostly in marshes, and our net's a little bit smaller than the San Francisco Bay study, but it's generally we catch similar things. And in Sassoon Marsh, there's 24 fixed stations. So sampling effort's a little bit different. Um, and so the different symbols on this map are sort of showing where the fixed stations are. And then San Pablo Bay has got a whole bunch of different stations that we sampled in addition to the, the bay tributaries. So <clears throat> looking at long fence smell catch, so we're basically just plotting up raw catch uh, per minute tow. So this is scaled to 10 minutes because that's the number of minutes that we tow. Uh, the symbols are representing the, the different catch sizes. Uh, colors are showing you what, what different surveys uh, these data are coming from. So Sissou Marsh is sort of this yellow color. I'm not sure if it shows up that well in this uh, sort of washed out view. Um, but um, <clears throat> 2014 to 2015, you know, peak of the drought, very few fish were caught. Um, throughout the system, but the Alviso Marsh, we had uh, many catches of, you know, five to ten fish per tow. Then in 2015-16, population kind of, you know, collapsed at this point. The drought's been really hard on long fence melt, but we still catch a few fish in the lower uh, South Bay Marsh. 2016 to 2017, again, very few fish, um, some in Sassoon Marsh, some in uh, Sonoma Creek, and uh, again, many in the Alviso Marsh. And then 2017 to 2018, this is sort of our, our wet win winter that we had. Uh, now we're starting to see more fish sort of show up all over the place, uh, but again, uh, a lot in the Alviso Marsh and in the Bay Tributaries. Um, 2018 to 2019, that's this uh, year before past, uh, we're starting to see some more fish. Uh, they're sort of distributed again through the tributaries, but also in the main channels um, from the confluence essentially all the way down to Lower South Bay. Um, so this is sort of a, a summary graphic showing uh, the catches over the entire time series. And essentially what we see is long fence melt uh, adults going pretty much everywhere there's water. Uh, they're moving up the Napa River almost all the way to the town of Napa itself 
and up Petaluma River to about as far as you could possibly move, uh, as well as Sonoma Creek. They're also going up into Sassoon Marsh. So uh, Sassoon Marsh has always been used by long fence melt, particularly adults. But they are moving somewhat up into the, to the lower Sacramento River um, and all the way down into particularly the Alviso Marsh in the lower South Bay. In the last five years, long fence melt were quite abundant. So this is looking at the, the monthly mean CPUE uh, across those different habitats. Um, and what you should really take from this is that, in the, at least in the last five years, adults have been order, uh, about an order of magnitude more abundant in the Alviso Marsh, um, which I don't know. Does anybody know where Alviso Marsh is? If you read our blogs, you, you would know, but um, it's kind of an important place for long fence melt. Um, so long fence melt adults are everywhere, but are they reproducing everywhere? So we took a subsample of all the fish we caught, and we did gonad staging. So we adapted a method that, uh, that Lauren Damon from CDFW developed for delta smelt using the spring Kodiak trawl uh, for delta smelt. And we did this for our long fence melt that we catch. Um, and so it's a similar sort of ranking stage from zero to, to four or five, depending on male or female. And we also incorporated a, an index for the evidence of this uh, repeat spawning or multiple broods. That's number six. Um, and so over the 2014 to 2019 period, we saw in the Bay Tributary, so in the Napa River, 50% of our fish were sexually mature, so that'd be stage four or greater. Uh, Sonoma Creek, 86%. The Petaluma River, 50%. And in the Lower South Bay, 80%. So in those Bay Tributaries, fish are reaching sexual maturity. And looking at this over the monthly period, so females are on top and the males are on bottom, um, the darker colors are more ripe. So we're seeing fish, you know, a few fish are showing up in October in, in earlier stages, but by November we're starting to already see ripe fish, including uh, fish that are in that, that second, that stage six with uh, multiple egg sizes. And then by December we're seeing, you know, roughly half these fish are, are reaching sexual maturity, um, but this is dropping off in February, March. So it seems like the spawning season is is kind of con been constrained in the last five years to primarily December and January. Um, so in the Alviso Marsh, you know, this we we saw particularly in the this last winter a lot of fish. So we were able to you know look at some better detailed spatial patterns on where uh, reproductive fish are showing up. And so um, down in the Alviso Marsh, there are several tidally restored salt ponds. So A19, A21, and A6. So these were restored in 819 and 21 were restored to tidal action in 2006. And the pictures are sort of showing what it looks like in the last few years. So these things used to be gypsum layers that were meters thick, and now they're actually tidal marsh, and they're absolutely beautiful. Um, so <clears throat> what we found in this last year, looking at reproductive stage and numbers of fish throughout the system, uh, is that there were a lot of fish that were sexually mature in these tidally restored salt ponds, um, equivalent to what we were seeing in the main stem of Coyote Creek, um, with the most sexually mature fish showing up the farthest upstream that you could go. Um, so in February, March of 2019, sort of these are sort of observations that we made. Um, in the lower part of the, the creek, which is on your left, <clears throat> where that star is, we saw uh, several, several, several times we saw spawning ag what we thought were spawning aggregations. So this is a, a sonar image from our fish finder, and you can see these marks of small fish down at the bottom. And we would tow through there and find, you know, we were catching 50 to, we had a couple toes that were over 100 uh, adult long fence melt, staging at the lower end of this creek next to Tidal Marsh. Uh, and then upstream in Coyote Creek, where the other star is, we were finding uh, ripe, mature fish, both males and females. So males get really dark colored. Um, they're pretty distinct to be able to tell apart. And many fish were actually spawning in our hands. Um, downstream in this, what we're calling a spawning aggregation area, uh, we had a strong vertical stratification where it's four parts per thousand at the top and 14 at the bottom. But upstream, we're seeing fresh water. So this looks like this, this sort of uh, conceptual model of how long fence melt sort of stage downstream, and they'll make these migrations when they're ready to go. They'll make migrations towards freshwater um, to spawn. And so the area we're finding them spawning was adjacent to this tidally restored pond A19, 
and against next to that was an ancient marsh that's uh, never been um, harmed much. Um, but this this slough abuts this not only tidal marsh, but it's right adjacent to one of the largest wastewater treatment plants in the bay, and one of the largest dumps. So it's kind of surprising that longfin smelt are in this area, but they are, and they're in these really shallow, shallow sloughs. Um, so it's something somewhat different than what we thought longfin smelt were doing. Um, so we're finding adults in the wintertime in these places. We're finding them sexually mature, but are we finding larvae? Are they actually spawning and recruiting in these areas? So here we took the CDFW smelt larval survey net, and we sampled in these same tributary areas to see if we got uh, larvae. So the smelt larval net, as Trishelle said earlier, it primarily catches really small larvae. So um, in our nets, we saw fish predominantly, you know, less than 10 millimeters. I keep hitting the wrong button. So again, similar maps to what we saw previously for adults. Um, and I'll also point out that the sampling we did was a little bit different than the CDFW sampling. Uh, CDFW samples these fixed stations across the upper estuary. In our survey, we took a sort of stratified random sampling design where we sat stratified samples across salinity gradients in these tributaries, knowing that in these drier years, the fresh water is really shoved way upstream. So we try to get at least two toes per five different salinity strata. So each, each area would get at least 10 toes on a biweekly basis. Um, and so in, we're showing here what happened in uh, what we saw in January and February of uh, 2015, um, a dry year. The ma majority of the larvae are upstream in Sassoon Bay. We did see a few larvae in the upper reaches of Napa, Sonoma, and Petaluma, uh, but nothing down in the lower South Bay. And then in 2016, another dry year, we see something similar. Uh, most of the larvae are upstream in Sassoon Bay, um, but there are a few in the Petaluma River, or in the Napa River. And there was one catch in San Pablo Bay. Uh, 2017, a wetter year, we're starting to see these small larvae out in San Pablo Bay and the Napa River. Um, January, February, uh, we did not see any larvae in Lower South Bay. Um, and then in 2018, uh, a drier year, again, where most of the larvae are back upstream in Sassoon Bay and a few in the Napa River. And so to sort of summarize the whole survey period, uh, we could see that you know, from this time period, the bulk of these larval long can smelt were up in Sassoon Bay, but there is evidence that they're coming out of these, some of these North Bay tributaries. So that's little, little larvae, right? So we also uh, took CDFW's 20 millimeter survey, which uh, collects slightly bigger fish and has a much bigger net, so it gets more sampling uh, area sampled. And that collects fish anywhere from like 10 to 30 millimeters. So we conducted this survey starting in late, uh, late February, March, all the way up through April or May. Um, so here we're showing our catches from March through May of 2016, along with CDFW uh, data. So a dry year looks a lot like the, uh, the larval distribution. They're up in Sassoon Bay and a few in the Napa River. Then in 2017, uh, a wetter year, we're seeing a lot of fish out in San Pablo Bay, the Napa River, Sonoma Creek, Petaluma River and even down in Lower South Bay. So this was the first time we saw uh, recruiting longfin smelt in, in Lower South Bay. Um, once they get about 20 millimeters, they can be retained by our otter trawl. So we've been sampling Alvisa marsh since 2010, and this was the first time we saw evidence of successful reproduction in the Alvisa marsh. That was pretty amazing. I was excited. Then in 2018, another dry year, looks like Typical dry pattern where it's mostly Sassoon Bay, some in the Napa River, and a few in the Petaluma, but most of the juveniles are up or post larval upstream. Then in 2019, so we didn't include CDFW's data because they weren't done yet, but uh, we had a pretty bang up year in 2019, a lot of fish in the Napa River system, Sonoma Creek, Petaluma, and again for the second time, successful reproduction in the Alviso Marsh in Lower South Bay. And that's sort of what it looks like over that time span, that there were post-larval longfin smelt pretty much everywhere we sampled, both in Napa, Sonoma, Petaluma Marsh, San Pablo Bay, and Alvisa Marsh, as well as what, we know, what we've known about is in Sassoon Bay, a lot of fish. Um, and so looking at these catch density comparisons between uh, SLS and 20 millimeter, 
what we found was over this time span that uh, larval densities were the greatest in Sassoon Bay, Sassoon Marsh, and the confluence. Whereas looking at the post-larval fish uh, from 2016 to 2019, we actually saw the highest densities occur in the Napa um, with good numbers in the Alviso Coyote Creek Marsh and San Pablo Bay, Petaluma Sonoma. So longfin smelt are distributed downstream of the confluence for sure. Um, and so this is sort of our conceptual model of, of what we're seeing is that in these wet years, the larvae and predominantly the post-larvae are distributed down into San Pablo Bay, some in the lower South Bay. Those are the years we have high recruitment. So we're trying to get to this flow abundance relationship mechanism. We should be looking at what's happening in the spring and summer downstream of the, of the, conf, or the Carquina Straits. However, in dry years, most of the larvae and post larvae are in Sassoon Bay. So I think our long-term time series of what we've been doing for young fish uh, for longfin smelt is, is relatively adequate. And then, uh, and those are the years when longfin smelt don't do well, is when they're stuck in Sassoon Bay. Um, so just sort of a take home, you know, what do longfin smelt need? Well, from this study, they need wet years, obviously. Um, but tidal marsh restoration might be something that will actually benefit longfin smelt. Unlike delta smelt, where they haven't really been found in tidal marsh rest restorations yet, longfin smelt are showing up there in good numbers. They're finding tidal marsh. So their life history might be tuned to these sort of shallow uh, ponded or marshy habitats. And that's all I got. Time for questions? Yes, you have time. That was great, Jim. Thanks, and congratulations on the new job. Thank you. Um, the I'm interested in Alviso marshes because I was involved in in the monitoring plan when they were breached, so it's a place close to my heart as well. But um, what I'm wondering is. You know, Moyle's 2002 book and the CDFW conceptual model for longfin smell both identify, based on the historic data prior to the breaching of those ponds, uh, that the pattern that you're seeing that adult longfin smell occur, uh, you know, are found in the South Bay off those creeks uh, in wet years and not in dry years. So I wonder if we, if you can speak to any thoughts you have or any evidence that you've seen that the restoration of the marsh has changed anything from the pattern that was evident back then? That's a, that's a good question. So what I didn't show is there is an otter trawl data set from 1981 to 1986 that the city of San Jose conducted um, as post monitoring for their upgrade of their wastewater treatment plant. And in that survey, um, over that time period, longfin smelt were the sixth most abundant species, predominantly in the wintertime. So this is in the early 80s, adult longfin smelt utilized the Alviso marsh. Um, they didn't report any post-larval or juvenile fish, so it was all adults. And so I'm assuming the 83 El Nino may have blown them out. Um, but the restoration, so we don't have a, a lot of data on what was going on prior to the restoration of those ponds, but the Alviso marsh is by far the most productive part of the San Francisco estuary. Our chlorophyll concentrations, even in the wintertime, are you know, 30 to 50 micromolar. And our copepod densities are two to three times greater than they are in Sassoon Bay, and our mycin numbers are just absolutely off the charts. It's an extremely productive system. Longfin smelt really like the mycin shrimp, so I think that's supporting this population down there. Um, but the river flows into that system are, are pretty sparse. The city of San Jose uses all the fresh water for groundwater recharge, so the only years we're seeing sexual, successful reproduction is when we get really good wet conditions that sort of overwhelm the reservoirs and their, and their management capacity and actually provide freshwater flows. So we get much of the marsh in 2017 and 2019 was below two parts per thousand for several months. And that's when we saw good recruitment. We did Galenus and uh, Novato Creeks. We did see larvae and post larvae in, a, I think, maybe a two or three adults. Um, we didn't do it as consistently for every survey, but when the tides would allow, we would go in there. There were some over there as well. Say that again? What time of day did you see? Time of day? This was early morning. Um, 
it they could be spawning overnight um but yeah it was mostly early morning sampling that we did that we found spawning fish So our next speaker is Mandy Finger, who's the Associate Director of the Genomic Variation Lab at UC Davis. And she's going to be talking about some of her more recent results on long-fin smelt populations up and down the coast. Find your, See. Oh, presentations that go back here. You go here. Oh, here. Yeah, you go this thing there. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. Oh, like the thing. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so it seems like everybody's sort of. No, I need to make it big. Holy cow. Oh, yeah. Uh, most people in this uh, symposium are really focusing on, you know, the San Francisco estuary and little micro things occurring in the estuary. And I just want to invite you all to take a step back. And we're going to look at the whole coast, whole North American West Coast. And we're also going to take the long view. So we're going to take like 10,000, 20,000 year view to think about long fin smelt. So I just want to prime you all with that information before you take this information and, uh, and you know, make anything meaningful to right here, right now. So uh, range-wide, long fin smelt are understudied. Um, obviously, we're having this research symposium today, so they're very well studied in the estuary. No problem there. And uh, they're very well studied in Lake Washington, which is a landlocked lake in uh, Washington State probably because University of Washington is right there and it's close and you can go just get the fish and, and study them. Um, so throughout the rest of their range, they're largely known from incidental catch. A lot of times there aren't really good population trends or things like that about these other populations. Um, there are a couple of previous genetic studies. There was an osmerid phylogeny in 2009 and uh, my own lab did a microsatellite characterization in 2010, and uh, we wrote a paper last year that showed that uh, longfin smelt would hybridize with, uh, with delta smelt. But as we all know, there are still are significant knowledge gaps. And one of the things that genetics can contribute to is questions about connectivity, adaptation, and historical demography. So the central questions that we are answering is, uh, is there genetic structure throughout the range of longfin smelt? We want to know, is there structure within the San Francisco estuary? And we also want to look at range-wide, because we, we want to know how the San Francisco estuary population compares genetically to the other populations. After all, this population is but one in a lot of populations of longfin smelt. Uh, so the other question is, uh, is there a connectivity, which, and when I say connectivity, I mean gene flow, I mean individuals moving, transporting their genes back and forth between different locations in the southern populations? And finally, is there any sign of adaptation? So a lot of this is going to be reviewed, this first part, but we had 149 samples, and we got a pretty good coverage of the west coast. We got basically all the major estuaries, San Francisco, Humboldt isn't a major estuary. Columbia River is. Lake Washington is that landlocked lake. Then Fraser River Estuary, which is two, we got samples from two lakes that are pretty far inland, Pitt Lake and Harrison Lake. Uh, Skeena River Estuary and, uh, and Yakutat Bay in Alaska. And obviously we had really great sampling effort in, uh, in the San Francisco Estuary because everybody's going out all the time catching the lumping smelt, so we could take advantage of that. And then here's the map of uh, of the locations where we had long fin smelt samples in the estuary. Pretty good coverage. So I'm going to shift straight into data type. Um, 
probably very few of you in here are geneticists. Um, so traditional markers essentially don't survey a whole lot of the genome, and you don't have as much power. But there's a new technique, which isn't that new anymore, called RAD sequencing, which stands for restricted site, res restriction site, that's a typo, associated DNA sequencing. And essentially, it produces sequence data that represents a fairly decent proportion of the individual's genome. It's a very powerful approach, and it has broad applications, and if you do any publication search and you search RAD sequencing, you'll see that just the populator has, popularity has exploded. It's being used more and more. And this figure down here, you can kind of see the color blocks represent a genome, and you see the microsatellites, for example, just don't sample that much of the genome, but RAD sequencing can sample thousands of loci genome-wide. It's just a more powerful approach. You get more data. So going into the results, um, yeah, I could, I could go on for a long time about how that's done and it's, et cetera, et cetera, but let's just, let's just skip that and go to the results. Uh, so we had the highest number of polymorphic loci in the Fraser River populations, the estuary, and the Columbia River estuary. Not surprising, these are large populations. It was surprising that Yakutat Bay had lower diversity, but you'll understand that a little bit more as I move through the slides. So for our question one, is there structure within the estuary? It just doesn't seem like there is, at least not genetically speaking, not, not with the, the, uh, the view that we get with genetics. So we can treat it as a single population moving forward for more analyses. And uh, question 1B was range-wide structure, and there's, there's quite a lot of range-wide structure. Um, PC1 separates Yakutat Bay, Alaska, and Lake Washington. Uh, again, Lake Washington is landlocked. Nobody knows, maybe somebody knows, but I haven't been able to find this information, how they got there. But anyway, they're genetically very different. So then we see Skeena River estuary and the Fraser River. And then we have this blob here in the middle, and that is essentially San Francisco estuary, Humboldt Bay, and the Columbia River estuary. So okay, that's interesting. Uh, let's, let's zoom in a little bit. So another way of observing differentiation in genetic data is to estimate FST values. It's a measure from zero to one. Zero means very little differentiation. One means very high differentiation. So we can see that our lowest FST values are between the estuary, the Columbia River, and Humboldt Bay. Uh, but uh, Fraser River estimates are, are also pretty low. So OK, it looks like something's going on. Maybe, maybe there's some gene flow. Maybe, uh, you know, basically there's gene flow. <laughs> I'm all trying to think of something else, but no, it seems like there's probably some gene flow. Uh, so we were like, hmm, what could be causing this low differentiation? Uh, and as I mentioned, ongoing gene flow, or maybe you could think of, say, let's pretend that 100 years ago there was one longfin smelt population in the ocean, and they all just were like, oh, let's go into an estuary. They picked one. And so that would mean that there would be similar populations too. Probably not likely, but we're just trying to think of all the, re all the ways that we could have this low differentiation. But the nice thing is that we can use genetic variation to reconstruct the history of populations. And I'll provide you with an example from humans, which I'm sure you guys have all seen in the news or maybe thought about. I mean, we're humans. We like ourselves. We're interested in ourselves. Oops. So here is an example from the literature recently that shows um, a phylogeny. And we're including modern humans, the Denisovans, and Neanderthals. And they got DNA from a toe bone, I think, and then they had some from ancient Denisovans, and then, of course, it's easy to get modern human DNA. And so they created this model, and they tested it with the data that they collected from these genomes, and they were able to estimate um, sort of gene flow between these three groups. So essentially, we know we have three groups, but hey, was there, was there a genetic exchange between them? And I'm sure you guys have all heard in the news, oh, we're all just part Neanderthal, you know? Well, it's true, and it's because there was some interbreeding over, over time in the past. And so we were like, okay, well, let's, let's look at our current data on these estuary populations, and let's test some migration models. 
So we tested three models. The first was divergence with full migration, so any population. I should, I should back up and say that these are really computationally intensive, and we had this evidence that these um, three southern populations were exchanging gene flows, so that's what we included in the model. So we didn't, we didn't add Yakutat Bay, we didn't add Fraser River, Skeena, et cetera. It looks like they're really different anyway. Um, it's a bit of a matter of practicality, and the analysis still took months, so that's what we did. So within these three populations, we tested three models, the one I already mentioned. And then we tested a second one, which says gene flow only among neighbors. So Humboldt can only exchange, so, Cal, so San Francisco estuary can only exchange migrants with Humboldt. Uh, Columbia can only exchange migrants with uh, Humboldt. And Humboldt, because it's in the middle, can exchange migrants with both. And then the third model we tested is isolation of an ancestral population with, with no gene flow whatsoever. And uh, all of our statistics pointed to divergence with full migration. So the timing um, was that we estimated the there was an ancestral population expansion about 12 to 15,000 years ago. And it roughly coincides with the last glacial maximum. And I grabbed a map off the internet, and it kind of shows that Alaska and these other Canadian populations probably just weren't available to Longfin smelt. And if you look at um, Fraser and Columbia River, it may just have been too cold. We don't know. I mean, really, we see this data, and we're like trying to make it make sense. So all these things are just speculation. And uh, if you guys know, I learned this, the San Francisco estuary, due to the last glaciation, just didn't exist 20,000 years ago. It only, sea levels dropped, and they were only even able to invade the estuary about 15 to 20,000 years ago, so there was no long fin smelt population then. So this kind of makes, it's kind of making some sense. And then in addition, I also learned, I'm writing this paper right now, so I'm learning all these really neat things about <laughs> the Pleistocene glaciation. There were some mega floods, actually Jim pointed this out to me. He's like, look at this Wikipedia page. <laughs> and uh, there were some major floods upstream in the Columbia River estuary, this massive lake, and these, this ice dam would get breached from time to time and just blow out the entire estuary. So if there was any population there, it probably would have been wiped out about 13 to 15,000 years ago. It's pretty neat. And Humboldt Bay is a couple of little small tributaries empty into it. It may never have been very large. It doesn't have a ton of spawning habitat. So that fits in as well. So, uh, so that's, that's the far past. So we wanted to s test some models to see, is there ongoing migration today? And uh, the results suggest yes. So let me walk you through this a little bit. The, each panel shows relative levels of gene flow coming from the lower populations into the upper population from all simulations. So essentially, we took our data, we simulated populations with similar data, and we tested the ways that this data could be achieved. And I did not do these disclosure. My co-author did. So I can refer any questions you have to him. Uh, so as you can see on the left panel, it appears there's a lot of migrants going from the San Francisco Bay into the Columbia River, not many from Humboldt. Middle panel, again, the bay goes north to Humboldt. And then the right, you really don't see any migrants going from the, uh, the San Francisco Bay into the Columbia and Humboldt. So it's basically, we're looking at one-way gene flow here. So I made a little cartoon that shows cartoon fish and a big blue cartoon error. Actually, I think Jim made it, and then I copied it. <laughs> and uh, so what is going on here? How the, made, the California current, as most of you know, flows south. So what the hell? Why are these fish going north? Uh, so again, we're, we're showing that a fraction of longfin smell do seem to new, move north. I can't tell you the timing or anything like that. And that's really frustrating, especially for a lot of the people in this room. There could be El Nino events that disrupt the currents. Uh, Ocean conditions change over time. The Davidson current flows north. That could be transporting fish. Um, again, ocean conditions are variable. You know, these things get disrupted from time to time. Or, or maybe there's just a larger effective pot. There's just a greater source of migrants out of the estuary. And so if any of them are going to go into the ocean, 
the one that can produce the most migrants will probably will produce the most migrants. But uh, it, we are showing that the estuary does seem to be a source population for genetic diversity and individuals for Columbia and Humboldt. But I would like to say that this does not mean that's why they are declining in the bay. They're not just, you know, emigrating out of the bay. <laughs> I, could, I, would not, I could not say that. Uh, so, um, so then we did a scan for adaptive loci because that's what people do now with this kind of data and you can do it and it's pretty easy to do. And uh, essentially you use a software program and it looks for FST outliers. We don't have a very large data set. I know 35,000 SNPs sounds like a lot of data. It's not. Um, people, are, people are doing selection scans with whole genome resequencing with an um, annotated genome, et cetera. But we were like, hey, why not? So we did find high signals of selection in the Fraser River populations, Pitt Lake and Harrison Lake. And we found, interestingly, despite the fact that we only had 35,000 loci, we did find five SNPs approaching fixation in the San Francisco Bay, which does indicate that there is some strong selection occurring in the bay. Um, there's probably some beneficial mutation and it's, it's moving to fixation because it is so beneficial, especially if you have such a large population over time. And I know we don't have it in the last maybe 20 years, but 20 years is, is, uh, is not very long when you're thinking about genetics but we need to do more research. So my summary, the San Francisco estuary is a very diverse longfin smelt population and it's also at the southern edge. The San Francisco estuary population, Columbia River and Humboldt all arose from an ancestral population around the time of the last glacial maximum. And there does appear to be gene flow between the San Francisco estuary, Columbia and Humboldt Bay and it's primarily one way ongoing migration and there are signals of selection within the estuary. And with that, I would like to wrap up the longest view of longfin smelt that you're gonna get. <laughs> and, uh, and thank everybody who contributed. So, that's it. Okay. Questions? Levi. Hmm. Obviously, great. Um, <laughs> Oh, shut up. Is it possible to estimate how much, uh, how many migrants are moving on a decadal scale or on an annual scale? I don't think so. Not at all? No. Uh, it's really frustrating. You're yeah. like, what? This is so cool. And then you're like, oh, but that's all I can know. Yeah. Tag? Okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> I've seen other, other studies similar where they attempted. Is it just there was more data or? They may have had a calibration point when you know when different lineages diverged. Um, they may have had more data, they may have had different markers, I don't know. I mean, I could ask you so and, and, and see. Yeah. You would also probably need more recent samples and, yeah, I mean, populations, especially large populations, just don't change that quickly, so. And my understanding is it would be very, very small to still see that connection. But Sorry? The amount of migration could be very, very small. Yeah. You still see it in the genetic. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Time. Yeah, yeah. I think it could be. I just don't know. Yeah. We. I mean, we don't even know the census size of all these other populations, okay. which really kind of, kind of doesn't help. Yeah. Question. Okay. So I mean, you have 149 samples from the uh, from the SF Bay. So tailoring up that question, like, is genetics able to kind of tell us how many of those 149 likely were going, had a connection to like the Humboldt Bay populations? No. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, especially because the ones were, that were caught in the bay wouldn't have come from the north. They would be going north. You know what I mean? Like you, yeah. You need to catch them again in the, you know, up north to know that they came from the estuary. Yeah. Hey, man. Fred. Um, <laughs> In the salmon world, there's a lot of research being done now with parentage analyses and things like that to try to figure out who's related and who's, who's mom and dad and that kind of stuff. Do you think we can get there with long fin smelt and maybe answer some of these questions about whether or not the fish are spawning multiple times and generate the kind of information that's gonna be useful to people who 
eventually are going to generate population dynamics models and things like life cycle models and things. I mean, the nice thing about salmon is that people are grabbing them all the time. There's just so many dedicated surveys and studies and things like that. And they conveniently swim to a hatchery or swim to a spawning location. Long fin small, it's, it's much harder because we don't know where they're spawning or anything like that. I mean, theoretically, and I don't think it's practical, you could just survey thousands of smelt and then you could run relatedness tests. But you also need the parents. I mean, you could you can simulate hypothetical parents and get family groups. So that's something that's actually possible. Uh, I don't see it as being. <laughs> anyway, I maybe. <laughs> I'm not really like. I think it would be very hard to do. One yeah. more question. Yeah, carrying off Fred's question and linking to um, Jim's talk, is it maybe you were just going down this path? Maybe there's some other markers that you can use. But it'd be nice to know whether there's any. Um, uh, natal site fidelity in these fish, right? Like any, I mean, obviously it's panmictic, so it's not, right. it's not that right. likely, but is there any, um, any natal site fidelity weak though it might be? So let's think about what you would need. I guess you would need to know that your parents came from a particular location and then you would need to be able to sample the larvae and have some sort of structure but the larvae could move. The adults may, may not go back there. They could be, I, I don't know. I have to think about it. If there were, I, if there was natal site fidelity, I feel like we would see more structure than we are. Uh, it seems like there's so much gene flow that they probably are a little bit more opportunistic. That's my. Right, but your samples came from in the bay, right? Like out right. They're panamictic. Within the bay, yeah. Within the bay, yeah. right? So, oh, I, I suppose they could, and then we're catching them when they're all like together again. That's possible. Yeah. yeah. But then if they were spawning in different locations, I still think they'd be spawning, there would be different subpopulations spawning with each other, and I still think you might see more structure. But I guess if you did whole genome resequencing or something like that, you could potentially see that. Um, I don't know. You could have that done by like next week. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday. Yeah, we're sequencing the Delta smelt genome. You know, we're looking for things like this, so things are moving forward. All right, thanks, Mandy. Sure. So real quick, it says I'm going to set up the afternoon schedule. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to say there, but I would be remiss in, in noting there's a couple personalities that aren't in the room that were pretty pivotal in driving the conceptual models that were presented today. And that includes Randy Baxter and Dave Fullerton. And a lot of this work actually happened through the settlement group. And it speaks to the volume of collaborative science and scientists being able to speak in a safe place. But I want to you know, tip my hat off to those two individuals that um, motivated and helped fund a lot of this work that we're seeing today. So thanks to those guys. Um, and then real fast, lunch is in the back. Return here in one hour. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> So our next, oh, a couple announcements. There's plenty of food. Eat it. Eat it. Um, <laughs> or else volunteer to take it down K Street. I'm sure you'll find plenty of people that will take it. But please, eat, eat more food. Um, any other announcements? If you didn't register and you're here, please provide your email to Linda in the back so we can get you on the distribution list for whatever outcomes come of this symposium. Speakers, re repeat your questions into the mic. Anything else, Darcy? OK. So our next speaker, um, he doesn't need an introduction. Well, I don't even know how he got on the agenda, so maybe that's why. <laughs> but we got Fred at the last minute, so this is great. Um, so Fred's going to be talking about drivers of long pin smelt distribution. <laughs> Uh, no laser pointer. All right. 
Um, I am a very late addition to the agenda, so I think they just had an open spot. Maybe somebody canceled, and they asked me on Friday to join, so um, this will be a fun ride. Um, so thank you, Lenny, and thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us after uh, the lunch break here. Um, in case you're wondering, this is my new Twitter handle. Blame that guy. My kids told me that I needed to be cool, and they told me that one of the things that I could do to be cool was to tweet. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Put your phones away. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on any social media. I don't even know how to tweet. But I've heard it's not very hard, so I'm sure I could probably figure it out. <laughs> it's mine. Um, in case you haven't heard, long fin smell, not doing so good. Um, so we're all here today because we share this common interest in the ecology and the conservation of this uh, really fascinating and, and truly remarkable little fish, the long fin smelt. And what we have for you this afternoon is a set of talks that are going to really try to present to you the state of knowledge that we have with regards to uh, what really makes this fish tick, excuse me, in terms of its population dynamics and specifically the underlying kind of processes and mechanisms that are associated with the outflow abundance relationship that we're all very truly familiar with. Um, and so this is that relationship. Uh, you've all seen this before, maybe not in this particular form, uh, but this is it. Um, this is, uh, as you guys all know, this is probably the strongest, this is the strongest outflow relationship we have with pretty much any ecological, biological kind of response variable in the system. It's very strong. It's, um, in fact, we have so much faith in it as scientists and resource managers that in a large part, this and other streams of evidence have been used to establish policy and outflow requirements and that kind of thing. Um, and so what I'm going to do with my talk here is I'm going to try to set up the rest of the talks for this afternoon that kind of are, are going to try to get into the nuts and bolts of this relationship. And there's going to be two kind of underlying themes to what I'm going to try to share with you. One is that it's really important to understand the mechanisms behind this relationship. We need more than just the relationship itself. And I'm going to go over that in just a minute with an example. And the other kind of theme to my talk is that in order to conserve this fish, it's going to be critically important that we scale our conservation actions to those of the ecosystem responses. And um, that's going to be, I think, an important key as we move through these talks. And so this is that relationship. <clears throat> so what we have here, um, the black points are the actual data. Those are the abundance data for long fence melt from the fall midwater trawl. The red line is uh, just the predictions from the outflow abundance relationship. And the, the gray ribbon there is the 95% the confidence intervals. Obviously, it's a very good fit, and it's such a good fit that we use it in the management of our system. And so one would then think about, okay, well, how can we then utilize outflow as a tool to help conserve and manage long fence melt populations? So consider a scenario, if you will, in which we maximized the total amount of outflow that we could through the system. And take a scenario in which we removed all of the exports. And instead of exporting that water out of the system, pushed that water out through the estuary's outflow. What do you think the response would be to that? I think on the surface, we would all think, OK, well, we're probably going to make a whole lot more delta or long fence melt, right? Um, maybe not. So this is what you actually end up with. So this is, if you take that relationship and you make predictions on a new data set, that new data set being the maximum amount of outflow we could possibly come up with, you don't end up with very many more long fin smelt. So you got to take this for what it's worth. OK, don't overinterpret this. This is not a life cycle model. These are simply predictions based upon that regression model. If 
you took all the water away from humans and you sent it down the estuary's outflow. This is the response you would get. So in any given year, again, any given year, don't consider this a life cycle model kind of analysis, you're not going to get a whole lot more delta or long fence melt. So we need to keep that in mind because that's going to be a big player in terms of how we need to scale our conservation actions so that they match the ecosystem level response. And again, understanding mechanisms is critical. And so when I talk about mechanisms, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm talking about the old adage of knowing what's happening under the hood, right? So uh, that old under the hood um, example is actually really appropriate here because, um, you know, the more you press on the gas pedal, the faster you're going to go, right? The more outflow you add to the estuary, presumably the more long fence smelt you're going to get at a particular scale. Um, but, you know, if you understand what's actually going on under the hood in terms of, okay, we press the gas pedal, what is it in terms of the wires and the gears and the mechanisms that's actually really making the car go faster? Because if we understand that, we could do a couple things. One is that if we can't um, adjust that pedal very much more, we can come up with other ways other than a pedal to actually make the car go faster. And moreover, we're actually in a situation now where our pedal's maxed out and the car is actually going slower over time, right? So we're all very familiar with how the, um, the intercept of that length of the um, outflow abundance relationship has gone down over time. So we're getting fewer and fewer smelt uh, with the amount of outflow that we're putting through. So that's just to uh, prelude you to the rest of the talk and the rest of the sessions here. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through some examples of how scale is important um, to both understanding uh, long fence smelt ecology and its conservation. I'm going to be focusing in on sub-adult and adult life stages, and this is some work uh, that we've done recently in the last few years. And I'm going to start off by kind of following up on Mandy's talk, which I thought was actually a pretty good setup for this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the ocean. The ocean is a big black box for us with regards to long fin smelt. We all know that long fin smelt use the ocean, but beyond that, we don't really know a whole lot. Um, I would add to that that um, the ocean is probably a pretty important habitat for long fence melt. There are, there have been surveys um, up in, um, off of the Columbia River where uh, NOAA Fisheries has done um, uh, studies to examine the effects of the plume of the Columbia River outflow on salmon. And if you look at those studies and you look at their catches, there have been instances, many instances, where they actually collect more long fin smelt than salmon. So it is an important habitat and it's something that's used. And when you look at it from uh, different scales and different perspectives, you could understand why it's probably pretty important. So that little red dot there represents our estuary, which is at the southernmost range of long fin smelt distribution. And so it would reason to believe that that big ocean out there that represents in terms of volume and space of habitat by far the biggest box for long fin smelt uh, could likely have um, an important role in, in this particular fish. And the ocean, not unlike the estuary, cycles through different um, conditions. Um, in particular, uh, you know, the ocean goes through warm phases and cold phases. Considering the fact that we are at the southernmost distribution uh, range of this particular fish, it would reason to believe that temperature and how temperature variability in the ocean environment fluctuates uh, spatially and temporally very well may have an important um, influence on how many long fence smelt are present off of our coast and also in the estuary. Um, taking it to a little slightly smaller scale. So we were talking earlier um, in Mandy's talk about how, um, how, how would the fish move north or how would they move south and how do they um, transport across the ocean? Um, well, there's a lot of things that happen locally that can have uh, controlling, um, uh, that can control uh, which way they go basically in terms of for fish that are coming out of the estuary, the interactions between um, 
coastal upwelling and outflow out of the estuary can drive you know whether there's going to be transport headed north or headed south so you combine that on top of oceanic currents and all those kinds of amazing processes then yeah there's a lot there that's going on that we don't know about that I would argue we need to better understand and so um, this was really intriguing to me so I don't know if this is real but this is um, provocative to me in the sense that, so if you take a look at um, how many longfin smelt are in the bay study samples in the bay across these different oceanic warm cold cycles, you find that there's actually more longfin smelt in the estuary when the ocean is warm. At least that's what the data say. Is that real? I don't know. Um, but it's pretty provocative and it suggests to me that we really do need to understand the mechanisms behind this because there could be alternative explanations, right? Um, there could be um, things that have happened prior to this that have controlled how many fish are in the estuary. And then with these um, oceanic indexes as well, especially with the MPGO, although there's this temperature cycling association that goes on with it, it's the MPGO itself is actually more closely associated with uh, nutrient and uh, phytoplankton dynamics in the ocean as well. So there's, there's a whole lot of uh, interesting things going on there that um, we can learn about. And, what I would say to this is that, so some of you might be thinking, okay, well, the ocean is this huge, amazing, ginormous place. You know, how do we even begin to, to study what is happening with longfin smelt in the ocean? And that's a good point, uh, but we don't need to just throw our hands up and say we can't do it. Um, there are ways of doing this, and I just want to throw this up as an example model of where um, this was done with green sturgeon, a species for which we arguably might have uh, less data um, in terms of oceanic data um, catches and observations than long fence smelt. So it's possible, we can do it, we can model these things, and we should probably understand it because, um, again, the ocean is a big part of this fish's habitat. Okay, so now I'm going to go to an even smaller scale now and talk about a little bit in terms of what's driving uh, the presence of long fence smelt at any particular site. Um, that you might go out and try to examine in the estuary. So this is some information that was um, actually first brought to my attention by Sean Acuna. Uh, I'm not sure if he's the first person to actually uh, uncover this or not, but uh, these data here, uh, what you have on the, um, the, the vertical axis there is basically the ratio of fish in the midwater trawl versus the otter trawl through time in the base study. And it looks like there's a, a decreasing trend in terms of how many fish are in the water column versus on the bottom. And um, the Pettit test thinks that there actually is a shift in, in that relationship there over time. And the weight of evidence suggests that that shifts right around 2002, 2003. Um, and so we were really interested in understanding what this is all about and why and um, <clears throat> getting um, a little bit more fundamental understanding as to how fish are positioned vertically in the water column, because this could have very important implications for management and understanding uh, as simple as the status of this fish, right? If fish are being avoided and missed in the midwater trawl for any number of reasons, and it could, um, it could, change our interpretations of some of those long-term monitoring uh, data sets. So this is kind of the idea there. So there, there could be several different alternative explanations for that pattern there. But uh, you know, the one we were trying to uh, address is, is that there where you know, potent basically what this relationship is suggesting is that there are fewer fish um, in the water column and more fish on the bottom. And so Again, kind of understanding whether or not that really is the case and um, um, what's driving that is really critically important. And so we set out to do a few studies to try to look more closely at what's really driving where these fish are in the water column. And we've done two studies, and I'm going to talk briefly about both of them. The first one is some work that we did um, almost exactly a year ago today out um, uh, out here at the uh, the western end of Sassoon Bay. And the other study I'm going to talk about we did out in San Pablo Bay. 
And so what we did here is we went out and we basically set up a very intensive field study to try to understand where these fish were distributed both laterally and, and vertically in the water column. And this was a perfect site to do it because as a lot of you probably know, there's a lot of interesting things um, in terms of habitat that happened at this particular spot. And this is just um, a map of our sampling effort here. So we went out over the course of a couple weeks and really intensively sampled for these fish to try to understand where, um, where they live. And we did, in addition to some net sampling, we also did some acoustic sampling, which no one has ever done before in the estuary, um, to, to complement that as well. So the, the habitat is very uh, dynamic and very, um, it's very unique there. So um, there's um, a very deep channel that exists on the southward side of, of that area. And then there's this shoal. A lot of you guys have probably seen it. A lot of you may have accidentally driven your boat up onto it and gotten stuck. Um, it happens a lot out there. And then there is another channel just to the north of that. And then it, there's this kind of shallow shoal there. And so it sets up this really unique dynamic kind of velocity structure within the water column there. And uh, you know that velocity structure varies um, not only in space but also in time, and time meaning in tide. So whether the tide is flooding or the tide is ebbing, that structure is a little bit different. And so um, we can address, potentially address a lot of different types of habitat structure and how that's driving uh, the distributions that we're seeing. So real quickly, uh, this is a very preliminary look at the data so far. The way I've modeled these, I've tried to, uh, one of our original goals is really trying to understand the extent to which water quality variables like turbidity are driving where we're seeing these fish. And so um, um, what, what I've tried to do so far is try to isolate as many of the other variables as I can to try to tease that apart. Um, so um, went through a modeling exercise. The main point I want to uh, emphasize here is that we, you know, we've got a, a variety of both fixed variables and then a random variable. And I use that random variable in this uh, uh, mixed modeling approach to basically condition the catches on uh, tidal effects that we can't really effectively sample through or account for. Um, so it basically wipes out um, the effects of which direction the tide's going and how fast the tide's going. And once we do that, we can learn about what some of these other effects are in terms of what's driving the fish. And so again, this is a very preliminary first look at these data. Um, this will absolutely be redone again, and I'm sure the results will be a little bit different. But this is kind of what we initially saw in terms of what was driving where we saw the fish. Um, starting from top to bottom. So these are the posterior distributions from that, that Bayesian GLM. GLLM, and um, so Basically, the way you interpret these is uh, typically is anything where the, the distributions are not overlapping zero is a meaningful effect there. And so starting from top to bottom, chlorophyll came out as something that was um, important in terms of at least being associated with when and where we caught the fish. Temperature, not so much. Turbidity. Um, the majority of uh, the distribution fell um, outside um, of uh, uh, zero in terms of being uh, having a positive effect, um, which is intriguing. Um, but again, it overlapped zero, so you could argue that it was not a meaningful effect there. Um, working your way down, the thing that really drove where we saw these fish was the physical location in terms of uh, what part of the channel they were in. And as I showed you earlier, there's a lot of interesting things there with respect to the, the tidal velocity dynamics and the substrate. And um, there's probably um, some things going on there with respect to how the fish are, are choosing relatively low velocity kind of habitats and where they want to hang out and where they want to feed, as, as some of the, the speakers discussed earlier. Uh, we also uh, have done some acoustic sampling out there, as I mentioned. Uh, this is the work that uh, Ben Sains uh, did for us, did with us. Um, real quickly on this, um, it's been really, inf really enlightening actually to see kind of what the, the distribution of fish is outside of what we can actually observe with a net. So what I have highlighted here um, in the blue box there, that's where we actually have uh, matching data, corresponding data with acoustics and net samples. 
Uh, above the red line is our net catches, and below the red line is our acoustic data. And there's a, there's a pretty strong um, correspondence there in terms of um, the acoustics and the net uh, data matching up pretty well in terms of overall abundance. Uh, the jury's still out yet. We haven't analyzed the data um, enough yet to know whether or not there's any meaningful vertical distribution of the fish in the water column here. Uh, so stay tuned. We will be working that up and reporting back on that later. And then the last thing I want to share with you is just a, one quick slide on the study we did out in San Pablo Bay. So this study is um, also relatively unique in that we actually did some overnight sampling. We have some day and night sampling that we conducted to try to determine whether or not there's an important day-night effect in terms of where these fish are distributed. And we have both net catches and we also have hydroacoustic data as well that we're going to be layering on top of this. And this is just a quick initial look at um, the net catches. And you've probably figured this out already, but there's an interesting pattern here where, so we've done sampling at the bottom uh, using an otter trawl and at the surface using a midwater trawl. And when you look at those two data sets, what stands out is that on the bottom with the otter trawl, we catch fish pretty much every time we're out there. But at the surface with the midwater trawl, the only time we actually caught longfin smelt in the midwater trawl was at night. We didn't catch a single one during the day. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at these data much more closely, um, analyzing them up, working them up, and uh, uh, you know, we'll be reporting back with what we learned about these data relatively soon. Again, we're really early in those stages of, of processing those data and, and trying to make sense of them. Uh, so that's where we're at. Um, conclusions real quick. Again, uh, the theme really is that um, there's a variety of habitat features um, that are really important to driving the distribution of this fish. And again, I think most importantly, for conserving this species, it's going to be really critical that we match our conservation actions with the scale of the expected ecosystem level response. That's the only way it's going to work. Thanks. Time for one question. Gonzalo, repeat the question. Yeah. The response of many of the fish in the Bay Area that uh, the Bay, Bay Delta study has shown that cooler, cooler conditions uh, lead to higher recruitment in, in the bay of the Mersal and pelagic fishes. Uh, look like you show that warmer conditions are, are more beneficial for longfin uh, at, at, at the larger scales. Uh, you show that for both the otter troll and the bottom, the otter troll and the, the midwater troll. So, it's, so that seems to contradict the idea that ocean conditions will be favorable, but not entirely. If, if, um, I don't know if I got that graph interpretation correct, but what, what is your, your interpretation of, of the, the ocean condition on recruitment for this species? Yes, um, so just to repeat the question, the question was basically questioning my, um, whether or not that relationship, the, the graphs I showed about there being more longfin smelt in the bay when the ocean is warm, is basically questioning that observation. Is it real? Does it make sense? Is it consistent with some of the other uh, work that's been done? And uh, my response to that question would be, I don't know yet. I don't think we, any of us know. You know so there's been uh, a lot of work done looking at um, large-scale climate factors and their role in driving ecosystem responses in the estuary, right? So Jim Clarence done a lot of that work. A lot of other folks um, have done that work. I've been involved in some of that with Jim as well. And, um, you know, there's going to be species-specific responses that are, are unique. And so, for example, the one species that has a really strong um, external to the estuary climate link is English sole, which is a very different species, a different ecology than longfin smelt. And these processes might act in ways that are counterintuitive, right? 
And so, um, you know, you might expect warmer conditions to have fewer delta or long fin smelt in the estuary because if something such as temperature is kind of driving their distribution along the coast, um, like, you know, like we see with salmon and that kind of thing, you'd expect maybe fewer fish. But maybe there are fewer fish overall along the coast, but maybe they're all staying inside the bay because the ocean is not as hospitable to them as the bay. I don't know. I don't have the answer to these questions. I'm posing these as questions and things that we need to try to better understand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. So we're a few minutes behind, but we'll, we'll catch up at some point in the agenda. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Levi Lewis from the new biogeochemistry lab at UC Davis. Let's get his presentation loaded up. And Levi is going to be talking to us about some of his otolith work on longfin. Uh, I'll let you open that. Thanks, Lenny. All right. Um, thanks again. And Fred, that was a fantastic introduction to thinking about scale. Um, I'm going to go the opposite direction. Instead of thinking about large scale, I'm going to think about the individual. And the way we're going to do that is using individual otoliths. So before I start, I want to acknowledge co-authors, uh, Malta Vilmez, Christian Denny, and um, Jim Hobbs, who all have contributed much to the, um, the ideas behind this and a lot of the analyses, as well as uh, the many members of our lab at UC Davis who provided um, much of the data. And then also our many partners um, over the years who have contributed to our survey data as well as um, funding to do this otolith work. So we know we have a problem in the delta and in the estuary with osmerids. Um, they're not doing well, as Fred clearly pointed out. And this is the question we're all really asking, right? Is this inevitable? Um, and so that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, really quickly, for 60 seconds, uh, I like to think about what my species would tell me when I'm doing my work. And so I'm going to provide just a really short poem from the perspective of a long fin smelt. I hope you enjoy it. Born on New Year's Eve into fresh turbidities, spawning localities remain clandestine mysteries. I thrive in salty seas of limited thermal degrees. Mycids and crusties are my diet proclivities. Man-made climate change likely cause mortalities. Beg please, he send assist, but your efforts are all that freeze. Pop at 1% as though have bubonic disease, but the illness of my species is human societies. You've dammed up all the rivers, thus damn the estuary. Invases everywhere with no niche to which to flee. More water exported, making man much more wealthy, while I reside in your pesticides, your feces, and your pee. And yet with a little flow, we bloom like a desert in spring. Hope and heritage, the high offerings that we bring. And the songbird now can sing. Transducers pause to ping. Yet you keep exporting, and the status quo remains king. And we're still at 1%. You have hardly put a dent in the extirpation that the state and nation have made imminent. It's not a moment for applause. It's a chance to search for cause, an effect because we've wrecked this natural land that once was Oz. And so I donate both my ears in hopes that they'll help you see what I need for you to do to save my species and family via otolith chemistry. <laughs> so long for in, are in this place. I don't need to introduce it. You know where we are. Um, the delta gets fresh water from a couple major rivers, creates this estuarine gradient, and this is the habitat in which longfin are existing for most of their lives. This is the classic life cycle of longfin smelt as, a, an, as an anandromous or semi-anandromous species. Two-year life cycle, um, spawning up in fresh waters of the delta, larvae, juveniles moving down throughout the estuary, and then after two years returning back to repeat that life cycle and crossing through this brackish freshwater gradient. And of course, one of the major concerns is the many effects that the species, as, uh, as the longfin smelt recently noted, um, that are occurring throughout the delta that are impacting them, especially um, within that, de that delta habitat, including um, pumping. Um, Fred already pointed this out, that there's a strong outflow relationship. It's a very strong relationship, and it's persisted through time, even as their numbers declined. And we're still trying to figure out those mechanisms. One of the possible mechanisms is that there's simply more habitat when it's wetter. So on the left, we have um, an example of a salinity gradient in a dry year. On the right, a salinity gradient in a wet year. And we can see that there's much more low salinity habitat throughout the estuary, even in the southern portion of the estuary in wet years. And these are mechanisms that I'm not coming up with. These are other people have, have discussed this, but we're still exploring these mechanisms in further detail. And I hope to provide a little bit of information 
that might uh, uh, shed some light on whether this is a likely phenomenon. So our real question is, you know, uh, we think they're spawning mostly in this kind of delta watershed, but are they also spawning and using these other smaller watersheds in the estuary? And Jim pointed out or provided some data showing that with recent surveys, we're definitely seeing adults spawning in these bay tributaries up in the upper left and the lower right of that figure. And the numbers in Alviza Marsh in particular were fairly high. So it seems like these could be potential, um, potentially important spawning habitats and maybe historically even more important than they are now. Um, and we've seen spawning fish in there, so eggs and milt, and not only adults, um, uh, individuals, we also see aggregations, and not only adults, but we're also seeing juveniles. And they're fairly abundant in these habitats in wet years on occasion. Um, we recently published these observations in ecology just as a simple natural history observation, um, hopefully, again, shedding some light on this. So the rest of my talk kind of is predicated on all that information, and just pointing out that understanding the life history strategies the species is using is critical if we're going to um, effectively manage and conserve it. And um, calling them anadromous or semi-anadromous has management implications with respect to um, when and how long they might be impacted by a variety of different human impacts, especially that occur in this kind of danger zone in the delta. And so, for example, you know, population estimates might be limited to specific habitats or species might be considered at risk only during sp specific seasons. Um, or maybe even freshwater delta habitats aren't protected around if a species actually exists there. Um, and if we're wrong, then our understanding of population dynamics and status and our efforts for conservation and mitigation and our estimates of mortality and the sources of mortality all could be somewhat off. So we're reassessing life history um, and we're asking do existing life cycle models accurately describe the movements in life history of these fish? Are our current and uh, with respect to um, whether or not current management and conservation actions are effective or optimal um, and whether or not we're mitigating all the important habitats for these species. Most of our previous understanding of this fish is based on catch data and surveys, and so lots of studies have tried describing what these fish are doing, and they're excellent studies that give us a lot of insights into what longfin smelt do. Um, and there are some other ways to do this kind of on a more individualistic basis. And so if longfin smelt and delta smelt were, you know, this size, we could just throw an acoustic tag in and look at their movement patterns like sturgeon or salmon. And that'd be great, but they're not. They're this size. So we need to think of other ways to track individual fish to see how they're using habitats. And one way is to use natural tags. And um, natural tags are chemicals that get incorporated into otoliths. Otoliths are hard, bony structures. Um, we call them ear bones that are common in fish. And you can see them in the left picture there, those little dots. And then a zoomed in picture on the right. And so we can look at the different chemicals that go into the otoliths and use those chemicals as tracers of the past environmental history of each individual fish. So we're focusing lights and lasers on these otoliths to elucidate longfin smelt life histories. And so I'm going to go over three projects that we're doing right now, and all of them are in different states of completion. None of them are quite done yet. Um, one is uh, looking at age and growth using otoliths. Two is using strontium isotopes to retrace larval, juvenile, um, larval and juvenile salinity history. Also using oxygen isotopes to retrace adult salinity history. And last, attempting to identify natal rearing habitats using trace elemental fingerprinting. So age and growth. Um, we've been working with Tien and his team at the uh, Fish Conservation Lab uh, down in Tracy to get known age larval longfin smelt to process their otoliths and examine whether or not rings that are being laid down are daily. And we can see a picture on the upper right. You might not be able to see, but there are daily rings there. And uh, the agreement between um, ring counts and known age are um, really good, uh, plus or minus 5%. So the rings really seem to be laid down daily. And the two figures just show that growth uh, is purport so otolith size is proportional to fish size on the left, um, which simply means that bigger otoliths re reflect bigger fish, um, and we can use otoliths to estimate uh, growth rates. And on the right, it simply is a, a, a calibration between age and otolith radius that we use later on um, in another figure, which I'll introduce um, shortly. So we've looked at growth rates of larval fish at FCCL. So this is a plot of age on the x-axis, standard length on the y-axis, the gray dots are FCCL known age fish. So we knew when they hatched, and when we collected them, we knew their known age. And so those are actual growth rates in captivity. The orange dots are wild larvae that we collected, and we estimated their ages from otolith ring counts. And it appears that the growth rates in the wild and at these F with these FCCL fish were fairly similar. And they range from around 0.17 to 0.18 millimeters per day. OK, so we're continuing on that with that. We have a prop one to examine growth rates of uh, juvenile longfin smelt going all the way back to 1999. 
And we also have uh, longfin smelt larvae collected from the entire estuary, from South Bay to North Bay. And we'll be looking at regional differences in growth. But I don't have that data for you today. So next, strontium isotopes, looking at larval and juvenile salinity history. So strontium is a metal that is very similar to calcium and readily gets incorporated into otoliths. Um, there are four different stable isotopes of strontium, two of which are really useful in fisheries science. Um, strontium-87 and 86, again, they're both stable. Um, 87 is radiogenic, not radioactive, so it comes from um, the decay of another element, which means that it varies in nature, whereas strontium-86 is fairly stable in nature. Um, they get incorporated directly into otoliths without fractionation, so that means whatever was in the water is what's in the otolith, and that's really nice. And so they provide a really nice tracer of the past environmental history of a fish. Um, this has been used in many different contexts. And one is, so this is just the blue areas of uh, the watershed of the Sierra Nevadas. And all of the different rivers, or many of the different rivers, have very different strontium isotope ratios because the underlying geology is very different. The age of the rock is different, and therefore the, chem the, the chemistry is different. And we've used that in the past to identify the origins of juvenile salmon and, and adult salmon as they return to different rivers, um, oftentimes straying or even coming from hatcheries. But that's not how we use um, strontium isotopes in estuaries. Um, what's nice is that the end members of all these different creeks uh, flowing into the delta, such as through the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River, um, those are fairly stable. The ocean is also very stable and fairly homogeneous. And so we can use the ocean and the freshwater end members in a mixing model and within this estuarine area to recreate the salinity history of an individual fish. And this is a salinity uh, strontium isotope mixing model that we've used in a variety of papers now. So we can convert strontium isotopes in otoliths to salinity estimates in otoliths. The way we do this is we use a multi-collector laser ablation ICPMS, uh, which is a machine that uses a, a laser to ablate a line from the core to the edge of the otolith, and that encompasses the entire history of the fish. Um, this otolith also has daily rings. Again, I don't know if you can see them. Oh, you can. Good. So those rings are daily. And what that means is that we can assign a chronology. So we can actually assign um, a strontium isotope value for each of those daily rings. And so we create a history, um, or a strontium isotope chronology, which can also be converted into a salinity chronology for each individual fish to track what its previous um, exposure or experience was um, with respect to salinity. Um, throughout the system. I won't go into too much detail about the nuts and bolts, other than uh, for data reduction from the machine, we use a, an app designed by Malta Vilmus. He was a postdoc in our lab who's now at Santa Cruz, um, Field Station Davis. And um, it's called ISOFISH R, and it's, it's free, and, and he's happy to collaborate if anybody's interested in doing more multi collector work. And then we also use a package called TS Clus, and this is work that Christian Dinney, one of our SRAs, has been working on to do some of the time series clustering that I'm going to show you. But I'll just provide results without going into the details of, of how we did the time series clustering. So if longfin smelt were anadromous, this is the pattern I would expect to see. On the x-axis, we have distance. Distance, again, can be converted into age. Um, it's not done here yet. Um, the y-axis is the strontium isotope ratio. That can be converted into salinity. And you can see the salinity estimates on the right side of the, uh, the right y-axis. If the, and the red dashed line across the middle is at the 0.5 PSU mark, which we're saying is the cutoff between freshwater and brackish water. If this fish was anadromous or semi-anadromous, we'd expect them to be born in low salinity water and at some point disperse to higher salinity water. This is what we see in salmon and a bunch of other anadromous species. And this is what we actually see. So is that anadromy? Lots of people say, eh? <laughs> kind of. Um, so what do we see? So we see higher natal rearing salinities than we expected um, if these were truly anadromous species. It appears that these fish are starting off pretty early in fairly um, salty water, above 1, 2, and even up to 6 PSU. Um, unlike delta smelt, I have some bullet points here I kind of skipped over. And unlike delta smelt, which um, we recently published a paper doing a similar analysis, um, every single one of these adult fish that survived and returned to spawn, I didn't mention that these are all adults. Um, every single one of these um, at some point moved to higher salinity water. So none of them were staying in the delta, which is different than delta smelt, where we found freshwater residents. So again, using that TS CLUS package, we separated these out into four um, life history clusters, and that's somewhat arbitrary whether it's four or five or three, um, but we chose four here. And they were actually pretty evenly distributed in terms of abundance in this um, sample set. And they differed primarily in their natal signatures. So here um, you have the strontium isotope values on the left uh, y-axis and the estimated salinity again on the right. 
And again, the point is that some fish were being born in really fresh water, um, and some were being born in more brackish water all the way up to 6 PSU. And I didn't mention this before, I'll mention it now. The reason we're stopping at 6 PSU is because of the curvilinear nature of that salinity strontium uh, uh, model. And so anything above 6 PSU, strontium isotopes don't give us a resolution for. So it's 6 PSU or higher. And so we can't, we can't speak to that with strontium. But I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. With respect to adult conditions, they all hit 6 PSU um, fairly quickly. And the timing of the transition was fairly similar among these different groups, generally around 150 days. So these are the mean patterns for each of those four clusters. So again, you can see they're mostly just starting at different places, and they're all eventually moving to brackish water fairly quickly. So we can convert the x-axis now to age, just using that standard model I showed you before, which is an otolith radius to age conversion. We can also convert the y-axis now to salinity, and this is the pattern that we see. So what are these longfin smelt doing? They're moving fairly quickly at about 150 days to higher salinity waters um, above 6 PSU. And it doesn't really look like they're slowing down. They're accelerating very quickly across those salinity gradients. So again, rapid dispersal at 150. Um, and the one uh, caveat is that some fish seem to be starting at higher salinities than others. So those might not be really anadromous. So what does this mean in terms of life history? Well, it does seem like there's semi-anadromy. Like some fish are starting in low, low salinity water, and they're migrating or dispersing across and then returning. That is classic anadromy or semi-anadromy. But those ones that are starting off quite a bit saltier, that might be evidence of uh, estuarine migrants. So estuarine migrants spawn in more brackish water um, and uh, don't necessarily return to uh, pure fresh water. And this might be life history diversity that previously wasn't described for longfin smelt. OK, oxygen isotopes for adult salinity history. So as I mentioned, strontium isotopes have an upper limit of resolution at about six parts per thousand. Um, but we can use oxygen isotopes um, to look at uh, higher salinities, um, hist uh, histories of long fin smelt uh, beyond that 6 PSU cutoff. And the reason we can do this is because there's a really nice gradient as you move from fresh water to um, saltier water in the oxygen isotope ratio. And unlike strontium, it's linear. And so that linear relationship allows us to get pretty good reconstructions of uh, higher salinity, uh, re sorry, better reconstructions of higher salinity uh, histories for long fin smelt. And so that's what we've done. So if we take the, our strontium reconstructions and we place it on this plot, this plot now again shows distance on the x-axis, the estimated salinity on the y-axis, but instead of going to 6 PSU, it goes all the way up to 32. Um, we can see that that strontium really doesn't tell us much about the full salinity history of these fish. So what do we expect to see in terms of what these adult fish are doing? Are they staying in the estuary at brackish water, 18 parts per thousand, 10 parts per thousand? Are they going straight out to the ocean, straight out to 32 parts per thousand? This is probably the first time we can actually answer that question on an individual level basis. And again, this is work that, um, uh, that Malta has conducted in collaboration with researchers, uh, collaborators in Australia uh, using their sims. So this is what we found. So what are longfin smelt doing? They're doing lots of different things. Um, the majority of them are going to high salinity, but it doesn't look like they're going to full strength salinity. So they're out, that would suggest that they're out in San Francisco Bay. Um, some of them are staying at low salinity. Some of them are going to high salinity moving back, and others are in fact going out to ocean level, levels and remaining at ocean levels um, until they're captured again. So it appears that longfin smelt show a lot of diversity in terms of what they're doing. And that's not, that, we've seen that in many different species. Um, but now we can start quantifying uh, what those patterns look like and um, have a much better understanding of full estuarine use uh, rather than just that low salinity habitat using strontium. And last, trace elemental fingerprinting. So one of the things that we want to do is to identify the natal rearing habitats of adult fish. So if I catch an adult, I want to know where was it born. How do I do that? Well, one way to do that is to collect a bunch of, of larvae from different parts of the estuary, look at their trace elemental profiles, examine whether or not different re regions have uh, unique elemental profiles, and then use that model to uh, assign adults captured later that are from the same cohort, so they experience the same conditions uh, regionally, uh, to those different regions using that uh, multi-element model. And so the question that we're asking is whether or not we can use these trace element fingerprinting uh, models 
uh, to retrospectively determine previous natal rearing habitats for longfin. And this has been done for many different species. Um, so Jim has done it for delta smelt, um, some sea brim, and halibut, and it's worked quite well. Uh, we collected some water samples. Just as a quick check, do these regions have different water chemistry? And it appears that they do, and that's all this is showing, um, is the uh, differences between uh, water chemistry in these different regions of the estuary, um, low salinity water in this case. So water chemistry appears to vary, but the real question is do these larvae vary in terms of their otolith chemistry? So to construct this model, we collected fish from different regions of the estuary, and we conducted similar analyses using laser ablation chemistry, and we did it instead of just on strontium isotope ratios, we did it on a suite of different elements, including um, members like lithium and magnesium, strontium, barium, rubidium, and, and among others. And then in multivariate space, this is just three dimensions, we can see whether or not those different regions cluster, as you can see here in the different colors. And if they do, then that means this could be a useful tool to reassign adults to these different regions, assuming, again, that they have unique elemental signatures. And so these are, each one of these panels is a profile of uh, nine different elements uh, for an individual fish. And we selected, as you can see on the left, there's an otolith with a blue area, which we call the core, and then a red ring, which we call the natal area. And we use the mean value of that natal area to create a natal signature, a multivariate signature for each fish. And again, um, we sampled fish. Not, we didn't have any from Sassoon in the Delta, because in 2017 it was pretty blown out. Um, but we did have San Paolo Bay, South Bay, and then also the tributaries noted there as well. So, what did we find? This is just a quick um, analysis of MANOVA, that there were significant differences among these different regions. Um, and these were some of the elements that really drove that pattern. This is uh, just a correlation plot on the left, examining whether there was strong collinearity between some of these different um, predictors. And there were some, um, but overall, almost all of these different metals ended up being important for the classification scheme. And then on the right, it's just showing some of the different uh, profiles or the values, those natal values of the different elements for each of the different regions. And I know it's hard to read on this screen, um, but just for example, we have strontium isotopes in the upper left, and next to that we have barium, uh, and then left to right, copper and lithium, et cetera. And then the different regions um, from left to right for each plot is just Alviso, Lower South Bay, Napa, Petaluma, Sonoma, and San Pablo Bay. It's complicated to look at it this way and really understand what's going on. Um, and so what we did is we ran a package called Carrot, which runs lots of different models um, that I won't have time to go into again here. But it ran models such as linear discriminant analysis, quadratic, um, random forest, um, to uh, develop, oops, sorry, a little bit of text there, uh, to develop a model that would maximize the differences between these different regions that could then be used to assess or assign um, adults that were returning two years later into these different regions. And um, my formatting got screwed up a little bit, but that circle should not be on MDA, it's on RF. And what I want to point out mostly is that for the subregions, we didn't get good discrimination, that's why they're X'd out. Um, it was really hard to tell apart Napa from Sonoma from Petaluma, likely because there was so much outflow and tidal mixing, and that's not a, that wasn't a surprise. But um, what was a surprise, if you look at the very last row there, the random forest provided 86% accuracy um, with cross-validation. And that was actually pretty high and much higher than we expected. So that suggested that using a random forest uh, model, we could actually use this to reassign adults. And the main contributors to this was, uh, in terms of elements, was magnesium, rubidium, the strontium isotope value, um, strontium, copper, and, and, and then fewer and fewer, uh, or lower and lower weights as you go down the list there. So again, good classification success for larvae using this random forest. Um, and next, we wanted to apply this to adults. So those are fish from 2017. We waited two years patiently. And then after two years, that 2017 cohort returned to spawn. And we collected around 200 adult two-year-old spawning fish that were born in 2017. And we tried to assign them to these different regions to ask whether or not we could identify fish that were born in South Bay. That's really the main question that we wanted to know. Because we were finding larvae in South Bay in 2017 for the first time. This is just what that chemistry data looks like for an adult. And you can see there's a, maybe you can't see, but that we identified the core oftentimes, which is a peak, and then a natal region. And then we matched the chemistry of that natal region um, to, or we used that natal region 
to match it to the model that we developed using the larvae. So this is just a quick summary of the, of the results to date. Um, we're still working through these data. On the x-axis is the classification probability going from zero to one. Uh, one being perfect, zero being horrible, um, 0.5 being like 50-50. Um, and the number of individual fish that had that level of confidence. So the cl classification, classification probability um, could be interpreted as a confidence in the assignment of that fish to a region, either North Bay or South Bay. And this red line indicates the 0.75. It's an arbitrary cutoff that we said is reasonable confidence. Everything else we said is too uncertain. And then if we summarize those data, we have fish in North Bay on the left, fish in South Bay on the right. Um, north, and uh, that's where they were caught. And then the colors correspond to how they were assigned. And the main point I want to make is twofold. One, most of the fish were unknown because they had low confidence in their assignments. And there's a couple different possible reasons for that. Um, Two, very few fish were assigned to South Bay even when we did have high confidence. It appeared that most fish were coming from North Bay or had reared in North Bay habitats. Again, fairly uncertain with the 0.75 cutoff, but that's where we are so far. So um, these are just some summary points. Uh, time's a little bit short. But basically, um, our age and growth is, going, is ongoing. Um, salinity history uh, based on strontium isotopes and oxygen isotopes suggests that there's a lot more life history diversity than we thought, and these fish might be spawning in or at least really early using um, higher salinity habitats than we predicted. And that's actually an agreement with recent data coming out of Richard and Nan's group as well with their larval um, development for long-term smell. And last, it seems that these trace elemental fingerprinting um, algorithms worked really well for classifying larvae, um, but weren't really great at classifying adults. Given the caveats, it seems that most of the fish that we identified were assigned back to North Bay habitats. And um, this is all published uh, in a technical report that we just sent, and we're happy to share this as well. Um, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. One question from Wim. Yeah, thank you. Great talk as usual. I wonder if you could use. Yeah, I wonder if you could use um, something like mercury or lead to infer. Uh, subsequent life in either the estuary or the ocean, because in the estuary, we know that there's lots of mercury in the sediments, and and these being sort of uh, semi-bottom feeding critters, they might pick up a lot of mercury in the in the estuary and put it in their otoliths. That's a great point. We can't measure mercury using the laser collection technique, but there are other. Uh, forget it then. They might be able to use. No, no, no. They might be able to use. But there are other elements. So sulfur is an important one, and. Um, yeah, and another one that Malta has been working on is even using carbon. But the carbon signatures might be different between the estuary and the ocean as well. Um, so that's a really good point. You can use different markers and still develop different information. Thank you, Levi. So we're going to try to catch up here. Our next speaker is Corey Phyllis from Metropolitan Water District. And he's going to be talking about some of the modeling he's been doing to predict Longman smelt habitat um, from the different work that's been going on. Thanks, Lenny. Uh, and I want to start off by thanking my uh, co-authors, including Lenny uh, and the aforementioned Dave Fullerton, and then Aaron Beaver and Michael McWilliams from Anchor QA, who helped with some hydrodynamic modeling, and then uh, more recently John Brandon, who's um, helped put some uh, data to some of our predictions that I'm going to show today. So. Um, this is just an image to prove that an old salmon ecologist can Google image a long fin smelt. Um, so most of the, um, this work uh, comes from uh, the 20 millimeter survey. It's a, a survey that was designed for delta smelt. Um, it's been going on for over 20 years now. Uh, it's rich in data, but it wasn't necessarily designed for, for long fin, so that um, presents a couple of issues. Um, so. In particular, delta smelt are distributed uh, in the lower salinity region um, around two to seven parts per thousand at this life stage. Long fin smelt, though, um, have been found to distribute from two to 12 parts per thousand, so there isn't a, a complete overlap in the range of salinities. Um, and the estuary is a lot larger than where the 20 millimeter um, survey samples, which is primarily in the delta and Sassoon Bay and, and um, a little bit uh, west of the Carquinas up in the Napa River. Um, and 
this creates this issue um, where in dry years, so like 2014 was a drought, uh, longfin are distributed right in the center of the survey footprint, um, suggesting we're doing a pretty good job of identifying kind of the, the makeup, the distribution, and also the abundance of juvenile longfin smelt. But as was um, kind of alluded to earlier this morning in the first talk, you know, in these wet years, um, the, the longfin become distributed at the far seaward edge of the um, survey footprint and likely are actually distributed downstream of that footprint. We just aren't sampling there. Um, so that's, that's a problem if we want to make any kind of inferences about this population's abundance and distribution. But that's not to say, well, and so, yeah, where would we, might we find longfin under different hydrological conditions? So not all years are dry years. There are wet years, and those are going to be years that are going to be hard to identify um, where longfin are and how many of them there are as juveniles. Um, but, you know, the 20 millimeter survey, it, what comes with it is there's a lot of data. So there's over 20 years of data that, that works out to about 7,000 sampling events that um, I'm working with now. There's more than 7,000 sampling events. Um, these... There's eight to 10 surveys annually between March and July. They visit these fixed stations and they're collecting um, fish catch, but also a bunch of other biotic and abiotic data that we can, we can leverage. Uh, so what can we learn from this rich data set? Um, so two things I'm gonna try to um, capture here. One is um, what are the environmental conditions that are associated with long fin catch? And then two, when and where are these conditions present in the San Francisco estuary at large, not just in the, in the region that the longfin survey or the 20 millimeter survey uh, samples. A um, couple more images of longfin as I prepare to talk about model stuff that is not nearly as pretty. Um, so the, the models that I uh, relied on is, is what's called a boosted regression tree. Um, it's similar to like what um, a GAM will do, but it has some advantages where it does a good job of fitting nonlinear relationships. Um, and unlike GAMs, it, it handles sharp discontinuities because it's not trying to smooth through a couple of different points. Um, it handles interactions between uh, different predictors. Um, and it's robust to redundant features. So these issues of collinearity or, or things that are um, have um, hi highly similar um, predictors the, the model is actually robust to having multiple, multiple of those types of predictors um, in the model. Um, that's not to say that they have excess weight, that they just downweight one of them and the other one gets more weight. Um, so the approach then is to fit this um, boosted regression tree model to training data. The training data is 1,000 randomly selected observations out of those 7,000 rows. And then evaluate how that model does predicting back to the independent test data, the remaining 6,000 observations. And we can see how well that model does by looking at deviance, um, area under the receiver operator curve, residuals, um, and just a way to, to measure how well our predictions are doing. Um, so I want to just get into the results because it's far more interesting than talking about the model. Um, so first off, there's um, about 20 some odd uh, variables that um, are incorporated in, and the model is pretty robust again to having lots of different variables. You don't need to worry about having too many, um, but ultimately it's, and this is often the case, you know, five to eight variables wind up explaining most of the variation. And, and the top six variables here account, account for 68% of the relative influence. And I chose those six just because they're the kind of, they're the ones that you kind of expect, and, and we've seen in other places, you know, salinity, in this case, bottom salinity, secchi depth or turbidity, Julian day, temperature, top salinity, and then, then X2. These are the ones that are primarily driving the model. And predictions I'm gonna make going forward are gonna use all, the, um, all those variables on the y-axis, uh, but I just wanted to highlight that these six are really what are driving the um, responses we see. Um, and I have partial dependency plots for all of these if you're interested with the shape of that response is for each of these individual variables, but in the interest of time, they're just hidden at the back of the talk. So ask me questions about them at the end if you're interested. Um, okay, so that's, we have a model now that can predict two, um, two different locations in the estuary. But what we'd really like to do is say, okay, how well does this model do predicting outside of where we've, um, where we're actually sampling? And you know, the, 
in these dry years, and we've seen this map a couple of times. This comes from um, Bay Study data when they were actually sampling in the South Bay in the early 80s. Um, and in dry years, yeah, there's this landward distribution of long fin. But in wetter years, there's uh, lower salinities more throughout the hopeful estuary, and, and long fin uh, appear to be distributed more seaward. Um, so can we do a better job of predicting where habitat, long fin habitat would be, particularly in these wetter years? Um, and this is where I say, <laughs> this is not something you want to do. Like, you don't want to predict outside of where your data comes from. So this is, um, this is the part of the talk where I try to convince myself and you that making this extrapolation is, um, well, while not advised, I'm, I've done everything I can to convince myself and hopefully you that, that we can infer something from, from this model. Um, so the first step I wanted to do was say, OK, how well does this model predict to stations it hasn't seen? Um, maybe this, this model could do a good job predicting to new habitats if it can predict to stations that weren't included in the, in the training of the model. So we re built the same model, but this time just withheld one station, fit the, the booster regression tree model to the remaining stations, and then evaluated the prediction performance on the independent test data, the data that was left out, and the data from this withheld station. Um, and that should tell us how well it can predict back to stations, locations it hasn't seen before, but within the survey footprint. Um, and then you know, if the model can predict well to these stations it hasn't seen, then maybe we can trust it to predict to locations outside of the survey footprint. So um, y-axis, AUC is the area under the receiver operator curve. Um, higher on the y-axis towards one is perfect prediction towards 0.5, there's no better than chance prediction. The independent data set, those are the 6,000 rows of data that the model did not see at all, um, but that's built with the full data. It does a really good job of predicting to these, um, to the independent data set, um, like scarily good. Um, I'm, yeah, I'll just say it's, it's scarily good. You don't often see AUCs that high in, um, just leave it at that. Uh, the withheld stations, it also does a, a pretty good job, actually a really good job, there's just a lot more variation. Um, but what you don't necessarily see is any trend in region. So the, those points are color coded by the region that the station that was withheld came from. And you don't see like all of one region falling out that's like really low and all of another region being really high on there. It suggests that there isn't like a region effect in terms of how well your model predicts when you with, uh, remove a station. So the model seems to be doing a pretty good job of predicting to new stations it hasn't seen within the survey footprint. Um, all right, so what if we took this model and the underlying environmental variables and predicted out across the whole estuary? Where, do, where would we see long fin habitat? So we use some prediction in inputs. Um, Primarily, it was these things like uh, salinity and temperature and turbidity that were driving the um, response. Um, and those came from these hydro hydrodynamic models that Anchor QA spun up for us. We used historical data like uh, fall X, or, uh, X2 and precipitation that go into the, um, into the model. And then things like tides and the time of sampling was held constant. And then we're going to predict a throughout a um, given year, so starting from March 1st to July 31st. Um, and then just for simplicity, I'm only going to map what is considered good long fin smelt habitat this greater than um, 0.7 probability of catch. OK, so setting up um, the big, not necessarily finale, but the, the big beautiful picture result, um, we have six maps. Um, along the top are three years of high spawner abundance, 2001, 1997, and 1998. Uh, along the bottom row, we have low spawner abundance, years of 2008, 2011, and 2006. And then those columns are dry, moderate, wet years. So we're able now to kind of compare what conditions look like in dry, moderate, wet years and under high and low spawner abundance. because um, Spawner abundance, the number of adults wasn't included in the model as a predictor of when and where you would catch long fin. Um, so I'm going to hit go, and hopefully this is going to play. And what's going to happen is we're going to go through March 1st through July 31st of each of these years. And what um, 
I think is, is evident here is that, first off, um, the, the habitat, what's turning green, um, is further distributed downstream, more seaward, and in the South Bay and, under some occasions, um, than what, where the 20 mile survey footprint ends. And that's a little bit hard to see these, these open um, white circles in there, and you see this kind of flash of red or black dots come through. That's when the larval, or the 20 millimeter survey is going through and either catching black or not catching red um, at the fixed stations. But you see a lot of, um, especially in the early part of the year, you see a lot of habitat turning on in the South Bay and San Pablo Bay um, in all years, but particularly in these wet years, uh, well outside of the, the survey footprint. Um, and at the end of the talk, I'll just throw this back up here so you guys can stare at it while you contemplate questions. Um, okay, so results-wise, um, so temperature, turbidity, and salinity are strong drivers. This is not really anything new. If um, it, it seems to be a, they seem to be the, the top three kind of environmental variables that really drive um, the catch of um, lots of estuarine species. Uh, Julian Day, which is what, you, what you'd expect. We're talking about a, the juvenile life stage. So these fish are recruiting into the, the gear and then recruiting out of it. So the, the day of the year is going to matter about whether or not you're catching longfin. Um, and then when and where these conditions are present in the San Francisco estuary, they're particularly present in wet years um, and, and early in the season, March and April. Um, and San Pablo would Bay and South Bay, you see those conditions, um, particularly again in wet years. All right, that's that's where things were left maybe um, nine or twelve months ago, um, and that's when we got talking with Lenny and um, John Brandon about well, we're making these predictions about where longfin should be. Why don't we, you know, start up the boat? tell people to go somewhere and sample and see if they're actually catching fish where we think they should be catching fish. Um, so we put together a pilot study to sample um, within the region that the Sassoon Bay region um, where the 20 millimeter survey is currently sampling, but also in San Pablo, Central Bay, and South Bay. And we're sampling in, in locations that um, kind of straddle um, medium, high, and low predicted probabilities of catch. Um, and sampling more in the trying to sample more on the medium predicted probabilities to account for this higher expected binomial uh, sampling variance. Um, so there were two, um, two um, weeks or so of uh, pilot surveys. Uh, the first one between uh, April 19th and May 1st, you see there's some overlap in where the pilot study was catching long fin in red and where the 20 millimeter survey was catching uh, long fin in the, um, sorry, the, the red squares. Um, and you see there's some catch down the South Bay uh, with the pilot study um, and out in the San Pablo Bay, um, again, outside of where the 20 millimeter survey is surveying. And then later in the year, you know, this is a big wet year and it stayed wet up until early May and then it kind of turned off in um, early to mid-May and now catch is where they were catching um, long fin was mostly in the same areas that the 20 millimeter survey was catching them. It was also kind of getting late in the year for when you'd expect to catch a 20 millimeter uh, long fin. Uh, okay, so returning to the um, kind of our, our evaluation of how the model does, the validation of how the model does, uh, predicting to new stations. So I, I made this case that we're doing a good job predicting to stations that the model hasn't seen before, but does it do a good job predicting to new habitats, these locations like in the Central Bay and the South Bay? So um, this is where I refrain from telling a joke about how much this one data point costs, but that is the, that's the one data point for this 2019 year pilot study, and it's, it's, um, it's falling out, you know, it's lower than the, the median uh, AOC for the individual withheld station test. But it's, you know, it's kind of within the range. I mean, it suggests to me that you know, we're not completely off with this model and, and being able to predict outside of the, um, the survey footprint. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that there's, there's more we can do to confront this model with um, uh, more test data, but you know, 
suggests to me that the, model, the predictions we're making about where longfin habitat is under these um, different hydrologic conditions is probably where you'd expect to catch uh, longfin. All right, implications. So I, I touched on this briefly, but the survey does not, um, the 20 millimeter survey does not cover the full temporal and spatial distribution of juvenile longfin. So this is the partial dependency plot for uh, Julian Day. And you can see that um, you're already at the kind of highest probability of catch for longfin at the start of the survey, and then it tails off. Ideally, we would, we would see longfin recruit into the survey and then out of the survey, so we're confident we're seeing kind of the whole, um, the whole process, uh, you know, abundance and distribution of, of longfin. And then, um, obviously, the spatial distribution. In, in some years, in some parts of the year, you see this, the distribution of what we consider good habitat, or at least the environmental conditions where you'd expect to catch longfin is downstream, more seaward of where the 20 millimeter survey is um, sampling. Um, and you know, that means that we need to be really uh, careful interpreting uh, the longfin smelt catch data, especially in wet years. And here's a case of two days in uh, May of, of 2006, where the survey, the 20 millimeter survey, are the black and red dots um, in the Sassoon and Delta region. Um, and what's well, mostly red dots because they weren't catching anything. Um, 15 stations were sampled over two days and only observed longfin smelt at one of them. Meanwhile, there's a whole bunch of habitat, what we think is good longfin ha habitat, out there in San Pablo Bay. So if they had actually been sampling out there, would they have caught any longfin? I don't know. I mean, it, it suggests that that's where longfin would like to be, anyway. Um, so I guess my, my take home then is like management actions and monitoring need to be aligned. You know, so if we're going to take management actions, um, we need to have monitoring in the place to actually detect whether or not that management action is, is working. And it needs to also be aligned with what the mechanism is. Um, this, this model, you know, it, it suggests that the, um, well, so currently management actions are kind of focused on the upper estuary. There's habitat in San Pablo in, in the South Bay. Can we take management actions down there? Would we see similar responses? Um, and it, you know, the model suggests that there's suitable habitat that's much more widespread. Uh, and this, this um, you know, there's another independent source of information that would back this up with Levi's new paper um, showing that there is successful spawning recruitment of longfin smelt down in the South Bay um, tightly restored wetlands. So it's nice to see like these two independent efforts, um, one very model heavy and one on the ground, boots on the ground, um, showing the same results. And uh, I'll take questions. Yep. Time for one question. Better be a good one. I guess that guy. <laughs> Yeah, this is coming at you from Zooplankton World. Oh, well. Um, so I, if you if you did take, I not mention I'm a salmon ecologist? No, just wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> now this this is a generic estuarine, eco, estuarine ecology 101 thing. That if you go did out, did I not and, mention I'm a salmon ecologist? <laughs> <laughs> they live in estuaries, um, sometimes. So if you look at you know if you take a species that lives in an estuary and you look at salinity tolerance in the lab. Um, you know, using salinity as a kind of a proxy for a bunch of different environmental factors. But uh, if you look at its salinity tolerance and then look at where it lives in the estuary, they're going to be completely different, hmm. or very different, because where it lives in the estuary depends on salinity and predation and food supply and everything else. So I kind of wonder if, you know, when you characterize the habitat on the basis of the physical features, and salinity I think was one of the top ones, that um, you know, you could be over predicting in, in the sense that the animals might not be there that for reasons that have nothing to do with any of the variables on your list. Yeah, and I've, um, I've given this presentation before where I've included a slide that kind of addressed that, not specific to our system, but like if you were to build the same type of model for a kelp forest and you 
include rugosity and you know depth and all these sorts of things, and you're predicting um, yeah kelp and number of urchins. But if you, if you left out sea otters, you know you would you would, your model would totally fail. You know, so I, I'm right there with you. Um, we have included we have tried including um, some of the primary diet items um, in the model. We've also tried modeling them separately and building their own map to see how they overlap. Um, I, it, it's hard to get at that. Um, it's hard to build that mechanism in because we're. It's you know. It's the model is just trying to fit what it's observed. Right. Um, yeah. And then like, what is that competitor? We've also tried to include. Um, uh, sorry. Right. <laughs> predator. Predator. Say predator. Well, I was going to say herring. We, we've um, we, we've tried it. We, yeah, we, we've considered other um, species that uh, we thought might be coexisting. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'd expect to see more of them where herring are. <laughs> great. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. That's great. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Wim Kimmer, who's going to give us all the answers underlying the flow abundance relationship. No pressure. No pressure. I'll let you open it. I, I tried my best delaying tactics there, but it didn't work. Um, Okay, um, well, we all know why we're here, more or less, and uh, I'll just plunge into it. We're supposed to explain this. So Fred presented this earlier, and he kind of he kind of glossed over he kind of glossed over that there are two explanatory variables embedded in here, um, and one is uh, x two, and the other is um, oh sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the other one is uh, year. It's actually a smooth function of year. So basically, imagine you've got a straight line function with x2 or log of outflow, um, and you have this declining function of year. And I thought about showing both of those, but it's, it's, I think you kind of all know what the deal is here. And you know the fit is really good and, and so on, but we don't need to talk about this anymore because we want to get um, into the uh, nuts and bolts of it. And, and Lenny wants me to solve it. And so there's some magic going on here. And then <laughs> this is what you pay for having me go later and have me sit over there with my computer. Well, <laughs> OK, so the problem is, um, you know, what's the mechanism for this, this, this hundredfold variation? So, I'm not really talking about the year part of it. I'm only going to talk about the, the flow or X2 part, because the year part of it, um, well, first of all, we all have to deal with that, right? Um, some more than others. Um, but um, we kind of know that the decline in food supply had something to do with the year effect. And we don't know, ex the, we don't know it extremely well how it works, but, uh, but it seems pretty obvious. So uh, the, the thing is that the, the uh, X2 effect or flow effect has still has a hundredfold or implies a hundredfold variation in abundance, which is pretty big, and it's still pretty a, a really strong signal. It's the strongest as uh, as we've heard before uh, in the estuary. So, um, or maybe any estuary, I don't know. So, uh, so what's the mechanism for it? Because if we knew the mechanism, we could probably do it better. Right now, we have a flow standard that lasts for five months or six months. I forget. And that's, that's pretty expensive, and it's not very well focused. And so one of the ideas we, you know, that have been kicked around is if you could focus it better on a, on a time uh, or particular years or whatever, it might be more effective. So if we knew the mechanism, we could do that better. Um, but th there's a few factors that, um, that we need to think about. One is it's a hundredfold variation. That implies that the mechanisms, uh, mechanism or mechanisms, must be geometric in their in their scope or their uh, their application, not arithmetic. So, if you doubled habitat, 
and didn't change the, the uh, relationship of the fish to the habitat, you would get twice as many fish, presumably, not 10 times as many. Um, if you changed uh, predation or food, you could get geometric uh, uh, differences. So we need to think about those kinds of mechanisms that have a geometric scale. Um, it's a problem of, of estuarine dynamics, and Jim did a great job of pointing this out, that, that um, you kind of have to look at the whole system. You can't look at little bits of it and try to infer what's going on. Now we have some really good examples you've heard about today. I'll talk a few, about a few of them more. And then, and then whatever the mechanism is, it must exist at the intersection of physics and biology because it's the physical, it's the physical characteristics of the estuaries that change with in increasing outflow and move, the moving of X2 and the subsequent or consequent uh, stratification and two-layer flow and so forth that goes on. Um, and, and the intersection between those and the biology that's going on must be part of the mechanism as well. So we have a bunch of mechanisms that we've talked about and kicked around for uh, quite a few years now, essentially since the X2 relationships were first figured out. Um, and in, uh, there, I sort of divide them into physical habitat and, and then physical dynamics, and those aren't really separate. But in terms of physical habitat, uh, one would be food availability and how that, in other words, how these things vary with, with freshwater flow. So does food availability vary with freshwater flow? And it may surprise you to know that I'm not going to talk about that. Um, spawning uh, habitat may change with freshwater flow, the amount of spawning habitat, and the amount of rearing habitat may change with freshwater flow. And then the physical dynamics, um, one is, you know, export entrainment, and people have been really concerned about that. Uh, I think um, a lot more so with delta smelt than with longfin smelt, but even with longfin smelt. Um, the the uh, survival from uh, larval habitat, or larval uh, emergence into a rearing habitat, and then survival or retention of uh, juveniles in the rearing habitat. So uh, what I want to do is kind of, kind of walk through a few of these things, and I'm going to skip over food availability and, and really touch on a few of them and focus on a few other ones. Uh, you've seen these kinds of graphs before. Um, it's, I just wanted to contrast something here. Uh, on the left is 2011, which is a, a wet-ish year, and 2015, which is a very dry year. So X2 was there, and about, you know, this is the, the catch. So the, the catch was sort of around X2. And then in 2011, it looks like there was a lot more catch uh, landward of X2, but, uh, or the two, two, two uh, PSU isohaline. But that doesn't take into account what we just heard from three different speakers using three different methods, that there are lots of delta smelt, young larval delta smelt, seaward at that point in high flow years. So we're missing them with the 20 millimeter survey. We're missing them with the, delta, the, the uh, smelt larval survey. And so, um, so we've got what we have down there is kind of a question mark. So, um, so that's something to, to keep in mind when we think about uh, particularly risk of entrainment. So here's, um, this, is, this is from Head. Um, this is the uh, total catch in 2013 in the smelt larval survey. And you can see little tiny blue dots in the delta, and then big, big uh, blobs in uh, the lower delta and the western delta and Sassoon Bay. And 2013 uh, wasn't too wet, but you can probably bet there were some fish west of there. But let's ignore that for the moment. So um, Ed and I have worked on various, uh, a couple of box modeling projects. Um, and this is one associated with the uh, barrier, uh, the placement of the barrier in the Western Delta in 2015. And this is actually just two of our spatial boxes that I want to focus on here. A central delta box in yellow. You can see that, right? Um, and well, if you can't, I can't help you. Um, <laughs> and the uh, San Joaquin box. Um, and, and so the idea here was to use uh, Ed used the untrim um, uh, hydrodynamic model and uh, Ed's particle tracking model to infer movement between these boxes. And I'm going to focus on just two of them. Um, so this is daily losses for passive particles. So particles that have no behavior, just, just uh, drift with the water, and uh, from one box to another. So from the central delta box to the San Joaquin box, 9% per day 
in that box on the, at the beginning of the day end up in the, South, the uh, San Joaquin box after one day. And about 2% of the San Joaquin box uh, goes into the exports. So look where all the fish are. Um, there are essentially none of the particles that are released seaward of the central delta box will end up uh, being exported. So th this implies that almost all of the, of the uh, long fin smelt population at this time of year in the larval survey, which is probably uh, well, arguably the most abundant, more, sorry, most vulnerable time to export pumping, they're mostly not vulnerable. And, and so to me, the further implication is that we should stop worrying about exports. Um, second thing is, uh, this is getting back to Corey's uh, idea only on a very sort of crude uh, way, in a very sort of crude way instead of uh, what he was doing, but essentially looking at, at salinity as a proxy for pretty much a whole bunch of habitat uh, things and, and looking at uh, what Brian Manley calls resource selection functions, which are just curves of uh, either catch per unit effort or, or uh, presence absence uh, versus the, uh, in this case, salinity. And, and these are for different, uh, di different sampling programs. The, uh, from the left in yellow is the uh, 20 millimeter survey, and it peaks in the lowest salinity of all of them, and that's because, uh, of course, it's the earliest life stage. And then they go progressively more seaward or to, more, or to higher salinity. So um, I'm going to focus on uh, the uh, bay study otter trawl and the bay study midwater trawl. And uh, so, so we have this, this ontogenetic uh, shift in distribution. And then also we have this difference between the bay midwater trawl and the bay otter trawl that seems to increase going uh, toward, toward higher salinity. So uh, I'll get back to that. Um, but we can infer a bunch of things from these resource uh, functions. And this is that graph shrunk down to small size to make room for this. Um, this is a paper that Ed and I and Michael McWilliams wrote in 2013. Um, where we um, we use the uh, either the catch per unit effort or the presence absence we use both um, separately to develop a uh, an index of habitat that was essentially just the either the area or the volume of uh, w within a certain salinity range that was uh, dictated by the resource selection functions. So this is for one this is for the catch per unit effort in the uh, in the Bay study, which is the, the light blue line at the top over here, and then. Uh, this is, if you, if you take that salinity range and you calculate and use a hydrodynamic model to uh, develop salinity patterns, then you can get um, the area or volume of that habitat at different flows. And, and so then you can plot that against, uh, you can plot the area or volume, I call it a habitat index, against X2 in this case, and get a slope. Uh, looks kind of like the uh, abundant slope, except that it's um, if, if you compare it with the abundance slope, it's very different. So, so then you take all these different relationships. So you take all the, the uh, resource um, selection functions for the different, different uh, sampling surveys and CPUE or, uh, or presence absence, and you get these slopes, and you look at the slopes in comparison with the slope of the abundance versus X2 relationship, and that's down here. So these are these slopes, and so zero here and minus 0.08 here. And so this is um, from left to right, they're the CPUE from the midwater trawl at the frequency distribution or fre uh, uh, presence absence from midwater trawl uh, in this the bay study. And then the uh, bay, sorry, that's the fall midwater trawl study. And then the bay midwater trawl uh, net um, pretty much shows the same story. So the slope is negative, but it's very, very, very much less negative than that for the abundance, which implies that there are other very more, much more powerful things going on. So this down here is the, uh, is the slope of the abundance versus X2 that you get, and you can see the big difference there. Um, that's the slope and the confidence interval. So um, what does that tell us? It, it tells us that, uh, that, that probably just area of habitat defined by salinity is not what drives uh, the X2 relationship. This is another hint. This is from a pretty old paper of mine um, where I plotted um, 
the range of the uh, between the 10th and 90th percentile of the long fin catch as a function of distance up the estuary. And then, so each one of those vertical lines is one survey, and it's the 10th to 90th percentile of the smell of abundance and occurrence. And, and then I plotted that against X2 uh, that existed during that survey. And what you see, these, these red lines kind of, uh, they're fitted through the, the 10th and 90th percentiles. And the one-to-one -one line, meaning uh, uh, X2, one-to-one, um, -one is, is there. And what you see is that at lo the, the lower X2 is, or the higher the outflow is, the tighter the, uh, tighter the distribution of longfin smelt is. Um, now, that may seem contradictory, because the dogma had been up to that point that when flow is high, the, the longfin smelt are dispersed over a wider area, and therefore, uh, have more habitat to play in. But it looks like it's exactly the opposite. And um, there, there are some limits to this analysis, but um, obviously, but, um, but the main point is that it looks like they're actually tighter together when flow is high, which actually implies something about the mechanism as well. Um, now I want to look a little bit at uh, depth distribution. Fred talked about this some already. Um, this is some of the same data. This is actually from uh, 2017 when we went out day and night in uh, in San Pablo Bay, and and so that uh, this is from Ben Science, um, and the uh, what you see here this is this is like a fish finder but it's a very expensive one, and and this is the bottom along here, and these blobs are schools of fish, and and this is in the daytime, they're not schools of longfin smelt, they're probably almost certainly schools, schools of anchovy. But as Fred showed, the longfin smelt are down near the bottom as well by day. At night, um, there's all these little dots all over the place in the water. And Ben has some magic algorithm that I don't understand to extract which ones are actually fish. And that's these. And you can see that they're distributed throughout the water column. So um, again, these are not necessarily longfin smelt. Maybe this one right here is, but the rest of them, no. And, um, uh, so, but, but the point is, and this is sort of general fish behavior, that at night they don't really have, they don't have the visual cues and also they don't have the, the predation risk and they can wander through the water column. Um, so if you, uh, if you look at where the trawls sample, okay, um, so we have the, the midwater trawl depicted on the upper right and the otter trawl on the lower, lower right. And so this is just a little snippet of that previous uh, diagram just to kind of kind of show you where things are going. Oops, sorry. Um, and the, uh, you can see that the midwater trawl you know, goes down and comes back up, doesn't go quite to the bottom. Uh, they don't like to hit the bottom. And, um, and it samples mostly uh, territory that uh, is devoid of fish. And every once in a while, it hits a big school of anchovies. Um, the otter trawl goes down and then stays near the bottom or on the bottom and, uh, and, and fishes on the bottom and then comes back up. And the, the depth range is shown by these lines. That's the midwater trawl. And then on the left, the, the dotted line is the otter trawl going up and down. And then the, the solid line is where it's mostly fishing, which is the bottom half meter. So you can take no, your knowledge of the, um, the dimensions of the nets and you can get the ratio of catch per area instead of volume, catch per area in the midwater trawl to the total catch through the water column per area. And that's what this is. And so this is similar to what Fred showed earlier, but in a, in a somewhat different uh, context. So this is the proportion in the midwater trawl. So if it's 0.5, that means that half of, half of the catch per unit area are in the midwater trawl. And remember, the midwater trawl covered a, a huge depth compared to the otter trawl. And what you see basically is um, as the fish, uh, well, as the, as the salinity gets higher, the fish get more and more deep you know, in the water column. It's probably got to do with uh, turbidity, because there's a, there's a relationship between turbidity and salinity that shouldn't be ignored. Um, I plotted these by age, class, and they, they're not hugely different. Also, um, Fred, I, did, I plotted them by, um, by decade. And they're not usually different, so I don't see a I don't see a decadal signal in this, but we can uh, try to figure that out. 
Um, so, so they're near the bottom when they're in higher salinity. So if they're near the bottom, what happens to them? Well, we're, so, we're, so Ed and I are, are working on this to, to use the, the uh, hydrodynamics model and the particle tracking model to figure this out um, mechanistically. Um, so we have, have the, these two models, and we've uh, used various day and night behaviors, or we can use them, and then see how retention in that region of the estuary in San Pablo or, or Sassoon Bay uh, relates to flow. Um, and a big assumption here is the fish behavior. And, and uh, we, you know, we know that fish are not particles, but is their behavior oriented in the water column other than vertically? Do they have a, an orientation when they're out in the middle of the estuary? And I would assert that they do not, but I'm just asserting that because I don't actually know. And if anybody here does know, I'm all ears. Um, so we've done this sort of thing before. We've got two examples, one that we published and one that we're um, going to publish one of these days. And, um, and I want to show you those because these will, will sort of show you what we have in mind for the lung pin smell. So this is for um, recruitment from the ocean. So there are several species that have X2 relationships that recruit from the ocean. They come in as, as juveniles. Uh, long, uh, Crangon, Francis Gorham, the bay shrimp, and the starry flounder. Um, and so this, this was a, a numerical experiment using particles that are either passive or sink at various speeds, um, five different speeds of sinking. And this is, uh, the x-axis is uh, five categories of delta outflow, and the y-axis is distance from the Golden Gate. And this is, uh, this is sort of where they end up. And um, I forget how, how long after they're released. So if you look at uh, the, the very leftmost part of this graph, the purple is passive, and then it grades up to the, the fastest sinking particles are in yellow. And you see that the faster they sink, the further up the estuary they go. That's at a very low flow. Now at a higher flow, they don't go as far, but they go faster. And they, they get to, essentially get to their rearing habitat faster. And we think that uh, if you, well, if you assume that mortality is higher when they're on their way to their rearing habitat because of clearer water and so forth and more predators, then uh, there would be a natural, uh, there would be a mortality advantage to getting there quickly. So that's one thing we're working on. One of these days we'll get this out. Uh, this is one that's published uh, 2014 uh, for a copepod. They are instructive for certain things. Um, so what this is, is a, a plotted against salinity is relative abundance of Uritemer affinis, which used to be the most abundant uh, calamine copepod in the estuary, in the upper estuary. And then we had uh, particles that, that Ed released throughout the upper estuary and then tracked them for um, a period of time. I think it was 30 days or 45 days, 45 days, I think. And then looked at where they were in salinity space. And passive particles, ones that didn't behave, were just gone. They were out the Golden Gate in 45 days. The particles that migrated down on the flood and up on the ebb, which we've observed in the copepods and the larval fish in the estuary uh, in the past, uh, they were retained and actually, in some cases, retained very close to the pattern that we saw for Uritemer affinis, uh, a pattern of abundance with salinity. So, um, so that implies that you can get very strong retention by uh, either sinking or, or migrating vertically, and that, that should vary positively with outflow, not negatively. Um, so to go back to the list of, uh, uh, of habit or list of uh, potential mechanisms underlying the, uh, the flow or X2 relationships, uh, food availability is a maybe because I need to go do some work on it. Um, uh, spawning, the habit, extent of spawning habitat, uh, I, I don't think we're really sure that, 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 how that expands or contracts with flow. Um, rearing habitat, though, seems, seems uh, the, the idea that the habitat extent, uh, not the dynamic, but the extent of the habitat, uh, that does not seem to be the most important uh, factor leading to high abundance and high flow. Then turning to physical dynamics, again, I assert that uh, based on the evidence that we have now that we shouldn't worry about it. 
is not likely to be a certainly not a major factor in the, the long-term population dynamics or the long-term decline. Um, the, uh, the question of whether larval to rearing uh, movement and survival is affected by flow, we're still working on that, um, and Ed will talk about some of that. And then, um, and then the juvenile retention in the, in the rearing habitat, that's also a work in progress, and we hope to get something out on that fairly soon. Um, and with that, if I have time for questions, I'll answer them. If not, I'll sit down. Thank you. Hey, Wim. Um, so you opened the, the talk with the, the notion that you're looking for maybe a, oh, ge a, geo hi, a geometric uh, mechanism, and then you sort of moved away from it a little bit. I was expecting you to come back and have more to say about that. Is, is there anything that you want to say that is on your mind that would be, you know, uh, <laughs> geometrically inclined? Uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, this, um, any of these, um, Interactions between, you know, flow, velocity, and, and behavior, and and reten either retention or transport, would have a geometric uh, uh, could have a geometric uh, relationship because uh, because they're uh, they're related to daily mortality, and mortality, as you know, is a is a geometric process. You know, so um, that makes sense. Okay, and. I, I, for, I forgot, and Hildy sitting right here in the front, that um, we're, uh, we are uh, indebted to our, our, uh, our friends at the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife for funding our study, because uh, uh, without that, we wouldn't have anything to say. Thank you. Any others? Yeah, so, uh, so Jennifer asked if uh, I could say a little more about the, the shrinkage of the juvenile habitat. I'll go back to the slide if I can. Uh, maybe I can't. Oh, yeah, I can. Yeah, there. Um, yeah, so if you, you know, if you looked at this and didn't know anything else about the smelt, you would say, oh, when, they're, when flow is high, they're kind of all stacked together, and therefore they're, they're going to be competing with each other and, and not doing very well. But I, I, you know, I, I'm kind of a skeptic about competition, that, about our ability to detect it and show that it's happening um, in the water because uh, it's very diffuse uh, as opposed to predation, which is hard enough to measure. Um, but, you know, this, this, is, this could have um, other explanations that I haven't thought about, but to me it looks like a habitat compression and a logical method, you know, uh, I mean, a, a reasonable or uh, plausible mechanism for that compression is this uh, this interaction between vertical movement and um, and uh, and and flow, and and the flow patterns that result, the, the dynamic patterns that result in the estuary when flow freshwater flow is high. So you get you know you, you get low salinity water over deeper channels, you get stronger two layer flow. And so that could compress, essentially compress the population sort of up against whatever barriers in the way, whether it's the, the Venetia bump or the, you know, uh, San Pablo Bay Shoal or something like that. And, um, and so that would, that would give you some kind of a compression. But um, exactly how that will work, I think, we, I think we'll be able to tell more about it uh, after we do the modeling, after we finish the modeling because we'll be able to look at where the particles go, and if we see this pattern, I think it will be really, uh, you know, pretty strong. All right, thank oh, you, wait, Wim. Fred? Uh, no, we don't, do, we, we don't have time for Fred, do we? <laughs> All right, <laughs> fast. Um, okay, so I probably need to think about this now, but it looks like you're kind of trying to get ahead of the focal concentration. Would you move closer?
Um, well, they don't need to be competing for food for food to be limiting. You know, if there's just not enough to go around, not, if there's just not enough, period, um, because the clams are getting it or whatever, um, then it doesn't matter how many other fish are around, or it, it matters less, I, I should say. Um, but, you know, I'm, again, I'm just, I'm kind of skeptical about uh, our ability to show competition. Um, and, you know, it seems it seems too too um, too nebulous, and there are too many things going on at once to be able to infer that from any kind of data. Well, I think it's more likely they're they're not going to get to spawn, or their or the fecundity would be low rather than just dying. But yeah. Um, certainly it would have a negative effect on their ability to, uh, to you know, send their genes forward. I'm going to take one more question from Carl. Carl, are you back there? Oh. I, I can't see so, Wim, I just had a question about this one uh, and to make sure I understand what it is and how it may relate to newer information about where we see juvenile or rearing delta smelt in relationship to flow and how real that compression is. So, you know, from earlier presentations of Jim Hobbs is, you know, we would, at higher flows, we would see them down in San Pablo as well as Sassoon. And is, so I'm just wondering how this relates to that actual distribution data. Yeah, um, well, first of all, this is juveniles, and I think most of what you presented is larvae, right? Uh, and some 20 millimeters, yeah. So this is later. This is uh, larger fish. So this is from the base study, and so it's essentially caught in a full moon water trawl, the same, same kind of net as a full moon water trawl. So they're quite a bit larger. Um, I, don't, I don't remember what the, the size range is. Um, and, you know, this, this may be only part of the population. I mean, what I think what Jim and Levi have been showing is that um, if, you know, and to follow up on what Fred said, you have to look more broadly than we've been looking. And we know, I mean, again, this is from years ago. You, you, I didn't have time to update it. Um, but we know that uh, now that the, the fish are distributed more widely than we thought, but still, you know, within, you know, a lot of them are in the channels. And the ones that are in the channels are doing this. So the ones that are in the shoals and the shallow habitats are doing something different. And I think it's important to distinguish not only, you know, sort of the size classes or ages and time of year, but also the, the kind of habitat you're talking about, if it's, if, whether it's very shallow or not. I mean, Lenny's favorite mechanism is, is, is different from this. Uh, I didn't, I didn't want to emphasize, I probably overemphasize this one a bit, because um, it's, it's the one I'm working on. But, uh, uh, but, but Lenny would assert that it has to do with larval transport, I think. Yeah, that, yeah. All right, we're going to move on. We're a little behind. Thank you, Wim. I'm sure no one minds if we go a little longer. Great session. So our next speaker is uh, Ed Gross from RMA, who's going to be presenting some of his model res uh, results on larval long fin uh, hatching distributions. Where are you at? Funny. Okay, so I'm talking about one of those uh, specific mechanisms, uh, categories that Wim just mentioned, and it's on our um, Prop 1 funded study. Um, so it's specifically looking at hatching distribution of long fin smelt. Um, it's been covered in a lot of ways already today, so some of this will be uh, overlapping with other presentations. So some of the goals of the study were to uh, estimate hatching distribution of long fin smelt and the timing also of that hatching. Uh, estimate overall population, natural mortality rate, um, proportional entrainment losses, and to do this for uh, two different years to understand the influence of river flows on, on these things. Okay, so uh, um, Wim suggested I delete most of my uh, 
slides with equations and models. So uh, I've tried to I've tried to boil it down to this, um, just sort of a list of ingredients of of what went into the analysis. There's a lot of data. It's very much a data-driven analysis. Um, the model model work is the hydrodynamic and particle tracking model is just one piece. Um, so we're using survey data, uh, both the small larva survey and uh, ICF surveys, um, GIS analysis to get uh, volumes of regions, and uh, uh, movement from hatching to uh, to trawl where they're actually caught is that's that's where the mo the hydrodynamic and particle tracking model comes in. That's using the untrimmed hydrodynamic model and uh, particle tracking model. Those are both three dimensional hydrodynamic models, pretty high resolution. Um, and then there are a bunch of assumptions we have to make uh, that I think I'll revise after seeing uh, Levi's talk. And uh, really, most of the work uh, is, actually, is in this Bayesian inference statistical model, um, which I won't go into any details again. Um, but it's, it's in R and R JAGs and uh, using uh, two statistical distributions, a negative binomial and a multinomial. Um, OK, so this is sort of how all that fits together. Uh, it's, it's mostly sort of a one-way flow of information. Um, so we run the hydrodynamic model once for the, well, we ran it many times to calibrate it. But when we're happy with the calibration, we just have those results for once. And then we run the particle tracking model once to tell us movement from areas of hatching to areas where they could be observed at later times. And we boil that down into a set of movement information. So you think of that as a set of matrices, because really in, uh, in the code, it really is a, a bunch of matrix multiplies that are happening. That goes into the abundant statistical model, which has a lot of machinery and, uh, that I took out. Um, but the, there are some assumptions that go into that. And uh, very importantly, the data, the trial data, goes into that. And then that iterates over and over again with the sampler, with this Gibbs sampler. It iterates over and over again, running this forward model over and over again to try to figure out which hatching rates uh, provide a good fit to the trial data. And the other parameters it's fitting are um, daily survival rate. and uh, well, associated with that, that comes out of the, at the end of this analysis is uh, regional abundances and proportional entrainment. OK, so uh, before I show any model results, I'm going to just sort of go into a lot of the data that some of it's been covered. These are the two years we're looking at, 2013, which was a dry year, 2017, which is a wet year, um, and also very different in terms of uh, the flows during the small larva survey is, was typically much lower in 2013. So there's really just one peak, and then it was consistently low. And the peak was right around the first um, survey. OK. So starting with a bubble plot that we're all used to from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, we see uh, this was the most abundant survey in 2013. So you can see where they're caught and the lengths. Um, so combining all that, uh, figure that Wim's already shown, um, for all surveys, we get this. And then we can look at that. Um, we can break that down into which survey they were caught in um, here. Uh, we can see they're mostly caught in the later surveys, peaking around that survey four. Um, you may or may not be able to convince yourself. I think I've convinced myself there's a shift um, in distribution, more uh, landward in the earlier surveys, more seaward in the later surveys. but. Uh, if you remain unconvinced, that's fine. Um, so we can also look at the lengths. Um, this has been shown several times. So it peaks around 7 uh, millimeters in uh, this 2013 data set. And there's also data from ICF. Um, this, these abundances may look really different, but I, I should remind you that I combined the catch from six different surveys in, uh, in this image. And it's just a single toe for each of these bubbles in this uh, plot. So they're showing different things, but they do show a pretty similar um, length distribution, also peaking at seven millimeters. OK. So now I'm going to introduce a, a definition here that we're defining our cohorts as um, these two-week different, different intervals of hatching. So that really just shown on the x-axis by the different colors of the different hatching periods that we're considering, that we're just by definition, we're defining these two-week intervals. And we can see where those overlap with uh, the different surveys. And uh, shown in, in red text on the top is when the ICF surveys uh, happened. Um, and to, so if we assume that they hatch at 5 millimeter and they grow at 
um, 0.2 millimeters per day, um, then we can, we can uh, estimate the size of the cohort through time and see what size range overlaps with each survey. And then when we go to um, uh, estimate the abundance of that cohort in that survey, we look at only at that size range. So I'm doing that here. Again, we don't even need, we don't need any models still. It's not even a statistical model. This is just, just uh, bean counting of the data. So we use the, the length data we showed previously, and we map that to a cohort using this relationship. And then we plot uh, how many, uh, the total catch in each cohort for um, these different periods. OK. So that's the data we're using. They're mostly in these, these middle cohorts. Um, and by the, by the last cohort, we defined the um, estimated, well, the catch is very low. OK. So now I'm going to define some regions. Um, this, this is uh, an image of our, our model domain. But um, the regions are showing the areas where we're going to estimate regional abundance of longfin smelt. And overlaid on that are all the SLS stations. Um, so if we, if we then aggregate the data by region, we can just, just this is still just catch, not catch per unit effort. Uh, we can see where most of the, the catch is available, the catch occurred. Um, and OK, so now I'm going to contrast that, contrast uh, 2013 and 2017 on, uh, intentionally on the same scale. So you can see, really, they are at very different uh, abundances in Sassoon Bay and the Delta um, between those two years. But then if we look at the um, ICF surveys in 2017, we see there was uh, some catch particularly down in San Pablo Bay. The red, yeah, I should have, I should have mentioned the red circles mean zeros. Those are zeros here. Um, so the blue show um, the non-zero catch. So um, and also in the ICF data set, there are a lot of zeros, but also a lot of non-zeros in San Pablo Bay. OK, so now getting into some modeling, but still no hydrodynamic or particle tracking modeling. This is the statistical model. Um, that we're going to use to estimate regional abundances from the data alone. Um, so this, this assumes the distributions I mentioned previously and the growth rates. Um, and we're, we're fitting this in a Bayesian inference tool, um, JAGS. So um, the estimates we get for the, at the time of the different small larval surveys are, are here. We see uh, we're estimating most of the regional abundance in um, Sassoon Bay, not surprisingly, because that's where most of the catch was, and, and uh, also in the confluence. And the, um, the estimates of abundance are both much lower and much more uncertain um, in 2017, uh, because the catch was very low. So yeah, so using, using this statistical model, even if the catch were zero, we don't necessarily predict that the regional abundance was zero, unless we get a, a bunch of zeros you know, repeatedly, toe after toe. We can't conclude that the actual regional abundance is near zero. OK, so why, why are we going to use a hydrodynamic and particle tracking model? So the reason is we want to incorporate movement information. We don't want to assume that uh, hatching occurred at the location where the catch occurred. Uh, so we want to estimate the transport from hatching locations to exports. We want to account for seaward losses you know, out, of, out of the study area entirely. Um, and this also allows us to estimate abundance in regions with no trawl data, getting at a lot of the things brought up earlier today that um, some of the hatching and some of the uh, abundance might be outside of regions with data available. Um, we can also estimate, uh, using this approach, it, um, the daily distribution as opposed to just distribution at the time of the surveys. And we can also extend this to later life stages, which could include active swimming behavior. OK, so this is the, um, in, in the JAGS code, this is the regional abundance forward model. Um, I want to mostly point out that the, par the hydrodynamics and particle tracking, all of that work, a lot of work, went into generating the set of uh, lambdas, the term on the right side. So what lambda does is it maps the, um, the larvae that were hatched in a certain region to where they're located at a later time and place. So we basically sum up all the regions where hatching could occur 
we sum up um, the hatching in that region times the transport to, to uh, other regions at subsequent times um, in this equation. And the, the other terms, they're all listed here. Um, the, the first one on the left is a, is a total abundance term across all regions. The second one is the survival term, um, daily survival. And the, the first one inside the summation, that theta term, is the fraction that hatched in each region. So that's really a distribution term. And yeah, that, that overall um, summation is, is what, I, what I said before. It's mapping from where they hatched to where they end up at later times. OK, so uh, I, I did drop all the model stuff pretty much. But I, I wanted to point out we have a very recent paper. And this actually really gets at the question you'd want to ask of a model for this sort of application, well, can you really model accurately the time to, get to, trans to be transported from one place to another? And that's exactly what we were looking at in this paper. Um, and yes, did, did a good job. Um, so here's an example of how much movement we're predicting in a certain period. So this was for the first cohort released at the confluence, that region I'm outlining in red. Um, and the particles were released continuously over a two-week period um, to, to simulate hatching during that period from December 16th uh, through December 30th. And then the snapshot I'm showing is uh, just two weeks after the end of that hatching period, um, which, which is chosen because it's um, during the first SLS survey. Um, and the length, the length uh, at that time, given our um, length at hatch assumption and our growth rate assumption would be 8 to, to roughly 11 millimeters. So they're still, you know, still pretty small. But as you see, there are very few remaining um, where they were released. They've all been transported. And this was a low flow year. This was 2013, the lower flow year. They're um, dominantly transported seaward, um, according to this, mo this model with passive transport. So. Yes, this is really mostly just to emphasize the movement matters. If we just assume that they're, um, wherever they are caught is where they hatched, um, this, this image suggests that would be a very poor assumption for this period. OK, so a bunch of assumptions. The, the larvae we're using are passive. We use passive particles. We, you know, of course, we can also put in behaviors on particles, but we didn't do that in this work. Uh, we assumed spatially uniform hatching within each region and uniform in time during the 14-day interval. Um, the size I've already mentioned. And we're only doing this analysis up to 16 millimeters. So anything I, anything I show is just using observations of catch up to 16 millimeters. And if we're calculating anything like abundance, it's only up to 16 millimeters. Um, and then our growth rate is a little higher than what um, Levi just reported. Uh, we use 0.2 millimeters per day. Um, constant in time and space survival. And uh, yeah, a possibly big assumption is no size selectivity of the SLS trawls. OK, so this is really sort of a direct uh, out, um, output from the Bayesian inference. Uh, it's called the corner plot. I'll break down what this is saying. Um, so the bottom right um, little square is showing that our survival that we estimate is around 0.96 uh, daily survival. Um, the, the first nine um, columns show, or the sort of the diagonal of those first nine columns shows the estimated, the posterior of the estimated regional um, hatching for each, for each region, the fraction in each region. So it's showing that we're estimating most of the hatching occurred um, for this cohort, cohort five, in Sassoon Bay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, the second to last bubble is the overall total on uh, total magnitude of hatching. OK, so we can then compare these two estimates I've shown. We, we have this estimate that includes the movement and an estimate directly from the data. Um, you know, so at the time of those surveys, we can see, well, are those two ways of estimating um, abundance consistent? And yeah, they're fairly consistent. Um, on the left, we're using just the SLS data. Uh, so the, the yellow is showing the median with the line. Um, 
the 25 to 75% credible interval with the box and then uh, 5 to 95% credible interval with the whiskers. And uh, the green is showing the same things for the um, just trawl based estimates of abundance. So one thing we can see is that generally the, uh, the credible intervals are a lot tighter for when we use the movement. And that's because, um, for example, if we hatch particles in the confluence, then sometime later they'll be in Sassoon Bay and they'll be in um, eventually in Carquina Strait. So we basically can constrain that hatching with not just data uh, in the location where it hatched, but also data um, seaward downstream, essentially, where it was hatched as it's transported down. So basically, we can make better use of the available data, constrain our answer more. OK, so if we put this in terms of, if we look at the hatching rates that were estimated out of this, um, oh, I'm sorry, we're not to hatching rates yet. This is uh, just the total um, predicted abundance for, um, for the observation, I mean, sorry, for the uh, predicted model, including movement. So on the left is 2013, and on the right is 2017. So the main point of this is the really big shift further seaward in 2017, um, again, largely outside the range of the SLS, and also that we're predicting um, pretty significant abundances in Central Bay and South Bay. Um, and yeah, I should, I should mention, we, we did not allow hatching in Central Bay or South Bay, so those are all ones that are transported down from the north, northern estuary. OK, so now we're at hatching. Um, so the, the hatching rates we estimated for 2013 are on the left, and 2017 are on the right. So pretty different hatching distribution shifted seaward um, for 2017. And for both years, not a lot of hatching in the central and south delta was predicted. OK, but if we look at entrainment, if we look at the number of larvae hatched in each region that were entrained, um, we, we see a different looking picture. Because even though the numbers were uh, numbers hat that we estimated that were hatched in the south delta and central delta were small, they're much more likely to be entrained. So we see that um, in terms of numbers entrained, most of those were um, larvae that hatched in the south and central delta. Uh, these numbers are really small. And again, the scale is different between these two years. Um, OK, so I also wanted to look really briefly at some sensitivity analysis. Um, so if we looked at different size at hatch, we see that has a um, small but noticeable effect on, um, on the predictions. Hatching rates. We can also look at growth rate assumptions and see some differences. Um, OK, now getting to proportional entrainment. So this is the proportion of the total um, population that hatched that year that were um, entrained by the exports. So in 2013, um, the median estimate was below 8%. And in 2017, it was far below 1%. Um, so really different by year, but um, pretty moderate in both years. And this has been. You know, we've done several iterations of this, uh, this sort of fitting, changing different aspects of the statistical model. And uh, this is a pretty robust feature that we're seeing um, limited entrainment losses. OK, so some conclusions. Um, the approach estimates temporal and spatial patterns of hatching. Um, accounting for movement is important. And uh, the distribution of hatching varies a lot with net flow um, between 2013 and 2017, or two years. And particularly in 2017, the SLS might not cover areas um, where there's a lot of abundance and possibly hatching. Um, so we don't see a lot of hatching in Central and South Delta. Um, and yeah, there is some sensitivity to the assumptions. So these are definitely not final results. Still need to discuss with co-authors and nail down some of those assumptions. Yeah, so here are some of the sensitivities and uncertainties. I think I've mentioned all of these. Yeah, so I think, I think that's it. Thank you. Questions? No. 
Thanks. That, that's really interesting stuff, and I want to be able to see it up closer so I can see what those little bars do um, <laughs> in, in paper. I still need to see it in paper. Um, it seems to me that, that something that we have not talked about so much during this symposium is the potential for either your assumption about the growth rate, uh, you've identified the assumption about growth rate, <clears throat> um, and that there might be a lot of variance in that, but also the assumption about the spawning timing. Something that we notice, you know, the, the smelt larval survey samples at a certain time, spring Kodiak trawl samples at a certain time, we don't have visibility outside of that window. But if you look at the base study data, what I remember of it is we get recruitment to that net, 40 millimeter juveniles, throughout the year, um, almost every month, I think. Um, and that might vary from year to year, but that suggests either that these fish are spawning in a, in a longer window than we're giving them credit for, or that their juvenile gro their larval growth rate is quite variable, uh, or both. Um, and so I wonder how you think the, if, if we assumed a longer spawning window or a more variable growth rate than you uh, modeled, how that would affect your ability to detect natal sites. Yeah, well, um, thankfully, we had some of the ICF data, which did go beyond SLS. So that helped us go a little further into the year. And, and yeah, it did suggest that the hatching would continue to some extent beyond the SLS, the end of the SLS. And beyond that, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I haven't looked into that. All right, any other questions? Great. So I want to thank all the speakers for today. This was a great lineup. It was a really good symposium. Thank you very much. We're going to take a quick break. Quick break. Go get some refreshments. Uh, stand up. And then we're going to ask the speakers to come up, and we're going to have our panel session. So five minutes. Go and come back. Speakers, please make your way up to the front and have a seat. We're going to start our panel discussion. <laughs> so if all the speakers could please come to the front, uh, Levi, Jim, Mandy, Ed, Tien. Corey, Wim, Trichelle's already here, so that's good. Michelle, just please uh, come to the front. Now, the there there is a microphone where you are at. You don't need to move it. It's actually quite sensitive, apparently. Just need to press on the green button to start talking. I had enough chairs, Fred. You just like that chair? <laughs> Didn't want to get too tight over here? Okay. Yeah. Oh, fires. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, so this is, uh, thank you for sticking around for the last panel. I'm um, hoping we'll have a really nice discussion here. What we'd like to encourage you to do is, if you can, there is a microphone. If you could raise your hand, we'd like to open it up, our discussion. Uh, our questions to the audience. There may be some questions you weren't able to ask or it was formulated, and then that, now you can ask them here to the whole group or to an individual. So first I'd like to ask whether there are any questions that people would like to ask right now. We only have about half an hour scheduled. Maybe we can go over, uh, but I don't want to hold anybody hostage <laughs> for too much longer. I know we we're running a little late. So, but I do not want to discourage discussion. Please, please come up and let me know, uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. Oh, uh, Jennifer. Uh, why don't you wait for your... <laughs> so the question was uh, extremely vague. 
uh, what do we do next? I'm, I'm assuming you're thinking of it in two, two forms. One is uh, what, are our, what are some research priorities that we could address? And this is, question is, sounds like it was for the group. And uh, what are some, uh, uh, why don't we start off with that? What are some research priorities that you feel uh, need to be addressed? So we can go down the line, or you can go in any uh, order you'd like. But let's see if we can get a, a response from everybody. Thanks. Go ahead, Jim, just press the button. Oh, there it goes, okay. Um, I think from a lot of the discussions already, we should expand larval and juvenile monitoring to be better catered towards the life cycle lung and smoke. We can use Corey's model to limit how far we have to expand, but that would be where I would start. So that's my job. I'm, my job is to monitor, so it's easy. <laughs> um, Wim, what, what do you think? <laughs> Press it again? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Someone just pressed the green button, it gets the bottom. I can't see that well. The lights. Um, I think uh, figuring out what's going on in the ocean, figuring out the, the, you know, the, the contribution of the fish that go out in the ocean and come back to the population, or conversely, well, and the population that go out in the ocean and never come back and go somewhere else. Um, I think sorting that out it seems like a, a big part of the puzzle that we are, I mean, we're, it's bad enough that we're missing, you know, a third of the habitat with the larval survey in the 20 millimeter, but we're, how much are we missing by the, by, by missing those fish that go out in the ocean? Uh, I think that could be very important. Okay. That's not a lot, but They're, they're pretty sensitive. You probably don't need to move it too much, hopefully. Can they're I? Trying. <laughs> um, I guess a couple things. One is that I'm not entirely sure whether the outflow abundance relationship is the result of a physical process or a biological process, based upon what I've seen today. And I would add to that that the outflow abundance relationship is I don't know that there's anything biological in nature that has that tight of a relationship. I mean, find me one other ecological <clears throat> relationship in nature that has an R squared near 0.9. Um, so I don't know. I personally think there's still uh, some things we can learn there. Okay. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so how about I go down the line? Uh, Tian, do you have any thoughts? Hello? Yes. Okay, so from fish culture standpoint, um, I'm more interested in any information we can get, especially for the larval life stage, to see what's really going on, why, why we cannot figure out what's the condition they really need, and maybe that's, that will help us to really understand what's going, on, what's going wrong in Delta. So, I mean, we don't know if that's stability, but we don't know if that's salinity or habitat. So, I'm more interested in that. And maybe, um, maybe in the future, I, I hope not, but we may need to create a refugee population as well. Um, so, to get the, the cultural method ready may be critical at this point, from my standpoint. Corey, do you have any thoughts? Um, I guess, you know, from the modeling work I've done, you know, it's, it's just the model, the data telling you what the data tells you. It can't get at mechanisms. Um, and we've, you know, going back to this flow relationship and what Fred's alluding to, um, you know, what is it that's creating these good habitats and are those really good habitats or are they, you know, are we expecting to find fish there because fish have been transported there? You know, there's, there's these broad deserts uh, between where the good habitats are. Um, would we expect to see fish transitioning between those places because it's a, 
because fish are actually moving into these new habitats, or they actually are adults actually recruiting to the South Bay every year, or the San Pablo uh, tributaries every year. And in some years, they're actually reproducing, and other years, they're not. You know, those, those are two different possibilities. And, and what's, what's important there is that the mechanisms that would drive that are, are very different. One is this kind of larger scale, maybe it's delta outflow pushing fish downstream, though whether or not they'd actually push in the South Bay, I'm not sure. Um, alternatively, it's it's local flows, and, and in that case, flows in the San Pablo tributaries and the, and the South Bay tributaries would be really important. So you can create these conditions where you would catch fish in these in these more seaward locations um, with with the signal of more outflow, but where that outflow comes from and, and what the underlying mechanism is is, is different. So um, being able to dis disentangle those t things is um, it's right up there because we can't take management actions, you know, efficient management actions without understanding what that mechanism is. Um, oh, I, after Mandy? Yeah, sure. Sorry, after, after, oh, go down the Oh, sorry. I, I was going to second Wim's uh, questions. I'm interested in what happens in the ocean as well. I would like to get samples from all the tiny estuaries and any estuaries that are up in, into Canada. I think it's difficult. Um, but it would be really interesting. Also, uh, developing parentage markers for long fin smelt for the hatchery is going to be pretty important if uh, and when you guys complete the life cycle yeah. in captivity. And looking at fine scale structure would be interesting, but you would, I mean, you would need to collect a lot more data. And that's all I got. Yeah. Levi. I'm it. Um, I think figuring out spawning would be really valuable. Where are these guys dropping eggs? Uh, what kind of habitat is it? And what do they need? If we're going to do restoration, what should that look like? Are they using these restored habitats, um, like these salt ponds? And if they are, then that would be a great conservation um, effort that we can move forward on right away. Um, other questions are, are there different migrant um, contingents? And if there are, that, you know, are we preserving that life history diversity? Uh, another is thinking about just their general life history uh, in the San Francisco estuary, thinking about how genetically diverse they are, and comparing that life history diversity to other populations on the Nooksack, on the Fraser, up and down the coast, and just see how are they surviving in different habitats, what are their constraints in terms of how they behave um, in different environments. Um, and I think one other one is tied to a lot of the things that we're already talking about is, is mortality. So um, one of the things that strikes me is that in 20 17, we, uh, well, mortality and also recruitment. So 2017, um, looking at the entire data set, including our data, so soon marsh data and base study data, there were very few adults, very few reproductive adults, and suddenly we had this recruitment event. Um, if we looked at SLS data, there was almost no larvae caught anywhere in the estuary um, in 2017, but then there were a bunch of juveniles in the fall. So I think we're missing some really important metrics, and that comes back to what Jim already said, is really trying to dial in where these fish are with some additional um, surveys so that we can estimate mortality and really understand what the population dynamics um, are doing. So I think, uh, is this on? Uh, okay, for the type of modeling I do, I think one thing that could be limiting in the future is uh, not really understanding mechanistically swimming behaviors, particularly of the later life stages of uh, long fin smelt. So for salmon, we, you know, we can look at acoustic telemetry data, and it's still pretty hard to figure out what they're doing. Um, but when you, when you don't have any of that really detailed data on movement, um, then you're sort of guessing in, this, in the particle tracking or individual base modeling realms. Um, so I think that'll be limiting in the future. Um, I guess from a feeding and sort of what are important food resources sort of point of view. Directly, my results suggest there are a lot of sort of unknown prey that, um, that we're not seeing in the morphological analysis that um, we should really kind of figure out what those are, at least on some level, because they could be important um, for culturing efforts, important for their life history. Um, but broadly, uh, my data also sort of showed hints of differences in feeding across habitats and regions, at least on some level. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to see if different um, habitats provide different food resources and um, digging into the unknowns and um, getting a 
more sampling efforts in very specific, uh, like restored marshes, would be a really interesting look at what those provide to the larval fishes specifically. Um, so I kind of agree with, already, with what's already been said about expanding our monitoring if we want to capture those population level questions. Um, I think on a more narrow scope, I think it's important for us to really dive into that decline we've seen in the upper estuary since the drought um, and see what that can tell us about um, suitable habitat or, you know, mechanisms for these larval distribution. And then I think we can also do a better job about monitoring gonadal maturation in the spawning adults. So we have a better idea of when they're actually spawning from year to year. Okay, Wim, you had an additional thought? Yeah, we've got um, several tens of thousands of records of longfin smelt uh, distribution or abundance um, from various, each of various surveys over the years. Um, and we have, um, I, as far as I know, two nights worth of night sampling in that entire period. And you saw the picture. They do something completely different at night. Um, now, does that matter? Well, yeah, if they're, if they're somehow interacting with the movement of water, which they certainly are, um, or they're, they're in the moving water, I should say, and their behavior influences how that water is moving because it influences their vertical distribution. And we don't know anything about what they're doing at night beyond those few little specks of data that you saw, you saw today. Um, a lot of people don't want to hear this, especially people who run monitoring programs in the, in the, in the estuary, but uh, we do need to do more nighttime work. <laughs> yeah, that, that's always trouble trying to work at night. I was on those crews doing that. That was, that was not a simple affair, and thanks to uh, USGS for planning a lot of that. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I was glad to have uh, kind of uh, the responses that I was getting from research. So that's kind of wanted to get an answer from each one of you. A lot of you are, I mean, you're all researchers, so you have your individual issues you wanted to think about. So it's good to hear that. But, um, but I'm thinking about this next question. I've noticed that um, from a lot of these talks, distribution was one of the things that seemed to be a common theme among many of the talks is like, uh, we may not be looking what they, where they are. When we look at where, where they are, uh, we find new information. So one of the things I, I was noticing, and this was noticed in the uh, Science Enterprise Network a few years back, where we had all the science enterprises come out, talk to us about their individual enterprises. And one thing that was noted about ours is that we seem to artificially separate our estuary. Um, we have a lot of focus of our management and some of our habitat restoration and our assessment of longfin in the uh, Sassoon Bay Delta. What about in San Francisco Bay? What are the things that we need to know? So my question to you is, and anybody can answer, I'm not gonna force you guys all to give your, give your answers this time, is that uh, conservation actions. What are we missing? Is, is the bay, it, seem, it seems like the bay is really important. Are we missing some conservation actions out in the bay? What else can we do in the Sassoon Bay Delta what are your thoughts on uh, in any of those locations? Thank you. Fish don't care where we put bridges. They, uh, they, you've already, you know, we've seen today all the evidence that shows they go wherever they go, and and you can't treat it as a, a bunch of isolated islands because it's connected. So it's, um, it's not a secret that water project operations drive research and monitoring in this system, right? Um, if, and I, I tend to um, agree with Wim that at least exports have very little effect on this fish. If, if, um, if that's the case, are we going to lose our opportunities and our funding sources and our ability to actually study and understand this fish because of the way the system is managed politically? So I would throw that out there as well. Mm. 
do you want me to answer that question? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. But um, uh, I, did, I did not hear uh, what are some conservation actions that we might be missing. Well, Levi already mentioned one, which is to figure out where they're spawning and start working on protecting those places. Uh, it's astonishing that we don't know where they spawn. Yeah. So uh, that sounds like more like a, I'm thinking more like an actual management action. But yeah, that does sound like an important uh, issue to think about, more research in that regard. What I'm trying to get at is um, something I've, I've noticed is that the restoration that is being targeted for different species or different uh, factors that they're looking for in the Delta, Sassoon Bay, and San Francisco Bay are different depending on which region you're in and what species they're looking at. Uh, do you find that, they, that the uh, restoration in San Francisco Bay area is um, addressing longfin smelt? I, I can't speak to that, but I'll just add that I think it's, you know, the, the, the one really successful longfin restoration action we've taken so far has been the, the salt ponds in San Jose, and they weren't, as far as I know, they, longfin were not on the radar when they, mm -hmm. they did that. Um, so sometimes restoration comes about by accident, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from it. Um, and, but you can't learn without monitoring, and so we just... And we keep coming back to this, but monitoring has to be um, aligned with our management actions. And you know, we, we will be able to take better conservation actions if we design um, actions with proper monitoring. Um, and conservation actions, I think we'll, we'll learn a lot more if we take conservation actions that try to resolve the underlying um, mechanism. So if we have competing models, we can, um, we can take conservation actions that, that will with monitoring and collection of data will provide support for one or the other uh, underlying hypothesized mechanism. And so thinking about taking actions in that way in, in a, an adaptive management approach so that we're actually learning, we're not just doing restoration actions to do restoration actions, we're actually doing it to learn about how to make the next restoration action work that much better. Can I add to that? Um, I think I'm sitting here thinking why I'm having a hard time coming up with specific conservation actions. I'm pretty, I'm pretty forthcoming usually. Um, so I think part of it is just the uncertainty of knowing whether any of this matters. So um, we're finding lots, you know, we published a paper saying we found longfin smelt, high abundances, reproductive condition, in lower South Bay. Um, we found some larvae. We don't know for sure if they were spawned there. We think some of them were at least. But we don't know for sure if they're from there, if they got blown down. We're talking to Ed about thinking about um, the probability of that. Um, we are finding them in high densities in these restored ponds. Is that good or bad? We don't really know. It's exciting, but we don't know. Is that a sink population? Are they going down there trying to spawn and failing every year, except in these random wet years? We don't know. So it makes it hard to say that, oh, definitely restoration, that's going to bring back longfin. Um, so I think that's where you, asked, you started off, what additional studies, and we really need to figure out what do these fish need? Is this good for them? You know, I can throw out some other ideas while we're talking. So sure, restoration of, of wetland, brack, brackish wetland habitat in particular, not, not just um, uh, any wetland. And then also um, these tributaries, if they're important habitats, they need flow. And the, like the Napa, um, the uh, Cody Creek, um, Guadalupe River, really thinking about like what kind of flows are they getting? Or are we really taking all the water? Are we really creating a brackish habitat that could serve longfin smelt every year? I don't know, that's something else we need to think about. Um, and then last, going on on limb and um, easily shooting down my own ideas, um, you know, if, if there's a distribution thing where there's a, a, there's a survival difference between longfin smelt being, uh, larvae being, in, their center of distribution being in Sassoon or being out in San Pablo, is there any kind of flow action that could push them out? You know, those are the kinds of things that I've talked about with various people. And it may or may not be feasible, but those are just some ideas that we had and, and we need to decide whether or not those would be feasible and valuable. I have a little follow-up thought um, on Levi's point about how, you know, they're seeing the population in the South Bay sort of thriving in that El Viso, El Viso marsh. Yeah. Um, and thinking about what about what about that habitat is is supporting that or causing that effect? Is it is it the food resources that are available, and, or is it something else about it? 
I think that the diet studies have the potential to answer those questions on a very high level since you're sequencing everything that's there. There could be sort of indicators in the diet of where they're feeding and, and um, if it's found in most of the fish, then perhaps that indicates that they're all doing well because of that habitat. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think the potential is there, but we need more information to fill in those unknowns before we can really use it as a tool and more intensive studies for that sort of thing. And sort of nailing down what it is about those habitats, um, which could be food resources, but yeah, hard with li limited information. I'll add on to that and, and say that um, I don't think we know what the key drivers are right now in terms of population growth rate. So we really need to have a life cycle model and some information on not only um, individual based survival, but trying to understand what really drives population growth rate, which we don't understand at all right now. Because um, I agree, it seems like doing habitat restoration and, and developing marsh habitat for spawning and rearing of juveniles seems very promising. Um, and it very well might turn out to be um, something important, but without knowing how that propagates through the life cycle and whether or not that's going to result in a meaningful um, effect on population level growth rate, we could be investing millions of dollars into a form of restoration that ultimately does nothing for the population. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, feel free to raise your hand if you do have a question. Just let me know. Lenny, were you raising your hand or was that stretching? Okay, go ahead, Lenny. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I do think an idea that's just this idea of The, the surveys, you know, maybe having something similar for that life stage is important because there's a connection between physics, they go up in the water column, they go down. If, the mid, if you're doing an oblique trawl, maybe that's not helping you get at some of these mechanisms that interact at a finer scale for some of these smaller fish. So is that something that you would think you would want to explore is having a program that samples top and bottom? and shallow habitats, right? So a lot of the surveys right now are in the channel. So it's not just looking at the spatial extent, but also within that spatial extent, look, extent looking at the different habitats. Uh, yes, I would agree. Um, so the existing sampling platform is to just detect longfin in a region. It's not linked to a mechanism. So I've already drafted a study plan for longfin smelt baywide for larvae and juveniles that uh, takes both that fixed station that we're doing now, but also sort of takes that vertical distribution, looking at surface and bottom, shoal, uh, something similar to what um, I got to cut my teeth with, with Wim Kimmer back in the late 90s on the entrapment zone study. So uh, actually having monitoring that sort of design more around that sort of mid, you know, surface bottom, mid water column over a tidal cycle, because these fish are moving back and forth on a day with the tide. So when we run around in space and try to sample them in different places, we're completely aliasing that tidal slosh with geography. So I would probably actually implement, you know, keep some form of spatial structure to our sampling, but also add in, uh, you know, sort of the Lagrangian or Eulerian sampling in certain places at certain salinity zones, at surface bottom, look in the shoals, I think that would actually give us a better monitoring platform to link to mechanisms and models. Um, certainly, just doing one single toe that gets the whole water column tells us that they're there, but doesn't give us some idea why. <laughs> I, I think that's my job, Wim. That's okay. You, you can come out on the nice days. Yeah. It's always nice out there. 
be out there with with Jim. It's pretty. It's pretty nice out there in the marsh. It's a very nice habitat. I recommend anybody go out there to the salt uh, to the salt pond marsh. It's really really spectacular. Um, I had a, a another question. Um, some of the things that I heard was very like, oh, okay, that, that kind of like pushed me back a little bit because I wasn't expecting to hear something like that. But one of the lines I heard was something about why are we worried about exports and talked about and basically explained that proportional entrainment seems to be quite low in some of the modeling that I saw. But proportional entrainment is not the only thing that's being attributed to being affected by exports. Um, some of the new work that uh, when that you worked on, um, um, prey subsidies or subsidies from upstream is something that has been becoming more popular to talk about as potentially being impacted by exports. Not only that, but we also talked about transport of larvae, so the advection uh, hypothesis where upstream production of larvae are coming downstream. May, they may not divert down into the um, Old Middle River corridor for entrainment, but maybe there is some sort of effect on there. Are there any thoughts on those mechanisms? I mean, we, see, we, we heard about the proportional entrainment, but what about spatial subsidies and then also the transport mechanism? Well, definitely, if you have a spatial subsidy from freshwater into brackish water, as we do for uh, some of the zooplankton that feed delta smelt, um, and you, you're, you're moving some of that water in a different direction, you, you reduce that spatial subsidy, but I think, I'm pretty sure, I'm not positive about this, but I'm pretty sure that that, that removal would be a fairly small part of the whole, of the variability in that subsidy, which is very strong, very strongly varies with outflow. Um, and it, it's important to remember that, um, you know, we, we, we tend to think of exports and outflow as flip sides of the same coin, but they're not. If you plot, I, if you plot export flows versus outflows, there's no relationship. Um, if you plot export flows versus inflows to the delta, there's a positive relationship, at least at low flows. Um, so, and that's an, it's, it's not no surprise it's because it's operational, right? Because when when the exporters need more, want to pump more water, you know, they contact the dam operators and let more water out of the reservoirs and. Little, Little by little, it comes down the river and they pump it out. So, so you know, we're, it's wrong to think of exports and outflow as, as flip sides of the same thing. And I think also Fred's graph of the effect of, uh, of if you did let that water, that water, exported water go out, the effect that has on, on the lungs and smell would be tiny, negligible, really. So, um, but I don't know about the I don't know about the effect on the um, on the populations that reside in the delta and are and are and provide a subsidy. We haven't really looked at. That. We know we know it's a few percent per day, something like that. Um, any other? Um, uh, Um, I agree that uh, many, many of the, much of the emphasis on exports uh, has been a uh, big part of the regulatory process, but uh, I think there are many other <coughs> relations with flow with many other variables as well. So I, I think that, and that seems to be the most complex things to address all the, all the synergistic or antagonistic effects uh, flows as with other variables uh, in not just uh, in the delta but uh, downstream of the in Susun or, or when, when the species can move to San Pablo Bay and maybe others that because so we don't have extent of the surveys for <laughs> except for the bay study they, mm -hmm. the, uh, there's not much knowledge in those areas so I I think that in the, the literature shows that all this uh, unappreciated effects uh, eventually can lead to the species extinction and and we may be here trying to do programs research programs uh, and emphasize what we don't know but I think the, the di difficulty is uh, that in any particular year 
a set of factors may rule, another year will be different set of factors, and, and we need to perhaps try to look how to organize all, all what is already know about stressors and follow up on the papers that Moyle and Hobbes have published on, on what else can be done to try to prevent uh, population extinction if there is a, still a chance. And we need to add, of course, climate change. Uh, so I think we need to take a, a larger than system view to address these problems, uh, uh, watershed level and include the ocean as well. So we're uh, kind of near the end. Um, I don't want to hold, hold everybody here forever, so, and the rest of you, but are there any other questions that anybody might have? There's, I mean, we got them all here ready. Uh, there, maybe one more question. Can we, can we get like maybe one more question from the audience? Think hard. <laughs> <laughs> Saturated. They're like done. They're done. That, the, those pastries didn't have enough sugar. Sorry. Who wants to go to the bar? To go to the bar? <laughs> That's a good question for the group. I don't have a question. Seems like a, we got some hands on that one. Um, well, I want to thank everybody for being part of the panel. I hate to uh, end it, but all things must come to an end at some point. I don't want to hold them here for any longer. We only told them half an hour. I don't want to like, oh, you get to be here for a whole hour. Yay. Um, but uh, I really appreciate uh, what they're what they've been doing here, and thank you very much. So I'll just give them a round of applause. So thank you very much. So uh, it looks like Wim has a yeah, final thought. Yeah, one more thing. I wanted to thank uh, state water contractors, especially Darcy and Jennifer, for hosting this and insisting that we all come and browbeating and arm twisting <laughs> to get us to come. But I think it's been fun, and I hope it's been productive. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. So I'm going to go over some next steps. I'll allow everybody to, uh, you guys can move if you want. I don't think you want to be <laughs> the back to it. I'm basically going to try and summarize some of the, what we talked about today and then see, I'm going to do it as quickly as I can. So I don't think I introduced myself earlier. So those of you who don't know me, my name is Sean Acuna. Um, Metro with Metropolitan Water District. Used to be at UC Davis, now I'm with the Water District, and we're working on Longfin Smelt, and I have to say that uh, between Longfin Smelt and Delta Smelt, I feel like there's real progress being made with Longfin Smelt. We're learning a lot more about how the fish is behaving in the environment. We're getting a lot of information about mechanisms that are really giving us a much better opportunity to have better informed management actions. Delta, Delta smelt has a lot of uncertainty, and we just have to move forward with it anyway. That's, that's just the world we live in. Longfin smelt, I think we have a better handle. We may still have a lot of uncertainty, but we feel a little bit more comfortable with that than Delta smelt, for sure. So I'm just going to go over, I had the task of going over, trying to go over next steps. So what, I'm, what I did was I went through the talks, and I tried to consolidate some of the information. Hopefully they're not completely out of whack. They're along the lines of what they said, and then uh, some potential next steps that we discussed here, and I was kind of anticipating some of the answers. So we learned a lot about reproduction. Reproduction uh, for Delta smelt uh, is very well known. Longfin smelt, not as well known. We don't have them in culture. We, we assess them periodically out in the field, but not nearly as much. So a lot of great strides on how uh, the reproduction is working has been very important. Understanding that multi batch synchronous uh, spawner. Do they spawn more than once in a year? Do they spawn over to the next year? Are they, they have that uh, multiple spawns within a lifetime. This is going to be extremely important for life cycle models such as what Lenny was talking about in putting it in there. They, we don't know how often they spawn in a year. If they only spawn once, multiple times, we need to know that kind of information. So information that can help feed into that is going to be useful. So uh, a lot of great work on that. We have this uh, uh, reproduction seems to span fresh and brackish water. We saw that from the Olaf work. A lot of, uh, lot of material, uh, uh, a lot of lines of evidence suggesting that brackish water might be very useful and then some culturing on some of the freshwater benefits as well. And then we're trying to figure out where those natal origins are and I see that there's a lot of uh, progress on that. I'm hoping that we can get more progress. I, I was planning to ask that question but I thought it would take too much time and more details. I'll just go to, uh, go to the source later but more natal uh, origin material might actually be helpful in informing management actions in the future. 
So all that information can help develop with uh, life cycle models, habitat restoration, some, maybe some inform our local flow management, such as what was mentioned before, like in Napa and, and Coyote Creek, and help improve our culture protocols. Learn a lot about diet. They, there's a lot of unknowns. A lot more than I, than I didn't realize that. There was a lot of unknowns. But they seem to like uh, ureas and mycids, so that's good. We have survey programs that help us with that information. But the unknowns are interesting because that means that there's a lot of information that we need to do. There's still opportunity to learn about the species and about their habitats and what the food they're producing. I'm, I'm actually curious about detritus. Bottom feeder maybe? I don't know. They don't, they don't have the, the, spa uh, the facial structure for that, but maybe they are eating some sort of detritus out of the, out of the uh, water. And it um, might be interesting to see whether you also could examine some bacterial uh, parameters, some markers there that might be attributed to that. And the diet, we, as Tiana had mentioned, that uh, the diet has been the major choke point when it comes to the culturing. There are some techniques out there, but it looks like he's, he's trying to hit them all down and they're all having trouble. Even co cohabitating is having difficulty as well, which is a, a common technique in aquaculture. So the next steps are culturing protocols, trying to refine that. Hopefully, uh, Tian will have uh, additional opportunities with help with uh, Levi and Jim on getting some of the brew stock for production. And this information, I feel that a lot of this diet information can help us with designing habitat. Some of the habitats out there are not designed potentially for larval rearing. They might be designed for sea level rise. They might be designed for waterfowl. Are those habitats producing the food that we think are useful for uh, long fin smell? Uh, we can try and look at this diet information to help inform that. The genetic information is, I think is probably um, very important for the species status assessment that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is conducting. That's going to be cre uh, key on how they're going to treat the species. It's a subpopulation, seems to be panmictic within the estuary, and the gene flow is going outside the system. So those are important things to consider when thinking about the species status assessment. The distribution, we saw a lot of talk about distribution, both uh, up and down uh, the estuary, within the water column. It seems that um, survey protocols are going to be extremely important to really think about and how to design. It's happy to hear that uh, Jim Hobbs is already proactively looking at that and trying to see how best to maybe reproduce what they did in uh, the early part of his career were with the, um, the studies he was talking about earlier. So this is going to be very useful. And it can also potentially help with habitat restoration when you have a better idea of where those fish are and where to sample them. Now flow. There was a lot of thing talking about flow. I think uh, Wim went through a lot of it, and there was a lot of discussion among some of the other group. And we had a pretty, I think, a pretty robust discussion about that in the panel. Uh, there's still a lot of theories that are, still need to be addressed, but it seems like there's uh, more evidence for one over the other. Um, that remains to be seen as you, as these uh, publications start coming out, and we get a chance to take a look at them and see how peer review uh, treats those uh, those studies. So hopefully, we'll see uh, more from that and. I'm excited to see what those are. So we had ad advection, that's the downstream transfer from upstream, uh, the retention of the larvae or juveniles, and perhaps local reduction, as uh, Lenny has pointed out, that might be a, um, a good possibility in uh, depending on the years. And then we have uh, some indication of potentially low proportional treatment. But as we mentioned before, uh, exports and outflow is not really the same thing. So we need to really examine what those mechanisms are and try to examine what those transport potentials are, or is there a subsidy issue, those kind of things we need to, sounds like we need to continue to explore that. And uh, some of the simple behaviors that Wim was mentioning about the uh, zooplankton, but not too simple. It doesn't look like passive is really a way to go for uh, long fin smelt or delta smelt. We've seen uh, previous results on delta smelt. Passive particles is not how fish behave, even if they're really small. They do not behave that way. They will go to the ocean and they'll, they'll be gone. So all this stuff will help inform modeling studies, some potentially informed flow actions, and habitat restoration. But I, I don't want to uh, say that this is everything. We reached out to a lot of people, and they mentioned that they wanted to talk, but they just didn't have the opportunity. So there's even more research that's going on that was presented here. We got tolerance and survival studies from the Conan and, and, and Fungi Lab at UC Davis. Um, we got some coastal tributary surveys that uh, um, I'm dealing with with uh, ICF. Uh, the IBM uh, model that uh, was sort of batted around a little bit. Uh, I know that uh, it's being uh, 
potentially develop for a proposal for, um, for future uh, uh, funding. And uh, some of the predictive modeling from the Nobriga Rosenfeld model that uh, Corley Phyllis has produced, and shifting distribution by Vanessa Tobias and Randy Baxter. In addition, there's a lot of synthesis going on. So there's the longfin smelt synth mast, which has actually been going on for quite some time. So if you aren't aware of that, that is the uh, synthesis that was done similar to what was done for adult smelt is being done for longfin smelt. Uh, due to a number of different uh, logistical issues that has been sort of kind of kept going that uh, we weren't able to try and tie it down and try to finish it, but uh, Randy Baxter is committed. That's his thing. That's what he's doing. He's retired, but he's committed to finishing this. So you might see him uh, bug you about uh, more information and participation in that, in that venue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he said he couldn't be here today. <laughs> we actually reached out to him. Uh, maybe enjoying himself fishing or something like that. We'll see. Uh, and then there's a species status assessment that had been announced uh, um, previously, which will be important for listening uh, for, uh, f on the federal side. Now, there were some gaps that were identified, and I, I'm, I'm a little hurt. No one said contaminants. <laughs> just a little bit hurt by that. I didn't want to put it out there because that that's, just seems to be the only thing I ever talk about. So, but. Contaminants are a significant gap. We have a great deal of difference between the whole estuary, what they are exposed to. The loading is very, very different. We have from highly urbanized industrial areas all the way to agricultural mixed urban areas. This is a big difference. We also have background information on dealing with naturally occurring mercury. That is actually an issue when it comes to restoration because if you want to restore uh, something, you can't just restore it because you have to make sure you're not producing too much mercury. And that can really inhibit your restoration design. Uh, ocean. We talked about the ocean, but we can only talk about it. We really need to study it. And I think that's something that we need to do potentially in the future. I'm looking at uh, Lenny we're, and, and um, Colin, we're dealing with some of that right now, trying to figure out some of the uh, fish out in the, in the ocean trips and seeing what some information we can find there. And then, of course, restoration opportunities potentially in San Francisco Bay. Now, the opportunities may be exist, but it sounds like, as, Le as Levi cautioned, now that's just a salt pond. We need to learn more about that. Why did that habitat do so well? It's still somewhat in transition. It's not like, it's not a fully mature habitat. It looks great, but there's still some things that is not fully, it's actually still fairly new. Is this just a transitory thing? Is it going to continue? Can we replicate it? So I think we have a lot of information about that, that we could learn. And my final thoughts are basically, I think, as I mentioned before, we have a lot more we can learn about longfin smelt. I think we have a more opportunistic opportunity. I'm not an optimist, but I feel more optimistic about <laughs> longfin smelt. And I think that we can make great strides. We all work together in trying to figure this out. There's a lot of mechanisms that we can look at, and it sounds like we have a great team to try and do that. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here, and you guys are also all part of the team because we're all talking together about this and trying to determine what to do. Thank you.